HQ presents Breakneck Point by T. Orr Munro. Read by Olivia Mace and Chris Dyer. Chapter 1 I know what the perfect murder looks like, and the slaying of Sean Jones isn't it. Far from it. Her killer, a nomark called Danny Mannering, left a trail of clues bright enough to land a 747. The trial's just a formality. He's looking at life, and I'm looking at spending my first rest day in two weeks with Megan. Or I was until half an hour ago. The corridors in Exeter Crown Court are the usual tense dance of lawyers, witnesses, accused, press and police. In among them, everybody's favourite detective inspector, John Stride, is sitting on a wooden bench outside courtroom one, arms folded, long legs stretched out in front of him. He looks like he's been there days, which he probably has. He frowns when he sees me. He doesn't know what I'm doing here either. I didn't expect to see you. Me neither, I say, parking myself next to him. I'm meant to be having mother and daughter time over a chococino on Mort Sands. I check my watch. I should still make it if they get on with it. CSI appearances at court are surprisingly undramatic. If I'm called at all, I'm usually in and out in minutes. I'm determined to make my date with Megan. I've already got a lot of making up to do with my daughter. I don't need more. The Chococino is my sorry for ducking out of her school art exhibition the previous week. A papier-mâché mask Megan had worked on for months had won the school prize and pride of place in the exhibition. But I'd been called to photograph a fatal on the Link Road in the north of the county. As I put the phone down on the court clerk this morning, Megan's stare challenged me to choose between her and my job. But it isn't that simple. It never is. I promised her I'd be back in time to take her to Mort Sands, but she just shrugged and said she was going back to bed. Something inside me shrank, and I left determined to prove her wrong. How is Megan? Typical of Stride to remember her name. He knows the names of everyone's kids in major investigations, even the grandkids in some cases. Still fifteen? Stride laughs, but he can afford to. His kids have left home. Gone are the days his teenagers sought compensation for all the broken promises and missed milestones. I nod at the door to courtroom one. How's it going in there? Good. The CCTV evidence is enough to send him down. That's my memory of it, too. There was ample footage showing Sean giving Mannering the brush off in a club. He then follows her to her halls of residence. They argue outside. He grabs her, but she shakes him off and storms off inside. There are countless witnesses. Mannering leaves only to return ten minutes later, his hood up to cover his face. He enters the building when another student leaves the door open. A few minutes later, he re-emerges. Sean is already dead. There's so much CCTV, he practically has his own TV show. Unusually for a murder scene like this, the rest of the forensics weren't great. Mannering may not look like a master criminal, but he knew enough not to leave behind any DNA or fingerprints. All I'm going to do today is confirm that. So why am I here? Stride shrugs. Defence barrister's a new guy. Thinks he's Judge Judy. He'll learn, though. He nudges my arm. Once he's seen you in action, I doubt he'll bother you again. His knack for quietly bigging you up is another reason everyone wants to be on his team. That and his legendary clear-up rate. We have a running joke in crime scene investigation that if any of us are planning murder, we'll check Major Investigation's duty roster first and make sure Stride is on rest day or, better still, annual leave and preferably on the other side of the world with no Wi-Fi connection. A woman with a clipboard appears in the corridor. Ali Diamond. My hand shoots up. I want this over and done with. She smiles gratefully. The number of people who don't turn up for court is shockingly high. This 
way, please. As I get up, Stride lightly touches my arm. A move so rare, it startles me. Just go with it, Ali. You'll be fine. Remember, he's as guilty as hell. While I appreciate a pep talk as much as the next person, forensic evidence isn't like other evidence. The science does the talking, and does it well. There's little room for argument. It's why court holds no hand-wringing fear for me, not like other cops. Even the best defence lawyers can't argue with facts. Like I say, I'm not sure what I'm even doing here. I enter courtroom one by a side door. It's unnaturally quiet given that it's standing room only. The judge clearly doesn't put up with any nonsense. I'm shown to the stand and sworn in, and there's a brief lull while the prosecution and defence teams whisper and consult their notes. I avoid looking at Mannering, sat with the defence team. He's not worth it. And cast my eye around the courtroom. Sean's mother, Maureen Jones, is sitting in the public gallery at the back of the court. A tissue pressed to her nose, huddled under her husband's arm. Sean's father, Roy, stares straight ahead, eyes fixed on the wall behind the judge, as if a single side glance will invite such horror in that it will break him, and he needs to keep it together for Maureen and Sean, his girls. The jury leans forward on hearing I'm a CSI. They've seen too many cop shows. It won't last. Not when they realise the questions the barrister will ask will be no more challenging than confirming it's my signature at the end of my statement. My interrogation, such as it is, begins. My name is Ali Diamond. I'm a crime scene manager for Devon County Police's Major Investigations Unit. My notebook, an A4 ledger thick with times, dates, diagrams and boxes ticked in triplicate, is resting on the witness box. I quickly flick to the relevant pages. The clock on the wall tells me there's still time to get to Mort Sands. The defence barrister will stand up long enough to say, no questions, Your Honour, and I'll be on my way. He doesn't. To my intense but suppressed irritation, he takes me through my evidence piece by piece. Go cut your teeth on someone else. Can you confirm, Miss Diamond, that the fibres recovered from Sean Jones's jumper matched those taken from a jacket recovered from the defendant's house? Yes, that's correct. My client argued with Sean outside the club as shown on the CCTV footage. He doesn't deny that. Is it possible that when he grabbed Sean, fibres were transferred from her jumper to his jacket? Sometimes in this job we have to give answers we really don't want to, because science is science, but it still hurts to do it. Yes, it's possible. Thank you. He gives me no opportunity to explain that they could also have been transferred when Mannering bludgeoned Sean to death. But I'm not concerned. No one thought the fibre evidence was particularly strong anyway, and if the boy barrister thinks this will get his client off the hook, he has a lot to learn. Was there any blood found on my client's jacket? Movement catches my eye. Stride enters the courtroom, joining Detective Sergeant Rob Short and Detective Constable Will Lockhart, who've already given evidence. Come to offer moral support, I suppose. No, there was no blood on your client's jacket. Given the violent nature of Sean Jones's death, would you not have expected to have found blood on my client's jacket if he had killed her? Too easy. I address the jury directly. Not necessarily. The defendant could have taken it off before he attacked Sean. Or more likely, he washed it when he got home. Any detergent with active oxygen in it will get rid of blood completely. The female jurors are nodding, almost willing me on. They're on my side and with me all the way. The sorry excuse for a human being sat with his defence team shakes his head. Shake away, son. You're going down. Thank you, Miss Diamond. You've been most helpful. I'd like to move on to the fingerprint evidence. I understand some fingerprints were also found at the scene, is that correct? 
This throws me. Why would he be interested in the fingerprints? None of the ones we lifted were of any use. By which I mean belonging to Mannering. We lifted what there was, but if it hadn't been a murder scene, I wouldn't have bothered. We lifted 25 fingerprint impressions from the scene, but I wouldn't call them fingerprints, more like smudges. An elderly female juror smiles. It's in the back. The boy barrister won't be making his name today. And were they sent by you for analysis at the Fingerprint Bureau? Yes. He then begins to lead me through all the fingerprints, one by one. Several jurors yawn. Miss Diamond, could you look at the screen and tell the court if this, Ref Radley slash 11 slash 18 slash 01, is one of the, what did you call them, smudges lifted from the crime scene? A small television screen next to me flicks into life. It's a photo of a transparent acetate sheet. But instead of a silvery fingerprint with its sharply defined contours, there's just a grey smudge where the aluminium powder has tried and failed to search out a loop or an arc or any pattern that might identify the perpetrator. I check the reference number against my notes. Yes, it is. A second fingerprint flashes up even more of a blur than the previous one. What about this one, Miss Diamond? Reference Radley slash 12 slash 18 slash 02. I catch an exasperated sigh before it escapes. Never disrespect the defence, no matter how much contempt they deserve. Yes, and that one. He's doing Mannering no favours. Juries aren't known for their abundance of patience. Judges even less so. Mr. Lansey Morton, unless there's a point to this, can we move on? We are due a recess. A few more seconds and I can go. Megan better be out of bed. Of course, Your Honour. Miss Diamond, before you go, can you confirm this final print was lifted from the crime scene? The reference is Radley slash 13 slash 18 slash 03. A thumbprint flashes on screen. This time, its ridges and whirls are sharply defined, like contours on a map. A textbook lift from a crime scene. Only I've never seen it before. Not that I remember every print I've ever lifted, but I'd remember this one. Christ, we'd have popped the champagne for that one. This is the kind of fingerprint that makes every detective's day. The kind that gets talked about for weeks. The kind that puts murderers away, which is why I know... This print didn't come from the crime scene. The barrister seizes the silence. Members of the jury, this fingerprint was recovered from a glass found at the scene of the crime and was identified as belonging to my client who, may I remind you, has denied entering Sean Jones's room. Jury members sit up, intrigued the defence appears to have condemned his own client. Miss Diamond, did this fingerprint come from the crime scene? I look at the mark on the screen again. The handwriting inked in black felt-tip pen could pass as mine, that's for sure. But it isn't. I loop my wise. It's a small detail, but enough for me to know I didn't write this. I look to stride, searching for some kind of telepathic guidance, I guess, his expression is impassive, unreadable. And that's when his words come back to me. You'll be fine, Ali. Just go with it. Oh, fuck. It wasn't a pep talk. It was Stride telling me to perjure myself. He stitched me up. But that's impossible. He couldn't have tampered with the evidence, not without help. D.S. Short and D.S. Lockhart are both staring at me in a way that suggests I hold their future in my hands. Oh, God. They're all in on it. Shaw or Lockhart must have lifted a fingerprint from Mannering's house. A pot of aluminium powder, a brush and tape are all that's needed. Someone, maybe Stride, substituted Mannering's gleaming fingerprint for one of the original ones before it went off to the fingerprint bureau. Surely a fingerprint officer would have queried it. 
unless the fingerprint officer is in on it too. Ms Diamond, could you tell the court if this fingerprint was taken from the crime scene? Panic whips through me. How the hell am I going to get out of this? I could brazen it out? Pretend I got confused with the line of questioning? Take ill? Christ, I'm on the verge of vomiting as it is. In the public gallery, Maureen Jones sits upright and stares directly at me, sensing something isn't going according to plan. She doesn't want to be here listening to people argue every detail of her daughter's murder. She's here because she wants justice for Sean. Because even in the maelstrom of her grief, justice matters. But justice doesn't look like this. This version is twisted and wrong, no matter how guilty Mannering is. The court grows restless and awkward at my muteness. Miss Diamond, I'm going to need an answer from you. I check my notebook as if trying to refresh my memory, but I'm looking for answers I know aren't there. Miss Diamond, is there a problem? No, no problem, I respond frantically trying to come up with a game plan. Stride is staring impassively at me. Then I repeat, was this fingerprint taken from the crime scene? The dryness in my throat has spread to my lips. I flick through my notebook again, but the lines are blurred and my head is spinning. Miss Diamond, please answer the question. I take a deep breath to compose myself. There is no way out of this. I shoot stride a defeated look. His face is unreadable. This fingerprint didn't come from the murder scene. A collective gasp. The kind trapeze artists are used to. The kind my court performances have never drawn before. Is released into the atmosphere. What are you saying exactly, Miss Diamond? Gripping my notebook, I utter words I never thought I'd ever hear myself say, in a voice I don't recognise as my own. I'm saying, this fingerprint was planted among the finger impressions that I took from the crime scene, and was sent to the Bureau without my knowledge. There's a silence that I want to last forever, but it's quickly filled with a sound almost metallic, like a ship's girders bending and yielding to the sea just before it capsizes. It's the sound of a mother who knows her daughter's killer will walk free. It's joined by other sounds, and I can't tell where the sobs end and the shouts begin, then cheers, loud cheers, and angry exchanges. In among the chaos, Stride is staring at me. His shaking head will come to represent many things. His conviction for perverting the course of justice. Mass sackings. And my own removal from major investigations after those left refused to work with me. But mostly, it speaks of his sadness that I've allowed a murderer to walk free. Chapter 2 Six Months Later Someone is going to get it in the neck, big time. This is the third tree-lined track I've driven down, so if this isn't the right one, I'm calling it a day. It's not as if it's the crime of the century, for Christ's sake. The narrow lane splays into a small copse, and there it is. Apparently it was once a blue Nissan Micra, the pride and joy of Mrs Jasmine Brownlee, until its life took a turn for the worse and it was nicked by some scrote off the local estate to use as a plaything. I say apparently because its interior has melted to black plastic hillocks, and its exterior is rocking black sootiness flaked with grey ash and rust. I take out my phone and punch the number of the police officer in charge of the case, if you can call it that. But it goes to voicemail. PC5831, it's Ali Diamond. What do you think you're doing sending me to this heap of shit? It's burned out, just like the last one you sent me to. How many times do I have to tell you? This isn't CSI bloody Miami. I can't take fingerprints from a car that's been baked and left out in the rain for three weeks. I ring off. 
This is the sixth wreck I've been sent to since I was sent back to Division six months ago. If it isn't an incinerated car, it's a dilapidated shed where the chances of me recovering any forensic evidence are slim to none. I know it's punishment for the Mannering case. Send her to the shit jobs and maybe she'll get the message and quit. That's their thinking. I get it. The fallout from the trial was nuclear. Dozens of detectives and administration staff were suspended or sacked. It led to what the top brass like to call a root and branch review of major investigations that filled the local papers for weeks. I did nothing wrong, but I've still ended up at a rural outpost in the far north of the county because cops have a weird sense of justice. Sure, Stride fiddled the evidence, but hey... He was just making sure Mannering got what was coming to him. Anyway, Mannering probably did leave fingerprints at the scene, and the CSI missed them. For some, maybe most, Stride is a hero for sacrificing his career to catch a killer, and I'm the enemy for letting Mannering walk free. There won't even be a retrial because Stride broke the rules. That's the way it is. Well, they can shove it up their corrupt asses because I'm not going anywhere. I'm not the crook. I could have fought it, of course. But what's the point when your colleagues won't acknowledge your existence? I get my camera out and take a couple of photos so it doesn't feel completely like the wasted journey it is. Not that this will ever go to court. Sorry, Mrs Brownlee. Back in the van, and the next job on my crime list makes me swear out loud. An allegedly kidnapped cockapoo has turned up at a bus shelter. The officer dealing with it has returned it to its owner, but it took its collar back to the police station where it's waiting for me to just pop by and dust for prints. Six years of investigating and solving some of the worst crimes imaginable, only to be reduced to dog nappings. The radio crackles into life. November Juliet 2, we've reports of criminal damage to the public toilets at Mort Sands. Over. I squeeze the handset. OK, show me attending. Heading there now, over and out. Mort Sands is only five miles away from where I am now, and two miles further along the coast from the seaside town of Biddicombe, where I live. While Biddicombe hosts a picturesque fishing harbour, it also shoulders the embarrassment of a neglected high street which everyone tries to pretend has its own charm. It doesn't. There's nothing charming about short these shops selling Christmas decorations in mid-July. Mort Sands, meanwhile, is the true jewel in North Devon's crown. It's a glorious three-mile stretch of nothing but the finest golden sand. On rare days when the sun is high and bright, it casts water in azure, and you'd think you were on the med. The road leading there is hemmed by those famous Devon high hedges sprinkled with cow parsley and at this time of year, tall, nodding foxgloves. Mr Staveley, who owns the car park and its toilets, is already waiting for me when I pull into the car park. Thank God you're here! What took you so long? Ignoring him, I fetch my silver case from the back of the van, and he leads me to the gent's toilet, a grey block on the edge of the slipway leading to the beach. It's still early and a sea fret lightly veils the breaking waves. Three metres and clean. I wish I was joining the trail of surfers trooping towards the white froth. Instead, I'm in a windowless toilet that reeks of piss, staring at a condom machine lying on the floor. Look what the little shits have done! Mr Staveley groans. Let's see if they've left us anything. Flicking open my case. I remove my thin-stemmed zephyr brush from a plastic tube, unscrew the top off a pot of aluminium powder, and load my brush with its contents. Tapping the excess off, the soft squirrel hairs splay, and I begin twirling it across the machine, working my way slowly across the shiny white surface. A hundred silvery fingerprints emerge, catching the light seeping through the door Mr Staveley has wedged open to relieve the odour. Reloading my brush, I check the back of the machine and the pale patch of wall where it once hung. Both have been wiped clean, 
as I suspected they might be. Mr. Staveley isn't going to like what I have to say. There's nothing I can do here. What do you mean? He says, waving a hand over the fingerprints adorning the front of the machine. Aren't you going to take those? There's no point. This is a public toilet. Even if I get hit on the fingerprint database, the offender will admit he came here to commune with nature. If they'd left prints on the back of the machine, or had broken into it and left them on the inside, there might have been prints that would be very difficult to explain. But they haven't. But their fingerprints will at least place them at the scene. Amateur sleuths, the bane of my life. Hollywood has much to answer for. I can also place you and I at the scene, I explain, returning my brush to its home and snapping my case shut. It doesn't mean we ripped a condom machine off the wall. So you're not gonna do anything? No. It's not the answer he wants or is prepared to accept. I know the police commissioner, personally. Judging by the number of times I've heard this line, the commissioner has a very wide circle of friends. I'm sure you do. However, given police resources are so stretched, I'm also sure the commissioner would want me to spend my time and expertise on those crimes where we have a realistic chance of prosecution. But please feel free to call him. Actually, I'm not sure at all. The rare times I've found myself in the commissioner's company, he's always struck me as a self-serving, pompous prick. My phone buzzes. It's Megan. Excuse me, I have to take this. Stepping outside, I check my watch. It's 8.15am. No prizes for guessing what this is about. Before you ask, no, you're not taking a day off school. But I'm really ill. No, you're not. You've just got a maths test, so get dressed and go to school. Megan groans. Honestly, Mum, I'm really sick. Can't you come home and look after me? No, I'm working and there's no one else. It isn't as if anyone matching the description of father is going to swoop in and help. Julian fled the scene well before the end of my first trimester and I can't even bring myself to think of her stepdad, Sean. And no one I've met on Tinder would ever be a contender for Father of the Year. Penny, my friend and landlady, is out on her boat today, and the further I keep Bernadette, my so-called mother, away from my life, the better my sanity. Besides, Megan isn't ill. You said you'd have more time for me when you got kicked off major investigations. Thanks for reminding me. But she's right. When I was sent back to division, the one upside was I wouldn't be trekking to police headquarters every day, and I'd be around more for Megan. But the previous CSI retired, and now it's just me covering 70 square miles of the moorlands and shorelands on my own. I still have to work. So what you're saying is your job's more important than your sick daughter? No. It isn't, because fortunately, my daughter isn't sick. Yes, I am. Anyway, I'm old enough to stay at home on my own. I can practically see her tossing her long cinnamon hair over her shoulder, wafting disdain in my direction. I don't have time for this. Go to school. You never have time for me. You don't care about me. You only care about your stupid job. If it weren't for my stupid job, you wouldn't be going on the school ski trip. I'm doing this for you. Are you? For Christ's sake, she is relentless. It's true that crime doesn't keep office hours. And I've enough guilt to last a lifetime with all the parents' nights and musical debuts I've missed. But that's still not enough to let Megan skive off school whenever she feels like it. Megan, just get your arse to school. God, Mum, you're such a bitch. You can't make... My phone beeps, interrupting her. I've got to go. It's work. Of course it is. Megan rings off, leaving me wondering if she genuinely is ill and I should go home. 
I took a day off last week because she felt sick, but by lunchtime she was tucking into a tub of Ben and Jerry's cookie dough ice cream and shading her eyebrows. I take the other call. What is it? Major investigations are trying to get hold of you. My stomach flips like a teenager who's just spotted her crush in the street. I loathe myself for it. Major investigations? Why? They've got a body down on Biddicombe Quay. They want you there right now. I should tell them to stick it. I'm on my way. Chapter 3 Tricia plonks herself down next to him. Her vast backside hangs over the edge of the low harbour wall. She's so close to him, her thigh brushes his, and it takes all his will not to flinch in disgust. The woman has no concept of personal space. Without making it too obvious, he shuffles along the low key wall. They've been there since seven. He doesn't mind. He's used to it. Besides, it could be worse. The sun is shining. The seagulls are swooping overhead. The boats are bobbing in the harbour. It's going to be a beautiful day. The best in a long time. And, anyway, you can't hurry these things. A few more hours won't make any difference. Tricia wanted them to go get breakfast and come back later. Typical of her to be so unprofessional. But he told her they should stay close, as they could be called any minute. They won't be, but he doesn't want to miss the show. He's never seen so many police officers marching up and down the quay with their clipboards, looking very serious, knocking on doors, questioning people like they know what they're doing when they haven't got a clue. It's very amusing. Tricia hands him a coffee he hasn't asked for. Reckon we're going to be here for hours. Did you hear about my date? With Bill, from HR. No. But he knows he's about to. He's had a ringside seat to Trisha's love life, or rather, loveless life, ever since they partnered up three years ago. And if he's learned one thing, it's that she goes through men even faster than a box of chocolate eclairs. We went to that new pub in Westlands Point, overlooking the sea. Dead romantic. I had the prawn cocktail, and it came in a bowl as big as a fish bowl. Could barely finish it. But you did. He looks at her. Everything about her screams round. Round body, round eyes, right down to the round, dyed red curls framing her round face, like a kid's drawing. And loud. She's so loud, she hurts his ears. There's a name for people like her. Larger than life. That's it. But what it actually means is that the person is a fat, unbearable attention seeker. As if to prove his point, she glugs her coffee and projects a gasp across the road in front of them, attracting a frown from a woman pushing a pram on the other side. She really is repulsive. Yeah, but barely, Sigh. Then I had the steak, which came with mushrooms, tomatoes, and those giant onion rings. Bill chose exactly the same. His favourite too. How weird is that? Reckon it means we must be compatible. Perhaps I've found my prince. God knows I've kissed enough frogs to fill a pond. Actually, a lake. Her throaty laugh is louder than her joke deserves. But then she becomes unusually thoughtful. Never thought someone like Bill would go for someone like me. 
I know you think I'm a bit of a party animal, life and soul, always up for a laugh, but a lot of it is front, Si. I just want to meet someone I can grow old with. I think Bill could be the one. He said I was really pretty. No one's ever said that to me before. Well, he can certainly believe that. He blows the froth on his coffee and watches it migrate to the other side of the cup. Trisha, I think there's something you should know. What? Shaking his head, he pretends to change his mind. Oh, forget it. It doesn't matter. You can't do that to me, Sai. What is it? Her smile deserts her, but he's in no hurry to reply. A second crime scene investigator van pulls up opposite them on the quay. He watches the driver's door fly open and a leg, already enclosed in a white forensic suit, plant itself on the road. Its owner gets out. The petite frame, the coal-black hair that skims her shoulders, the pointed chin and generous lips. It's her. It's Danielle. No, it can't be. That's impossible, and he knows it. But he can't help but scrutinise the woman for further proof. He finds reassurance in her olive skin, which speaks of the Mediterranean, whereas Danielle's was pale, and she wore her hair stair-rod straight, not frizzy and uncontrolled like this woman. But the resemblance is uncanny. And as much as he'd like to, he can't take his eyes off her. The CSI opens the back of the van and retrieves a large silver case before slamming it shut again. He watches her march towards the end of the quay, where a small crowd is huddled around the police tape. Sigh, please tell me. What? Trisha's nasal whining pierces his thoughts, dragging him back to their conversation. He turns to her, pressing his features into what he hopes passes for concern. Look, I wasn't sure if I should say anything. We're friends, though, and if it were me, I'd want to know. Know what? OK, but don't shoot the messenger. I was in the lunch queue yesterday, behind Bill, and he was with a friend. They were talking about a bet they'd made. A bet? Yes. Bill's friend had bet him twenty pounds he wouldn't take you out. Trisha's shoulders drop. A bet? He asked me out for a bet? Her lower lip quivers and her big round eyes shine with tears. Look at how upset you are. I shouldn't have said anything. I'm sorry. She runs the back of her hand under her nose. No, you were right to tell me. You're a good friend. What a total shit that Bill is. Turning away to hide his smile, his attention is caught by raised voices coming from the police cordon. It's early, but already there's an eager crowd drawn by the half-dozen police cars and the ambulance, like it's some kind of fairground attraction. Even the seagulls are excited, wheeling and whining overhead. But just as I'm about to lift the crime scene tape over my head, PCSO Christian Cobb steps in front of me. I'll need to see some ID. Of all people posted to guard the scene, it has to be him. I've pulled Cobb up several times for touching stuff at crime scenes, and I know he's mates with DC Will Lockhart, or just plain Will Lockhart, as he is now, since he was sacked. I don't want to make a scene, but a burnt-out car and a wrecked condom machine have already used up my admittedly low reserves of patience, and it's not even 9am. 
You know who I am, Cobb. Now get out of my way. Not till I've seen some ID. I mean it, Cobb. Get out of my fucking way or I'll have you on school gate duty for the rest of your days. The audience, a mix of tourists and locals, falls silent with anticipation. A dead body and a fight between the CSI and the PCSO on the key all in one day? This will be talked about for years to come. Let her through, Cobb. A weary voice cuts through our standoff. It belongs to a man in a badly fitting grey suit, his lower half obscured by a white forensic suit rolled down to his hips. He strides towards us, his jacket flapping at his sides like it's trying to keep up, while the constant breeze tries to make off with the thin strips of hair covering a bald pate. People who want great hair don't live near the sea. What's going on here? The senior investigating officer, I assume. Cobb's face flushes red. Just doing my job, sir. The SIO smooths his sandy-coloured hair back into place. What, by stopping other people doing theirs? I thought she was off major investigations. Well, she's not, otherwise she wouldn't be here, would she? I'm D.I. Bob Holt. Come through, Ali. I don't know, Holt, but guess he's Stride's replacement. After I was redeployed, I haven't paid much attention to what's been happening at the MI unit. I wonder how he knows me. Then again, the force's ranks aren't heaving with CSIs who've blown the whistle on police corruption halfway through a murder trial. Ducking under the tape, I surface on the other side to see Holt marching back towards the end of the quay and cherish a 20-metre bronze statue of a serpent coiled around a woman's naked torso, balanced on a tall plinth. Loaned by a local artist, it's loved and loathed in equal measure. I'm in the loathe camp. There's nothing positive about a dismembered body. I catch Holt up. Thanks, I say, resisting the temptation to add that I can fight my own battles. Look, I'm not going to beat around the bush. If I had my way, I wouldn't have you anywhere near my investigation. But I've got one on long-term sick, and the new lad, Jake Harris, will be out of his depth in a puddle. And I need this wrapping up quickly, so let's just get on with it. I'm guessing he's also a mate of strides. But this isn't the time or the place to launch into a rant about police corruption. And besides, I'm not looking for a new best friend. So, what have we got? Young girl, druggy, probably strangled. Woman out walking her dog this morning found her. He machine guns his words like a man for whom time is a luxury only others can afford. Who else has entered the scene besides the dog walker? A special got here first. Did a good job of securing it by all accounts. That just leaves me, Alex, the pathologist, and Jake, of course. No one else? No. Good. The forensic tent is perched awkwardly on the steps beneath the statue. Any more than this light breeze and it'll be in the sea. Jake's clearly no architect. PC Bryant, the police officer posted at the entrance, nods at Holt before eyeing me with, what? Contempt? Loathing? Disgust? Hell, it's probably all three. I snatch his clipboard scribble my name and thrust it back at him. I'm not the one who tried to fix a murder trial. Holt zips himself back up into his forensic suit, and we both slip on a fresh pair of blue shoe covers. I tuck my hair into the hood of mine, ensuring it fits snugly around my face and there are no loose strands. Inside the crime scene tent, a lanky young man also in a white forensic suit is leaning against the railings. Jake. I assume. God knows what Holt has said to him, but his cheeks blaze with enough embarrassment to have raised the temperature in the tent by several degrees. Holt clearly gave him the hairdryer treatment. He introduces us, and Jake snaps to attention. This is Ali Diamond. She'll be managing the scene. Do as she says. The D.I. told me to wait for you. That's fine. You've laid the plates. I nod at the metal rectangular plates placed at regular intervals round the plinth, protecting the scene from curious coppers and their size tens. Good job. Right. 
Let's get on, shall we? The girl's body isn't immediately obvious, which still surprises me. Even after all these years. Violent death. Such an abrupt, unprepared for ending. I always expect the corpse to retain a residual aura, drawing me towards it. It doesn't. Then, there she is. A scrap of a thing, lying on her side across the steps. Her white blonde hair swept over her face. Her mayonnaise arms flopped at her side and freckled with needle pricks. Just another casualty of the town's buoyant drug business. Like I said, the real Biddicombe is never more than a few streets away from the tourist areas. She looks young. Not much older than Megan. Although I quickly archive that thought. It never takes me to a good place. I kneel beside the girl's body for a closer look. Holt's right. There's only one obvious injury. A thick red mark rings her ballerina neck. It's the most likely cause of death and it wouldn't have taken much. It never does. I've met many horrified at how easy it is to snuff out a life. One hard squeeze would have tipped her into oblivion in less time than it takes to make a cup of tea. You said Alex has already seen her? Alex Blandford is the home office pathologist. But my question draws no response, forcing me to glance up at Holt, who's engrossed in his phone. Sensing my eyes are on him, he slips it into his pocket and makes a show of hitching his trousers to squat beside me. Yeah, been and gone. Most likely asphyxiation caused by manual strangulation. Obviously we'll know more after the PM. What about the time of death? Only a rough approximation at the moment, but somewhere between midnight and three. Do we know who she is? Janie Warren, 19, local girl. The name triggers a memory. Her face obscured by her hair. I hadn't recognised her at first. But of course, the white blonde bob. The diminutive figure. We've met before. I photographed a Janie Warren five months ago, a domestic. Her boyfriend, Chris, somebody, high on crack, beat the hell out of her. Yeah, that's her. The local CID filled us in. It was a nasty assault. I remember Janie, hell-bent on taking her bastard boyfriend to court. He was a total deadbeat, the kind of guy Megan will bring home in a few years just to wind me up. Then, out of nowhere, she drops the charges. He's been under a lot of stress. She's been nagging him. It isn't his fault he snapped, etc., etc. She told me they were even trying for a baby. Everything's going to be fine. One big happy family. Things will be different. But they never are. I should know. So what are you thinking? The boyfriend finished what he'd already started. Holt checks his watch. I don't think it. I know it. He stands up, straightening his back, then wincing with regret. He must be close to having his thirty years in probably already booked tickets on a luxury liner somewhere in the Met. That seems to be what cops do when they retire. Go on cruises. Doubt we'll ever need to rely on forensics for this one, so don't overdo it. I stand up too. How come? Holt's phone buzzes in his jacket. He fishes it out and carries on talking as he punches his reply. His multitasking would be impressive, if it wasn't so damned disrespectful. We got CCTV showing the two of them on the corner of Argyle Street at around 11. They turn left onto Quayside and head towards the end of the quay where they drop out of sight. Then at 12.30, you see him, Chris Banstead, lugging it back from the quay. There were only two of them on the quay and there's only one way in and one way out. What about the live cam footage? We checked. They don't record it because it costs extra. But we won't need it. The guy's as guilty as they come. We've already brought him in. Has he admitted it? No, but he will. At the moment he won't even believe she's dead. Says they came here, smoked weed, had sex, and he left her to clean herself up while he went off to a mate's to play Call of Duty. Classy guy. I run an eye over the steps. 
Okay, we'll get the visuals done first. Then we'll bag up the spliffs and the cans. Do you have her phone? No. We've searched. We're thinking he might have thrown it in the harbour. That isn't good. Phones are evidential gold, revealing every detail of our lives, including the ones that help convict murderers. Although it'll take more than a strangled drug addict to get the police divers out. But something else is troubling me. That's odd. What? There's a lot of sand around. Well, we are by the sea. I meet Holt's smirk with stone. Lame gags and murdered girls aren't a great combo for me. I glance at the harbour, now full and bobbing with boats. You're right, the tide was out last night. I know full well that isn't what he means. But you said the CCTV picked them up on the corner of Argyle Street and Quayside, which means they walked around the harbour rather than crossing the sands to reach the quay. Maybe they went for a romantic stroll earlier. Holt glances at his watch, tipping my irritation into annoyance, and just a couple of phone beeps away from full-blown anger. What little attention he's given this girl is rapidly waning. He's already ticked the boxes on this one and filed it under D for domestic, but I haven't finished. You might also want to check the boyfriend's footwear. Why? I point to a shoe print on the top step, its delicate grooves perfectly sculpted in sand. There's even some lettering, a V, maybe. Probably part of the manufacturer's mark. It's too big to belong to a female, so that rules out your dog walker. It's not a police boot, either. I'd say it's most likely a brogue of some kind, though I reckon the boyfriend's more of a trainer kind of guy, don't you? Holt fixes on the mark like he's trying to magic it away. Could have been left earlier by a tourist, he says finally. Unlikely. It rained until around 11.30 last night. It would have been washed away. This was made after it stopped raining. It isn't the first time I've screwed with the detective's cosy theory. And in Holt's case, I can't deny a blast of pleasure, because as much as he wants to, he can't ignore this. OK, we'll check his shoes. But even if the shoe print isn't his, I'm confident there was no one else involved in Janie's murder. His phone stirs again. He leaves it where it is. Look, I've got to get back to the Nick. We're massively short-staffed at the moment. He looks at me like it's my fault, which it is. No one wants to join a unit that has the stench of corruption about it. I'm briefing on a child abuse inquiry going on in the south of the county. What about the PM? Is it 2.30? I'll try to make it, but if I don't, carry on without me. He turns to leave. And, Ali? Yes? There's no need to sweat this one. We've got the guy. It's just a case of going through the motions. When you're done, send me a copy of your report. In other words, don't think for one minute you're back on major investigations. One more thing. He hesitates long enough for me to know I'm not going to like this. I want Jake's name on all the exhibits, in case he's called to court. What? Why? You know why. Jake's frowning. He's no idea what Holt's talking about, but Holt's not getting away with this. I'm perfectly capable of giving evidence in court. I can't help it if your bent colleagues think it's a good idea to fix a trial. Besides, I'm leading the scene and Jake is too inexperienced for the doc. Jake's expression agrees with me. And I'm the SIO. Holt says this like it trumps everything. And although I'm a civilian CSI, and he can't technically order me to do anything, not like he can a lower-ranking police officer, he's right. It's his show. So much so, he doesn't wait for my response. And then it's just me and Jake. This time it's my phone that rings in my pocket. It's Megan again. Do you mind, Jake? It's my daughter. Sure. Megan hurls a list of ailments down the line. Evidence as to why I must collect her from school immediately. My temples begin to throb.
I don't need this. Not now. I can't come. I'm at work. Go to the nurse and get some Nurofen. They won't give me any. You never sign the consent form. Please come and get me, Mum. I can't, Megan. I'll text the school nurse. I could be dying for all you care. She hangs up on me for the second time today, leaving me staring at my home screen. My favourite photo of a pre-teen Megan, flashing a smile I'd forgotten she had. Something's up. I'm not sure what, but it's not like her to phone me from school. I try to get hold of Penny, but she's not picking up, and I can't bring myself to call Bernadette. Do you need to get your daughter? I can crack on here. Jake's words aren't dripping with confidence. I look down at Janie's pale, thin corpse that looks like it's been tossed aside like chip paper. I can't leave her. This needs to be done right if we're to nail her killer. And Jake isn't up to it. Not yet. No, she'll be fine. Thanks, though. Let's get on with it. Remember, if in doubt, bag it. The first and most important rule of crime scene investigation, Jake, is assume nothing. But as we place the numbered markers next to the items we plan to remove, I can't help thinking about Megan. She didn't sound ill. She sounded upset. Chapter 4 The CSI appears at the entrance to the tent. She tugs back the hood of her white protective suit and wisps of dark hair dislodge themselves from her hair clip. Just like Danielle's would on a windy walk before everything changed. Scanning the key, she spots him and gives him the thumbs up. He waves back. They're ready for us, he calls over to Tricia, who is leaning against the wall of a takeaway, forking chips into her mouth, trying to chomp away the memory of Bill, no doubt. She rolls her eyes. Interrupting mealtimes always makes her irritable, and she hesitates, trying to decide whether or not she can save the chips for later, before reluctantly dumping them in the bin. The crowd murmurs at their arrival, parting to make way for them, sensing they're finally going to get to see something interesting. He can't blame them. There's something beguiling about the dead. Some of them. He swings the police tape over their heads. The PCSO nods his approval. No one questions the paramedics. Climbing into the back of the ambulance, parked behind the police cordon, he unclips the trolley and guides it off the vehicle and towards Tricia. Between them, they lower it onto the ground and wheel it towards the white tent and the waiting CSI. Hi. I don't think we've met before, have we? I was on major investigations until recently. Most of our jobs were in the south of the county, I'm back on division, so I guess we'll be seeing a bit more of each other. I'm Ali Diamond, by the way. The CSI. She looks down at her gloved hands, streaked with dirt. Probably best if we don't shake hands. Hi, Ali. I'm Tricia Wilkins, and this is Simon Pascoe. Nice to meet you both. I just wanted to apologise for keeping you waiting so long the CSI says, but she doesn't mean it. She couldn't care less that she's kept them hanging around for hours. No problem, says Tricia. Great. Well, we're ready for you now, the CSI says. Hoisting the trolley over the railings which surround the statue, they park it just inside the tent's entrance, away from prying eyes, and follow the CSI inside. She's just round here? The CSI guides them around the base of the statue. In his peripheral vision, he's aware of a pale, ribbon-like form on the ground. But he doesn't dare look down 
for fear of how the sight might affect him. The only other person present is the other CSI, who is hovering on the steps below the statue like he doesn't know what to do with himself. He looks about fourteen, wet behind the ears and totally out of his depth. The CSI turns to them. There's not much room in here, so Jake and I will get out of your way while you move the body. If you can keep to the metal plates, that would make our lives a lot easier. Tricia smiles. Of course. No problem. The CSIs leave, and it's just the two of them. Poor kid, mutters Tricia, heaving a sigh. Come on, Sigh. Let's get this done. He nods and finally glances down. There she is, draped across the stone steps, exactly where he left her. Jake worries me. At first he's quite chatty and our conversation flows, but after I task him to photograph Janie's body, it trickles to nothing. That's fine, he needs to concentrate. He gets one chance to photograph the body in situ and he can't afford to mess it up. He checks and rechecks the camera screen, ensuring he's photographed her from every conceivable angle. But by the time the paramedics remove Janie's corpse, he's slipped into one of those silences that long-in-the-tooth CSIs like me know to avoid. We return to the CSI van with armfuls of brown exhibit bags and I search for something neutral to say. Anything to drag him back from whatever dark hole he's fallen down. So, did you go to uni? Yeah, I did photography. What about you? Did you go? For a while. No need to mention an unexpected pregnancy and subsequent arrival of Megan cut short a materials science degree at Oxford. So, why come here? It's not exactly a crime hotspot. It could be years before we have another murder. I couldn't be anywhere else. I love surfing. If I'm not at work, I'm down at Mort Sands. My favourite beach. Terrible signal, too, so there's no chance you'll be interrupted riding the waves. Jake forces a smile. Seriously, it's good to have interests outside your job. It'll keep you sane. So, what are your interests? The question throws me. When Megan was young, I used to take her up to Exmoor where we'd photograph whatever wildlife crossed our path. The ponies, mostly. Now, unless there's a purchase at the end of it, she won't walk further than a few hundred yards. My teenage daughter, I guess. Sounds like a full-time job. My sister Beth is 19. She still runs rings round Mum and Dad. He smiles at the thought of his younger sister but it's a smile tainted with something else. Fear. Crime scenes resonate most when we identify with the victim in some way. I'm guessing Beth is small and blonde, like Janie. Jake glances back at the tent. Photographing that girl freaked me out a bit. When I first saw her, for a minute, I thought it was... But it isn't Beth. I cut him off for his own good. It'll never be Beth. If nothing else, she's got a great big ugly brother to look out for her. My efforts to lighten Jake's mood fall flat, but at least it switches his focus. Who could do that to another human being? The list is longer than you'd think, but I wouldn't dwell on it. You'll send yourself mad. Or worse, it'll affect how you do your job. He smiles at my lame joke. Yeah, you're right. But doesn't it make you angry? Which part? That the boyfriend will get a cosy prison cell, Sky TV, drugs delivered by drone, and all paid for by us. Assuming it's him? Jake loads his bags into the back of the van. We should do what the Americans do and give them a lethal injection. A popular sentiment in cop circles but not one I share, even though I've spent my life elbow-deep in other people's depravity. 
Maybe I've seen enough death to know that more death never fixes anything. I'm about to steer conversation towards the safe territory of last night's television when we're interrupted by voices loud enough to outdo the gulls in concert overhead. At the police cordon, a woman is gesticulating wildly in front of an unmoved cob. Why won't you let me through? I've a right to know what's going on. Her cheeks are stained with dark rivers of mascara applied that morning when she thought her daughter was still alive. This is Sue Warren, I realise. Janie's mother. I've seen her before at the hospital, the first time Janie was beaten up by her boyfriend. Just tell me, is it her? She pleads with Cobb, but her anguish makes no impression on him. He really is a prize prick. I'm not at liberty to discuss the details of the case. Jesus, the man is never at liberty to do anything. Someone told me it was my Janie. She's not answering her phone. I just want to know, is it Janie? Her daughter's name is swallowed up by sobs that shake her body. Cobb looks down at her like she's just vomited on his shoes. You need to call the station and speak to Detective Inspector Bob Holt. Sue looks up, eyes flashing with fury. I just want to know if it's her. She tries to dodge Cobb, but he's too quick for her. His long arms wrap themselves around her torso. You're not going anywhere. Get off me! You've no right to stop me! She's my daughter! But Cobb has her clamped in his arms. I know what's coming next. He has no power to arrest her, so he'll call for backup tell the cavalry he's been assaulted, and she'll be bundled into the back of a cop car and whisked into custody. He has form for it. Sure enough, holding Sue Warren with one arm, Cobb reaches for his radio. Shit! Take these! I thrust the brown exhibit bags at Jake and race over to the cordon. Throwing the crime scene tape over my head, I grab Cobb's arm. For Christ's sake, let her go, Cobb! Had it just been the three of us, I've no doubt Cobb would have swatted me aside like a wasp. But even an idiot like Cobb knows a crowd of witnesses when he sees one. He releases Sue Warren, which both confuses and calms her. Come with me, Sue. Taking her by the elbow, I steer her behind the CSI van, out of sight from the crowd. My name's Ali. I'm not a police officer. I'm the crime scene investigator. Sue's sobs subside to chest-filling breaths. It's her, isn't it? It's my Janie. There's no way to sugarcoat this. Yes. I'm so sorry. Where is she? I need to see her. She pleads with Jake and interprets his helpless stare as refusal. You can't stop me. I'm a mother. I have a right. I slip my arm around her shoulder. Sue, she's gone. They've taken her to the mortuary. But she needs me. I know, and you'll be able to see her. I'll arrange for an officer to take you. We'll take good care of her, I promise. She looks at me, and recognition seeps into her eyes. You photographed Janie when that bastard beat her up, didn't you? Yes, I did. You warned her about him. She told me when I picked her up from the hospital that you begged her to leave him, that he wouldn't stop, and now he's gone and killed her. Her words spark a fresh flow of tears. My baby gone. Gone. She crumples into my arms. Her body heaves and shudders. Her grief invading her like a virus condemning her to terminally mourn the loss of her daughter. I hug her tightly. It's okay, Sue. I have you. Jake frowns at me as if to say, what the hell do you think you're doing? This isn't in the job description. But I ignore him. He's right, of course. Our domain is the dead, not the living. But in that moment, I'm no longer a CSI. I'm a mother. Chapter 5 Just as he throws the last of the wet wipes into the disposal unit, 
The ambulance turns off the main road into the hospital grounds and pulls up in front of an anonymous door tucked away around the back of the hospital. The mortuary. A few seconds later, Tricia throws open the back doors. Even that's a performance. I knew I couldn't trust Bill. Something about his eyes. Too close together. I should have listened to my instincts. What a shitty thing to do. You know, your Jackie's a lucky lady. I wish all guys could be as decent as you. You all right? You were very quiet in the back there. Thought you'd nod it off. He unclips the trolley, and together they manoeuvre it off the back of the ambulance. Tricia presses the buzzer to the mortuary, and a disembodied male voice invites them in. They wheel the trolley into the building and park it in the corridor. Through a large window, the voice's owner, Gary, the assistant mortician, is sitting at his desk in the main office. He waves at them. Hi, guys. Come in. His face, his half-beard and a scraggly ponytail hangs over his shoulder. He's heard that Gary's in a heavy metal band. I can just imagine this idiot screaming into a mic about drinking alcohol and having sex. Tricia hands the paperwork over. There you go, Gas. All yours. He smiles back at her. And how's my favourite paramedic? Tricia giggles like she's thirteen. So much for Bill being the only one for her. Faithless tart. His Jackie would never behave like that. Fine. How's my favourite assistant mortician? Thing you'll find, I'm the only assistant mortician, but I'll take that. Gary winks at Tricia, and she giggles some more. Their radios hiss into life, and Tricia looks to him to respond, but he pretends he hasn't noticed, taking the paperwork from Gary, giving up. The reception down here is crap. I better find out what they want. Back in a bit. Tricia disappears, and he passes the paperwork back to Gary, who runs a surprisingly careful eye over it. He doesn't look the meticulous type. Thanks, mate. This is fine. Mate. He hates that word. He's not Gary's mate. He's not anyone's mate. Where shall I put her? Just leave her where she is. What? In the corridor? Well, it's not like she's going to get up and walk out, is it? Gary's eyes mock him, and it takes all his resolve not to punch this lout in the mouth. It just seems a little disrespectful, that's all, to leave her out in the hallway like a piece of rubbish. Nothing I can do about it, fella. We're full. Don't know what they're doing on the jerry wards, but these oldies are popping off all over the place. But she's a murder victim. He can't bear to think of her all alone. So? There's no pecking order down here, mate. It's first come, first served. Don't worry. The undertaker's are due. That'll clear the backlog, and then we'll see if we can find her a cabinet. Anyways, she's in for a PM this afternoon. I might just take her straight into the examination room. He gives the idiot a side glance. You guys must be a bit worried at the moment. Gary continues ticking boxes on a form. Why is that? I hear this place is next in line, in the cuts. His pen stops, mid-tick. What? You're kidding, right? No. I know someone in the chief exec's office. They're thinking of cutting the number of staff and shifting some of the work to the Exeter Royal. He shakes his head. 
I can't go to Exeter. I live in Barnston. It's miles away. I'd have to give the band up and everything. Simon nods sympathetically. That's rough. Too right it is. That band is my life. Well, nothing's confirmed, but you might want to start looking for something else. Mate. For fuck's sake. They won't be happy until they've got rid of us all. Thanks for the tip. Sign here for me. He holds his clipboard up, and Simon signs his name with a flourish. Chapter 6 Holt catches up with me just as I buzz the mortuary to let me in. He takes a moment to catch his breath, adjusting his jacket and checking his hair is still in place. His phone is welded to his hand as if expecting a call any moment. I'm not staying, just drop by for the first few minutes to see what Alex has to say. Got a raid going down tonight. Need to brief the team. I get the message. Holt is a D.I., He's constantly juggling more cases than is humanly possible, especially after all the cuts to policing. But he's got his priorities wrong on this one. Besides, I've a bone the size of my femur to pick with him. Sue Warren, Janie's mother, was on the quay, and she was in a right state. She had no idea if it was Janie or not. No one had bothered to tell her. Holt can't ignore the accusation in my voice. Someone should have found Sue Warren long before she got wind it could be her daughter dead on the waterfront. We had the wrong address for her. That's not good enough. The poor woman was out of her mind. I had to break it to her that it was her daughter, and I got one of the house-to-house -house team to bring her to the hospital. Holt prickles at the subtext. This is your job, not mine. Only you'd already cleared off. And goes on the defensive. These things happen, and anyway, D.C. Trotter met her here and did the formal identification. I'm not happy, but I've made my point, so I move on. So how's the interview going with Janie's boyfriend? Good. He isn't going to tell me any more. I'm not on the team. Unlike Stride, who included CSIs at every stage of the investigation, because no one understands a crime scene like a CSI, Holt's approach is strictly need to know, and a CSI who hung her colleagues out to dry in court doesn't. The door opens. It's Gary, the assistant mortician. Normally he greets us with a grin and a jokey not you lot again, followed by a quick plug for his latest thrash metal gig. But today all we get is a brief nod as he leads us into the white tiled post mortem room. Alex Blandford the home office pathologist, is already there, scrubbed up and bent over Janie Warren's pale, naked corpse, inspecting the red mark around her neck. Lying on her back, her hair drawn aside, her face no longer lined by life and her body shrunken by drugs, she looks much younger than her nineteen years. A large, slightly wonky track, like a child's drawing, runs the length of her chest where she's already been opened up and sewed back together. Alex greets me with a broad smile. It's been a while. Hi, Ellie. Good to see you. It's been a long time. Hello, Alex. How are you? How's Marjorie and the boys? Over the years and over corpses at various stages of decomposition, Alex and I have got to know each other well. Nothing drives you to cling to the normality of your life more than a sudden death. I've lived Alex's son's GCSEs, A-levels and degrees, his wife Marjorie's developing skill as a calligrapher, and his irrational love for Harriet, his breakdown-prone triumph spitfire. In return, he's lived Megan's first day at secondary school, dental braces, and my disasters on Tinder. It's kept us sane. Alex grins. She's still nagging me to retire and then moaning that I get under her feet if I'm off for more than three days. How's Megan? Still fifteen. He laughs. Don't worry, it doesn't last forever. Holt taps his phone against his palm, impatient to move on. So, what have we got, Doc? Yes, right, we've narrowed the time of death to between twelve and two. 
Holt can barely believe his luck and throws me the smuggest of looks. Excellent, that fits with what we've got so far. CCTV shows Janie and her boyfriend Chris Banstead walking along the quay towards the statue at 11.17pm. And then, at 12.28am, you can see the boyfriend running away back towards the town. As Alex explains how ambient temperatures and body temperature mean it's entirely possible Janie's life was extinguished nearer to 12.30 than 2, I set my camera case on the stainless steel counter that skirts the room. Flipping the catches, I remove my battered Nikon, click the close-up lens into place, and slip the strap over my head. So what about the cause of death? Says Holt. Alex removes his pen from the breast pocket of his green tunic and circles the marks on the neck. It's as I thought, death by asphyxiation. He used his hands too. See here, you can even make out the thumb marks on the front of her neck. Focusing the camera on her neck, I fire off some shots. Then I stand back and look at Janie's face. Something's different about her, but I can't work out what. Any other injuries? I ask. Alex scans Janie's corpse, like he might have missed something. No, she had recent sex, but it doesn't appear to be forced. Holt nods. The boyfriend has already admitted to having sex with her under the statue. Apparently Cherish is some kind of fertility symbol. Can't see it myself. For once, we agree. How a serpent coiled around a decapitated woman could possibly represent new life is beyond me. She didn't try to fight off her attacker then? I ask Alex. How could she if he had her by the neck? Alex raises an eyebrow at Holt's dismissiveness towards me. There's a rule in criminal investigations. We've all dealt with the bizarre and the unfathomable in our time, which means no comment or question is too ridiculous to voice. It doesn't appear so, he says. We couldn't find any defence injuries. Often a victim will claw at their neck to try to get their attacker off them, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. We're still waiting for the toxicology report. But if she was drunk or on drugs, that might explain why she didn't fight back. I'll finish the photos and do the nail scrapes. Sure, but I wouldn't hold out much hope. They were the cleanest nails I've seen in a while. No skin or blood. Not even any dirt. I kneel down, eye level with Janie's body, and fire off a few frames of her hands and enlarge them on my camera's display. You're right. Her nails are spotless. I turn to Holt. Doesn't that strike you as odd? Holt shrugs. Nothing strikes me as odd in this job. She's just had sex. The last thing on her mind would be the state of her nails. Perhaps the sex was less than satisfying. I ignore Holt's facetiousness and my own urge to ask if he's speaking from personal experience. What if someone else cleaned her nails? After she was killed. Someone who's forensically aware. Holt rolls his eyes. The CCTV on the corner of Argyle Street and Quayside shows the only people on the quay were Janie and Banstead. Then I realise what's bothering me about Janie's face. It's been wiped clean of makeup. On the steps beneath Cherish, her eyes had a flick of eyeliner at each corner, and her lashes were coated in mascara. Did you or Gary clean her face up when she came in? I'm sure she was wearing makeup on the key. Alex shakes his head. No, Gary might have done, although he'd normally wait until you'd been in. Anyway, we've bagged up her clothing for you. Gary will let you have it on your way out. Holt's phone buzzes. Thanks, Alex. I need to get going. If anything else crops up, let me know. Phone clamped to his ear, Holt steps out of the room. That's it for him. Job done. Case closed. On to the next one. It doesn't matter what I think. He's the SIO. This is his show.
I unclip the lens from my camera and place it back into its foam compartment. How are things really, Ali? I'm about to brush him off with a fine, but he deserves better. He's asking because we've known each other for years, and he cares. Pretty rough for a while now. I swallow back the urge to tell Alex how people I've worked with, some I thought of as friends, now blank me in the corridor. Or how when I enter a canteen, others get up and leave. Or how I've even been sent to jobs that don't exist. He senses my discomfort and I'm grateful he doesn't pursue the cause. I saw the news. Seems like D.I. Stride was playing fast and loose with a few other cases too. Yes, I heard it wasn't just Sean Jones's murder. That's often the way with corruption cases. Once uncovered, they tend to spawn. D.I. Stride cut his teeth on corruption long before Mannering entered the dock. You did the right thing, you know. Did I? Then how come I've been exiled to the back of beyond? That's the police service for you. Happy to catch criminals, but not so grateful when it's one of their own. He pauses. I know you, Ali. You'll be fine. I don't respond, and Alex changes the subject. You're not convinced the boyfriend killed Janie, are you? That obvious, huh? I smile, relieved to be back on safer ground. Well, you never were one to keep your opinions to yourself. Good to see that hasn't changed. I look down at Janie's face, pale and serene, like the angels Bernadette used to tell me about when I was little the ones bursting with love and jubilation. But there's no joy here. Just despair. Something doesn't sit right with me. What do you mean? I photographed her when her boyfriend beat her up. He lost his rag, but he used his fists, even when he was completely out of control. He didn't try to throttle her. You know, two women a week are murdered by a current or former partner. The killer is most likely to be her boyfriend. You're right. Maybe I'm looking for something that isn't there. There's something else you should know. She had a miscarriage fairly recently. A miscarriage? Yes, of course, I remember now. The last time I saw Janie, all smiles, waving my concerns away. It's fine now, we're good. Chris says he was just a bit stressed. We're even trying for a baby. The classic response. A baby will make everything better. Only it doesn't. And I seized my last chance to tell Janie to get out. They never change, Janie. You must leave him. He needs help. And then I did something I never do. Not in all the DA cases I've attended. I shared my story. It was the only way I was going to persuade this young girl she was in danger. A long time ago, I was with a guy who used to hit me. He always promised to stop, but he never did. And the last time, he almost killed me. Please, don't go back to this guy. His name was Sean. And it was my loneliness, that miserable state that tramples all reason, that brought him into our lives. He'd always had a reputation for being a bit handy in a fight, but saved his punches for the pint spillers down the pub. Then, one day, he turned on me, and life became a cycle of slaps and sorries until Megan and I escaped. I told Janie this, but she just gave me a look that said he never really loved you and wasn't really sorry for what he did. Not like her Chris. And now she's dead. This time it's my phone that buzzes. It's an automated text from Megan's school. Oh, shit. What is it? Asks Alex. Megan didn't register for class this afternoon. Alex smiles and shakes his head at some distant memory, although I don't remember either of his kids bunking off school. Remember, it doesn't last forever. Chapter 7 
Jackie is where he left her. Her tiny frame, clad in a shapeless grey shift, she looks lost in the large, sturdy, orthopaedic recliner that takes up most of the lounge. Not that she needs an orthopaedic recliner, but it suits him to let her think she does. In front of her are three television screens stacked in a triangle and tuned into the live cams around North Devon. Jackie likes to watch the families on the various beaches. Absorbed in other people's lives, she doesn't notice him at first, standing in the doorway. He doesn't want to interrupt her, not when she's attempting to extract one of the few remaining strands of hair clinging to her scalp, all that's left of what is meant to be a shoulder-length brown bob. She scores a strand, lays it across her tongue, closes her mouth, and swallows. There's nothing left of her eyelashes or brows, her face a beige blank canvas, waiting to be shaded and coloured in. She graduated to her head some time ago, where now just a few tufts of hair reside. It's a symptom of her anxiety, and Jackie is anxious about everything. It's why she doesn't go out. That, and she looks like someone has taken a flymo to her head. She's not alone. Dozens of miniature character teddy bears line every sill, shelf, ledge, and even the sofa, fixing him with their glassy stares. Jackie says they keep her company when he's on long shifts, which is most of the time. Balanced on her armrest, watching the screens with her, is her current favourite, a beige-brown bear in a white frilly shirt and black waistcoat called Darcy, apparently. Darcy has replaced Sherlock Holmes and, before that, Batman. One day, he'll burn the lot of them. An unfamiliar, woody smell hangs in the living room, like she's just got in from a long stroll in the woods. Only, that's impossible. She's not left the house in two years, although that doesn't stop her knowing what's going on in the world. When he walks into the room, the movement startles her, and she elbows Darcy to the floor. He lands at his feet but he doesn't pick the bear up. You scared me. Sorry. Have you seen this? Isn't it awful? I don't know what the place is coming to. Her upturned, hairless face is unusually flushed, and it's then that he notices that all three screens are tuned to the live cam on Biddicombe Key. She never watches the key. Yes. Terrible business. We got called there this morning, but how did you find out about it? Archon told me they found a girl's body on the quay this morning. He gave me a foot massage today. Apparently, it was a local girl. A drug addict. So Arjun thinks it was an overdose. So that's what the smell is. Arjun is Jackie's carer and all-around busybody. He can't stand the man, putting ideas into her head, laughing and flirting with her as if he fancies her when he knows he's repulsed by her. Everyone is. It's Barbara's fault, Jackie's health visitor. She said that with him at work for long periods of time, it would be good to have someone check up on her. What she really meant is that she couldn't be bothered to check in on Jackie. But before he knew what was happening, Arjun appeared on their doorstep. He let him in, knowing Jackie wouldn't allow herself to be handled by a foreigner, 
a brown one at that, and, sure enough, she was clutching her favourite teddies at the time, Edward and Mrs. Simpson, for protection when he strolled into the living room. Then he made some crack about how he only came to this country because he hates curry and couldn't get a decent roast back home, and it was like they were best friends. He even bought her a teddy dressed in a red and gold sari for her last birthday. It had one of those red bindi dots on its forehead. Now he comes every day. I wouldn't listen to anything Arjun tells you. But he's very kind to me, even though, you know, he's one of them. He used this juniper oil on my feet today. His mother swore by it. She had circulation problems too. She lived to ninety-two. And he really shouldn't be using unprescribed medicine on you. Even homeopathic remedies can be very dangerous. Her smile fades. I didn't realise. I thought it was harmless. He pats her arm. The grey material crumples until his hand lands on a thin, bony limb. It's not your fault. That's why I'm here, my love. To keep you safe. She nods, and, like a child, her mind moves to something happier. Did you get them? She knows full well he has, but he still likes it if he teases her a little. Hmm, let me see. He slides his hand into his trouser pockets. No, not there. Wait! What's this? He taps his jacket and produces a large bag of Haribo gold bears, which Jackie eats by the cartload. But it doesn't matter how many she puts away. She never puts weight on. Jackie reaches out for them, but her face clouds and she pauses. Harjan says that I should reduce the amount of sweets I eat as they might be the reason for my... She points to her lower stomach. You know? They're not responsible for the pain in her lower abdomen. And, anyway, they're better at covering up her noxious breath that no amount of aquafresh or vigorous toothbrushing can freshen. Although, as the day wears on, it seeps through like a blocked drain on a hot day. He withdraws his hand. Arjun this, Arjun that, anyone would think you fancy the man. Are you sure you're not having an affair with him or something? The idea that anyone would find her attractive is ludicrous, of course. No, Simon, I would never do anything like that. He just... Mentioned it, that's all. Honestly, I go out of my way to buy you something special and you just throw it back in my face. He stuffs the packet back into his pocket. Fine, I'll take it back to the shop. Her eyes, their largeness exaggerated by the lack of lashes, grow even larger and tear up with confusion and apology. No! Please, don't do that. I'm sorry. I'm really grateful for the sweets. Thank you, Simon. He lets her stew a few seconds more. Please. I'm sorry, she whispers. And he relents and gives her the packet. He picks Darcy up and puts him back on the armrest. You're beautiful, just the way you are. Arjun's just a carer. What does he know about anything? I'm a medical professional, and I say a few sweets won't do you any harm. Yes, 
Yes, you're right. Thank you. She digs around for a few seconds before finding what she's looking for. Pinching a gold bear between her thumb and forefinger, she holds it aloft her like a precious jewel before popping it in her mouth. What happened to the girl on the key? How did she die? She says, searching for a second gold bear. Strangled, I think. My goodness, that's terrible. Do they know who did it? No, but I heard she was there with her boyfriend, so I guess he's the prime suspect. Who was she? He looks at her. She's not normally this curious. A local girl. I knew her. She had a miscarriage a few months ago and Tricia and I were called to attend. She was hysterical. There was so much blood she thought she was going to die. But he told her that wasn't going to happen. Then he went through the usual questions to calm her down and gauge her mental state. Can you tell me your full name? What day of the week is it? Well done. Let's try a harder one. What's your Instagram handle? She was so grateful he'd saved her life, she didn't think twice. Jamster, 2001. And his standard response, to pull a face and ask, what kind of a name is that, made her laugh. A nurse at the hospital told him she'd been beaten by her boyfriend. It was then that he knew for certain she'd be perfect. Fragile and vulnerable, she wouldn't be able to resist anyone who showed her the slightest kindness. She wouldn't be able to resist him. She lost her baby too. That's sad. A wistfulness passes over Jackie, pausing the next Haribo between the bag and her mouth. She loves children. She spends hours cooing over the babies in their white frilly bonnets and the toddlers in their nappy swimmers that star on the live cam. She'd have loved her own children. But you have to have sex first. Yes, I guess it is, he says. But he doesn't want to discuss her with Jackie. I met her boyfriend too, and he was a complete thug. I've no idea what she saw in him. She rotates the sweet around her mouth. And now he's killed her. Yes, it looks that way. Anyway, I'd better get on. I'm already late for my cycling club. The boys will be wondering where I am. He goes to kiss her cheeks, making sure his lips don't make contact. He executes the move swiftly, but not fast enough, and he's caught in the stench of her breath. She doesn't notice, of course, but picks up one of the remotes to change the live cam to Mort Sands, still dotted with families, enclosed in their striped wind cheetahs, even though the tide is out and the sun low and their skin has begun to pimple under the cooling breeze. He never planned to marry again. Not after the first time. But not long after he moved to Biddicombe, his little old lady neighbours started joking with him about why he hadn't been snapped up, a good-looking guy like him. Own house, lovely smile, great job. Own teeth, ha ha ha. Beryl, four doors down, would say things like, if only I was thirty years younger, I'd nab you for myself. He sensed they weren't really joking, and that they thought there was something abnormal about him. So, 
worried the lack of a wife was drawing attention to himself, he decided to remedy the situation. If he knows one thing about churches, it is that they are a repository of the rejected, those souls that don't measure up to society's norms. Don't worry. God still loves you. But God isn't enough. Misfits crave attention and affection, even the fake variety, just like everyone else. So he began his search at St. Joseph's, joining a committee called Friendly Faces that went out into the community checking up on God's flock. At church one day, the vicar told him about a woman called Jackie. She had recently lost her mum, who was also her carer. Bullied as a child for her small stature, Jackie suffered severe anxiety and agoraphobia. Her mum, when she was alive, was the only person she would leave the house with. Simon knew. Instantly, he had found the answer to his problems. The vicar gave him her address, and the next day he turned up at her house with a bag of her favourite sweets, Haribo Gold Bears. She still had eyebrows then, but her lashes were little more than a broken line of stubble. He couldn't believe his luck when he saw what she did with the hair she pulled out. He was good at talking to people, and it wasn't long before he became her new safe person, and then her fiancé. They organised the wedding, a tiny affair for a church, and then, out of the blue, she broke it off. The vicar said the idea of marital relations terrified her, as she'd never done it before. This just got better. Over a family-sized bag of Haribo, Simon told her he wasn't like other men. His love for her was so great he was prepared to forego all that nonsense just to be with her. She cried with relief and gratitude, while he tried not to laugh at the idea that she could possibly think he fancied her. Anyway, he couldn't have done it with her, even if he wanted to. It's 8pm. I've called Megan's friends to ask if they've seen her. They've all said no, but they've reached the age where it's impossible to tell if they're lying. So having already trawled her usual haunts, the chip shop on the high street, a bus shelter near the quay, and a bench in a particularly remote corner of Biddicombe Wreck with no success, I head to Mort Sands in the hope she might be there. When the sun is high and unhindered by cloud, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world. And it's no wonder that the tourists flock to it. But the chances of Megan being here at the beach are slight. She wouldn't have walked. And she doesn't have the money for the bus. Which is intermittent at best. But I have to try. By the time I arrive, the sun is a great orange orb squatting low on the horizon. Its power is already waning, giving way to a fresh sea breeze that infuses the towels wrapped around the shoulders of the little kids until their stick-like legs begin to tremble, finally persuading their parents to pack up and head back to the car park. The knee-high, messy waves have already sent the surfers sloping to their camper vans, which are now drenched in the cloying aroma of weed. It's been a while since Megan and I tugged on our wetsuits and took the bodyboards out, and I'd do anything to return to those days where every one of my suggestions was grabbed with enthusiasm and joy instead of sullen indifference. On the edge of the beach is the coffee shack, a retro silver bullet-shaped van 
stationed at the entrance to the beach just below the main slipway leading from a car park carved out of the dunes. With his sun-dried hair and Hawaiian shirts, its owner Liam Green does a convincing laid-back beach barista impression. But he was in the police once, and nothing gets past him. If Megan has been here, he'll know about it. I find Liam wiping down the counter. His surprise at seeing me quickly turns to a huge smile. You're brave, he laughs. The water's a bit chilly this time of the day. I'm not here for a swim. Have you seen Megan anywhere? No, sorry. Why? She's gone AWOL. Ah, I see. Well, she's not been on the beach. I'd have seen her. Have you tried the wreck? I already checked it. She's not there either. I doubt she's got far. Yeah, you're right. But it's getting a bit late. Thanks anyway. I turn to go back to my car. Ali? Liam calls after me. Yes? Let me help you look for her. His offer takes me by surprise. But you're not due to close for another hour or so. Liam looks over at the camper vans on the other side of the car park. Their curtained windows opened just enough to release a pall of bluish smoke. I think finding Megan is more important than helping a few potheads stave off the munchies, don't you? I pretend to take a sharp breath. Well, I don't know. That sounds quite an important service that you're providing. He grins and unties his apron. Just give me a minute. Thanks, Liam. That's really kind of you. No trouble. We'll find her. He says this with such calm certainty that I believe him. While I'm finishing up here, why don't you ask those guys over there if they've seen her? They've just come from Biddicombe. They might have passed her on the coastal path. He nods towards the car park, now virtually empty except for a handful of camper vans in one corner and half a dozen men in jeans and windbreakers riding their battered mountain bikes in circles. Several are attempting a wheelie, which is strangely unsettling given they're all over the age of thirty. I know most of them. They all live in Biddicombe, like me, and they all have learning difficulties. Some have been victimised, and some even beaten up for their vulnerability, which is where I come in, photographing the results of someone else's ignorance and cruelty. Parked in the centre of them like a circus ringmaster is an older man. It's difficult to tell under the helmet, but I'd estimate he's late thirties, clad shoulder to toe in black and red lycra that reveals a trim rather than muscular frame. He's perched on a matching sleek racer, watching the others. Whether the spectacle is causing him pleasure or consternation is impossible to tell, as his face is devoid of any expression. When he sees me jogging towards him, he removes his helmet and gloves, like a racing driver. Sweat has dampened and darkened his baby-fine blonde hair, and it takes me a second or two to realise it's Simon Pascoe, the paramedic I met on the quay that morning. I stand at the edge of the circle, hoping one of the cyclists will see me and slow down to create a gap big enough for me to slide in between. But they're oblivious to me. I shrug at Simon but he doesn't respond. Maybe he doesn't recognise me. Finally, I take my chances, narrowly missing one of the cyclists, not that he notices. Hi, Simon. I'm Ali Diamond, the CSI. We met earlier today. Oh, yes, of course. What is it? The softness of his voice throws me. I noticed it this morning only because it was so at odds with his tight, chiselled jaw and impassive expression, which give him a macho air. I'm sorry to interrupt your cycle ride, but I'm looking for my daughter, Megan. She's 15, but much taller than me, about 5'7", with long auburn hair, pale complexion, quite distinctive looking. You haven't seen her, have you? 
I flick to my most recent photo of Megan on my phone, in which she's grimacing. It was the closest approximation to a smile she was prepared to muster, but it does the job of conveying the pallor of her skin and the unusual shade of her red-gold hair. The two things people notice most about her. I see what you mean, says Simon. Sorry? She is quite distinctive looking, as you say. He slips his hand around mine to draw my phone towards him for closer inspection. Its damp clamminess feels oddly intimate, but it's worth it if he recognises her. His intense blue eyes stare down at Megan and for a moment I take this as a sign that there is something familiar about her. But it comes to nothing. I'm sorry. No, I don't think I've seen her. I think I'd have remembered. Oh, okay, thank you anyway. I put my phone away. I hope you find her. He glances up at the sky. It'll be dark in an hour. Simon unclips a container from his handlebars and holding it above his head, he squirts water into his mouth, swills and swallows. She won't have gone far. Yes, I'm sure you're right. He tugs his gloves back over his hands and replaces his helmet, adjusting his strap. Well, I better be going, otherwise they'll get fidgety, he says, glancing over at a man in a red anorak whose front wheel is lodged in the base of a dune on the far side of the car park. His name is Peter Benson. We were at school together. He has been warned for harassing women, which is unacceptable. But he also has learning needs, the phrase they use now, which classes him as a vulnerable adult, and to some a legitimate target. He's lucky to have someone like Simon Pascoe to look out for him. He turns his back to me. Why don't you give me your number and then if I see her I can call you straight away? Thank you. That's really kind of you. He takes a phone out of a breast pocket and I tap my number into it. It's the least I can do. Replacing his phone into the top pocket of his cycling suit, he swings his bike around, points it towards the path taking him back to Biddicombe and rides off. I wonder if he's forgotten about the others, but they notice immediately and fall in behind him, like the lost boys in Peter Pan. Only not a word is said. If only I had that control over Megan. Liam appears by my side. Any joy? I shake my head, still watching Simon lead his silent troop back down the trail. You are right? His question gets my attention. I think so. I look up at the sky. Simon is right. The light is fading fast. What if something has happened to Megan? He looks at me like I'm mad. Why would you think that? Nothing's happened to her, Ali, other than she's bunked off with her mates. Once again, I'm grateful for his unshakable belief that Megan is fine. You're right. This is Devon, after all. Where do you want to try first? The Tarka estate. I've already called Megan's friends. They said they hadn't seen her, but I'm not sure they're telling the truth. And they might not be so keen to lie to me face to face. I'm about to get in my car when my phone rings, and my day gets a whole lot worse. It's Bernadette. Haughty with a hint of Irish is the best way to describe my adoptive mother's tone. In case you're interested, I thought you might like to know Megan is currently at my house. Maybe you'd like to drive over. When you have the time, that is. I'm on my way. I ring off. Liam looks hopefully at me. Well? Well, the good news is I found Megan. The bad news is she's at my mother's. Chapter 8 Bernadette Miller Diamond's house is also in Biddicombe, but on the opposite side to Seven Hills Lodges where I live. Set high up on a wooded hillside, the building is very much like its owner. Tall, thin, 
and looks down on the rest of the town. It's also the last place I want to find my daughter. Bernadette opens the front door, her face already dialed to disapproval. You took your time, Aloysia. She's the only person who uses my full name, which I loathe. What woman goes through the hassle of adopting a baby only to christen them Aloysia? I was working, Bernadette. I couldn't just drop everything. She lost the right to call herself my mother the day she chucked me out of the house, seconds after hearing I was six months pregnant and had dropped out of Oxford. That and other things. Clearly. Her overt dislike for my job is never far away. Bernadette had a number of career options lined up for me. CSI wasn't one of them. In the living room I find Patrick, Bernadette's current companion. Fifty years a fisherman, but now deep into retirement, forced on him by crippling arthritis, he still can't bear to relinquish his navy sailor's hat and ribbed sweaters. From the look on his face, I'm guessing he'd rather be tackling thirty-foot waves in a force-nine gale off Lundy Island than be in a room with three generations of the Diamond family. Talking of which, the third generation, Megan, is sitting on the edge of the sofa, curled into herself, the half of her face that isn't obscured by a curtain of pale red hair is channeling hurt and self-pity for all it's worth. I stand over her. Right. What's going on, Megan? She doesn't look up, but her lower lip quivers impressively. I felt sick. I didn't want to phone you again because you told me you couldn't take time off work. Her Oscar-worthy performance doesn't work on me. But then it isn't meant for me and her words elicit a despairing sigh and shake of the head from Bernadette. She wallows in her concern for a moment before switching her attention to me, folding her arms in a way that suggests she's found herself in a terrible situation that only she is able to sort. I can't help but feel she's enjoying this. Well, it comes to something when you put your job before your sick child. I draw my breath in to stop myself saying something I doubt I'll ever regret, but except will not help the current situation. Instead, I focus on Megan. Why didn't you tell your teachers you were ill? They'd have kept you until I got there. Megan hugs herself closer. I just wanted to go home. But you can't just walk out of school. No one knew where you were. She gives me her best like-I-give-a-shit shrug, and I could slap her. But Bernadette has enough ammunition already. I think the real issue here is that Megan needed her mum, and you weren't there for her. Irony clearly hasn't reached this part of Biddicombe. I could say, do you mean in the same way you weren't there for me when I was nineteen and six months gone? But I don't. I'm meant to be an adult here. I am there for her. Really? So what about six months ago when she hurt herself at school? Where were you then? Well, I walked straight into that one. Six months ago, Megan fell off the beam in gym class and hit her head. The school couldn't get hold of me because I was at a training day 80-odd miles away, so they called the next person on my emergency contact list. Bernadette. It is the one and only time Bernadette has stepped in to help and by all accounts she took some persuading, but boy has she milked it for all it's worth. Still, she did it. That point goes to her. I turn to Megan. So what time did you get here? About four. So where were you in between times? Megan shifts in her seat. Around. For Christ's sake, Megan, around where? There's no need to blaspheme, Aloysia. She's right, there isn't. I started when I was Megan's age, a petulant teenager railing against Bernadette's irrational attachment to religion and her insistence that I also adopt it unquestioningly. I did it to piss off the Irish Catholic in her. And it kind of stuck. I refocus on Megan. 
You were hanging around the wreck, weren't you? Was Jay Cox there? No, she says, with the emphasis of a liar. Jay Cox is a low-level drug dealer. He's 16, but he has the gangliness of a 12-year-old who's had a sudden growth spurt. I caught Megan talking to him outside the kebab shop on Biddicombe High Street a few weeks back, when I was on lates, and my heart folded in half. Jay Cox is the kind of boy mothers have nightmares their daughters will hook up with. He's a weaselly individual who doles out pills like M&M's, drawing youngsters in before hitting them with his bill for his services. Mousy hair and malnourishment must be in, because the girls flock to him, including, it seems, Megan. Obviously, I challenged her about it, but she swore he was just asking to borrow money for his bus fare home, and besides, he's not as bad as people make out. Jesus wept. Jay is scum. He's mixed up in all sorts. I've told you before to stay away from him. You're hardly perfect yourself. In her apparent despair, Megan suddenly finds some fire. Bernadette nods in agreement. That's enough. I snap. We're not talking about me. I think we all need to calm down, says Patrick, dividing a worried look between all three of us. Well, maybe we should talk about you. A sly smile creeps across Megan's face. Helena saw you in the pub two nights ago, snogging the face of some guy. Oh, God. I knew it was a mistake to meet someone in Biddicombe, the town that doesn't know the meaning of discretion, especially when it was just another one of my nightmares on Tinder Street. As per usual, nerves and alcohol masked the awkwardness of our incompatibility, to the point where it took physical contact to realise we really were wasting each other's time. The kiss wasn't me. It was a bottle and a half of Sauvignon Blanc. Predictably, Bernadette throws her hands into the air. I might have known she'd make a big deal out of this, which is, of course, why Megan has brought it up. For goodness sake, Aloysia, what on earth's the matter with you? Frustration brings out her Irish accent, reminding me with a shudder of the nuns at school. Have you no shame? You're a mother. Here we go. Megan, get your things. We're going home. Megan picks up her school bag and traipses into the hallway. Bye, Nana. She throws Bernadette her sweetest smile. Thanks for this afternoon. Anytime, my darling. You know I'm here for you. I'm biting the inside of my lower lip so hard it hurts. Go and wait in the car. Unbelievably, Megan does as she is told. Even she can sense this is about to escalate. I wait until the front door closes behind her before rounding on Bernadette. But she gets there first. What's wrong with you? Bernadette hisses at me. Do you really think it's appropriate to be kissing men in public? Okay, one, this is the 21st century, not the Dark Ages, and two, I am allowed a social life, you know. Is that what you call it? I'm amazed Bernadette can unpurse those thin lips of hers long enough to get the words out. Now, Bernadette, this isn't helping. Patrick's right, but I'm not going to back down. I'm sick of her lording it over me. I don't have a go at you about Patrick. That's different. We're just friends, and I'm not gallivanting across the countryside, dropping my knickers for all and sundry. It's no wonder Megan is going off the rails. You're just the same as you always were. Only thinking of yourself. No care for anyone else. You do what you want, when you want. Well, you've got a daughter now, and it's time you learned to take care of her properly. Ah, yes. Here it is. Bernadette's tried and tested, you've made your bed, and now you've got to lie in it approach to parenting. It never ceases to derail me. I know she had great ambitions for me. I had them for myself. Getting pregnant at 19 wasn't part of my life plan either, but it happened. Bernadette was furious with me for, as she put it, 
throwing my life away. And for a time she refused to have anything to do with us. Maybe if she had, I wouldn't have ended up with Sean. But you can't avoid anyone in Biddicombe. And besides, little kids have a way of winning you over. And she couldn't resist Megan. She dotes on her now. But she's never forgiven me. Before I can muster a response, Bernadette disappears into the kitchen, slamming the door behind her. I sigh at Patrick. I'm never going to please her, am I? Patrick shrugs, and I feel guilty for pulling him into this family feud not of his making. Believe it or not, she loves you, and she's worried about you and Megan. Really? Well, she's got a funny way of showing it. I slam the front door hard behind me. Two can play that game. I get back into the car. Ramming the seatbelt into its catch, I switch on the engine before turning it off again. This can't wait. Jesus, Megan, what the hell are you playing at? But she just folds her arms and shrugs, her auburn hair draped forward, hiding her face. Don't have a go at me just because you don't get on with Nana. This has nothing to do with me and Bernadette. This is about you skipping school. Do you have any idea how serious that is? What got into you? Nothing, right. Nothing got into me. I'm sick of school. It's a waste of time and I'm sick of you going on at me all the time. Fine. You're grounded for a week and if you bunk off again, it'll be a month. Whatever. I turn on the car engine and pull away from the curb, sure of one thing. Megan isn't just having a Pink Floyd moment over education. She's keeping something from me. Chapter 9 Where would I be without Penny? Dead, probably. Boxing Day 2012. This time it was a broken oven. A raw turkey crown and six cans of Stella. Sean landed a few punches before the alcohol sloshing around inside him toppled him. And that's when Megan and I made a run for it. We found a bench in a corner of Biddicombe Wreck, hidden from the main road, and sheltered from the vicious wind blasting off the black wintry seas. Me with a busted lip. Megan still in her My Little Pony PJs. I tried Bernadette first, but she had friends round for Canasta and told me to make it up with Sean. Anyway, Aloysia, I'm sure it's not as bad as you say. Aren't you being a little dramatic about it all? Years of bruised kidneys and expertly applied makeup said she didn't know what she was talking about. But there was no one else. Sean had made sure of that. Next I tried the women's refuges, but Christmas is their peak time and they were already full. The last refuge rang off and I knew we'd have to go back to Sean. But I couldn't move. Frozen with fear as much as the cold, one arm wrapped around Megan. I've no idea how much time passed. But a red woolen mitten closed over my hand and gently lowered my phone. I'd been holding to my head like a loaded gun. You're coming home with me, said a Scouse accent. It belonged to a woman in a purple and white tie-dyed skirt and long grey hair punctuated with coloured beads. Home was the Seven Hills Lodges, just outside Biddicombe. I knew little about the place because, like so many places in Biddicombe, it was for the tourists, not the locals. Nestled below the brow of a grassy hill that afforded the best views of Mort Sands, the Bristol Channel and beyond. It was home to thirty cabins sprinkled in among the pine trees that managed to survive the salty winds gusting off the sea. We were only meant to stay there a few days. Seven years later, we're still in cabin 27. But I've never forgotten that first Christmas. Penny took a photo of me and Megan clinking our glasses, filled with orange juice, over a huge turkey. Megan's smile is real. Children have a way of living in the moment. But mine was purely for her and for the camera. You can still see the swelling around my left eye from one of Sean's more accurate punches. Penny slides a cold bottle of locally made cider across the kitchen table, 
and I take a grateful slug of the honey-coloured liquid. It's called Sam Cider. I don't know Sam, but I do know that he knows how to make a good cider. Megan bunked off school again. I got a text from the school in the middle of a post-mortem. Penny frowns. Why? I don't know. She won't tell me, but I know it's got something to do with that piece of shit Jay Cox. I saw the two of them outside kebabs by the coast on the high street a few weeks back. Sharon Cox's son? Penny knows everyone, although only I know her real name, which is Sadie MacDonald. She hasn't used it in twenty years, not since she left Liverpool and her stalker ex. She shakes her head sadly. He's a soft lad, that one. Involved in all sorts. If Sharon was still alive, she'd be so sad to see what he's become. Well, I've banned Megan from having anything to do with him, but she doesn't listen to me. Megan's got too much sense to get mixed up with the Coxes. I hope so, because I'm not sure how I can stop her. I've grounded her for a week, but I can't lock her up when I'm on nights and weekends. I can keep an eye on her for you. Thanks, Pen. But you already do so much. I mean, who else could have taught my daughter the Beatles' entire back catalogue? Pen is a huge fan. Her name, the first that came to mind when the previous lodge's owner offered her a cleaning job, is a blend of Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. She laughs. Don't knock it. There's a lot of wisdom in those words. Twenty years in North Devon hasn't dulled her accent. Uh, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She grins at me. Okay, maybe not the early stuff. Seriously, this isn't about someone else looking after Megan. This is about me being around more for her. You know, when she got fed up doing whatever she was doing this afternoon with Jay, she didn't come home. She went to Bernadette's. Penny's raised eyebrows signal her confusion, and not a little hurt. Why? She knows I'm here for her. And you, for that matter. I smile gratefully. At times, Penny has been more of a mum to me than Bernadette ever was, although Bernadette would rather be horsewhipped naked down the high street by the Pope than wear a knitted rainbow poncho and neon feathers in her hair. It occurs to me that Penny's stalker ex, Ian, probably wouldn't recognise her now in all her bright finery but she still moors an escape boat in the harbour, just in case. Because she knew how much it would piss me off. She phoned to tell me she had Megan. I could hear the gloating in her voice. Then Megan pipes up that a friend of hers saw me kissing this guy in the pub the other night. Bernadette loved that, of course. More proof that I'm a fallen woman. Penny takes the top off another bottle of cider for herself. So you're not allowed boyfriends now? I'd hardly call him a boyfriend. More an internet user error. I don't know why you don't give that beach barista guy a go. So obvious he fancies you. He's always asking about you. What, Liam? He's just being friendly. He's like that with everyone. Penny rolls her eyes in mock despair. No, he isn't. And just because you've had a rough time in the past, it doesn't mean the future will be the same. Save me the psycho babble, Pen. Adopted by an emotionally distant woman, impregnated by a man who scarpered five minutes after the first scan, and beaten by my alcoholic husband, I think I'm entitled to have the commitment level of a rabbit in springtime. Anyway, you can't talk. When are you and Ringo ever going to meet? Ringo isn't his real name either. He's a guy Penny met in a Beatles forum a few months back. They've been exchanging messages ever since mostly about their mutual love of the Fab Four. Recently she found out he lives in South Devon. News of his close proximity unsettled her, and she's ignored him for a while. They're talking again, but so far she's knocked back his invitations to meet. Penny shrugs. I don't know. Perhaps it's better we don't. I place my hand on hers. I know what's on her mind because it's always there. It's been twenty years, Pen. 
You've changed your name. You're not on social media. Ian couldn't find you, even if he wanted to. Ringo isn't Ian. You should give him a chance. She says nothing. I've already strayed too deep into her past, and when she speaks it's to steer me away with a joke. Look at us, what a right pair of commitment phobes, aren't we? She gets up and drops the empty cider bottles into the recycling bin by the back door. They smash against the others. Maybe there are some things we can't escape. Chapter 10 When he walks into the house, Jackie's voice reaches him immediately. But her words are not for him. She's talking to one of her bears. Probably Darcy. Telling him what a pretty dress a little girl on the beach is wearing. After two hours in the company of the imbeciles in the cycling club, he's in no mood to listen to Jackie drone on about the bloated, lobster-skinned tourists she's watched on the live cams. So he slips past the living room door and heads upstairs. Jackie doesn't come upstairs, even to sleep. What would be the point? Upstairs is where the bedrooms are that contain beds where people have sex. So she stays downstairs, which suits them both. It means he has the place to himself. Exchanging the stifling atmosphere of Jackie's world of swirly carpets and a hundred hard stairs for parquet flooring, white linen sheets and Venetian blinds, feels like someone has slipped a mask over his mouth and blasted him with oxygen. He lies down on his bed, hands behind his head, and takes a deep breath. Now he's alone, he can think about more important things. Like last night. It was touch and go for a while. He had waited hours, wedged under the V of the wooden struts, holding the key up, gagging on the stench of algae and dead fish. There, he listened to her and the thug having sex, him grunting like a pig at mealtime, her in total silence. When it was over, the thug took her lack of enthusiasm as a sign she must be getting it somewhere else. She denied it, but he said that if he found out she was seeing someone behind his back, he'd kill her. He stormed off, and Simon seized his chance. She was pleased to see him, and knew who he was immediately. She practically fell into his arms. She thought he'd come to help her. Even as his hands curled around her neck and squeezed, he could tell she thought it was all part of some master plan. Stupid girl. She didn't even struggle. They don't, always. It's the shock. It was over in seconds although the best was yet to come. He settles into the memory like a warm blanket. His muscles relax and he drifts into a well-earned sleep, letting go of his mind, his thoughts taking on a life of their own. He's back on the quay, sitting on the low wall, the white CSI van pulls up in front of him, and the CSI gets out, already wearing a forensic suit. She scoops up her frizzy dark hair and pins it to the back of her head. He's staring at her, but she doesn't notice him as she walks to the back of the van and opens the door. She disappears inside to retrieve her case, but she's taking so long he gets up to see what's happening. He leans on the door just as she reappears. 
she looks straight at him and throws her head back in laughter. Shock rips through him, and his eyes spring apart and fix on the bedroom ceiling to force the image from his mind. It isn't the CSI. It's Danielle. Chapter 11 I'm curb-crawling Megan as she walks to school. It's not exactly the start to my day I'd planned. When I told my daughter over her Weetabix that I'd be escorting her to the school gates to make sure she didn't truant again, she either thought I was bluffing or was hoping to catch me unprepared as she threw her spoon down, grabbed her school bag and stormed out of the cabin. She was wrong on both counts. Keys in hand, I followed her, jumping into my battered old red Volvo, and I'm now crawling behind her at approximately three miles per hour. As we reach the park exit, I draw alongside her and wind the window down. The weather has finally broken, and rain specks my hands and face. I'm going to follow you all the way to school, so I suggest you get in before one of your friends sees you. The public humiliation of your mother driving a metre behind you swings it, and she gets into the car. Arms crossed and body twisted, she's practically facing the passenger door, reminding me I'm still public enemy number one, two and three, after last night's clumsy attempts to understand why she skipped school. I returned from Penny's to find Megan where I'd left her, sulking in her room. After a gentle interrogation along the lines of, I won't be angry if you tell me the truth, she finally admitted she was with Jay Cox because he's going through a tough time and just likes to talk to me. It took considerable effort not to roll my eyes. Can't he do that outside of school hours? This was a genuine attempt on my part to be reasonable, but I get that it sounded like a cheap shot earning me Megan's special you-understand-nothing look. He's feeling really low at the moment. It would help if he laid off the drugs. Speaking of which, if he's offered you any, I'll kill him. I knew I shouldn't have told you. Look, I'm sorry for Jay. I know he's had it hard, but you're my concern, not him, and he's dangerous, Megan. He gets other kids hooked on drugs. He wouldn't do that to me. He's not like that. It's at times like these that she reminds me of her dad, Julian. What I can remember of him. It's more than the auburn hair and freckles. It's the way she holds back on me. A sense of saying one thing but meaning another. Often the complete opposite. In Julian's case, he told me he loved me and would stand by me. Both of which were total bollocks. Oh, Maggie, don't be so naive. He's a smackhead. That's what smackheads do. No, he isn't. God, you moan about Nana being judgmental, but you're just as bad. No, I'm not, and in Jay's case, I'm right. I hate you. Well done, Ali. How to lose daughters and isolate them. So this morning, when I woke up, I decided it was out with bad cop and in with conciliatory cop. Look, I don't want to give you a hard time about Jay. Megan stares out the passenger window. Then trust me. Jay and I just talk, that's all. He's a friend and he's never offered me anything, not even a can of cider. He wouldn't. She throws me a side glance. I told him about Sean. Sean? Where did he come from? He's not been in our lives for years. What's Sean got to do with anything? My question is met with silence. But it doesn't matter because I've worked it out for myself. There's only one reason why Megan would speak his name now. You've seen him, haven't you? She looks straight ahead and nods, which both horrifies and confuses me, as I'd heard he'd moved away. Where? She's fighting herself about what to say, what to censor. Just tell me, Megan. He's working on the roof at school. Why didn't you tell me? 
I didn't want to upset you. I saw him a couple of days ago, but yesterday he said hello and I freaked out. I knew Jay would be around, so I called him and met him at the wreck. She expels this like a breath she's held on to for too long. What else is she holding on to? Did... did Sean scare you? She nods, and it crushes me, triggering a well-worn, self-imposed trial by questions. How could I have ever let him into our lives? That's an easy one. Maggie and I were living in a shithole of a council flat on the Tarka estate, and Sean, a handsome roofer, built like a prop forward, offered us a way out. We were married six months later. How could I have let him hit? I don't know. It wasn't a naught to sixty thing, but small, barely noticeable steps, until finally I accepted everything was my fault including his violence. The irony is he divorced me on the grounds of my unreasonable behaviour. Penny told me it was the quickest way to get him out of our lives. It felt like he'd beaten me up all over again. But that was then, and this is now. This time, I'm not going to stand by and do nothing. I'll speak to the school, get him removed, Meg. I'm sorry. My apology joins a thousand others. But all the sorries in the world can't erase the memory of her mum being pinned against a wall by her throat. Thank you. Sorry I bunked off. Seeing Sean freaked me out. I didn't know what else to do. That's okay. It doesn't matter now. We've nearly reached the school gates, but there's something else bothering me. I understand you were upset about Sean, but why did you go to Bernadette's after you met Jay? She doesn't miss a beat. Nana understands me. She knows how hard it is for me. She's got time for me. Well, there's a first time for everything. I can't help myself. A quip for every occasion. It's my public defence system, cauterising any conversation that threatens emotional discomfort. But the message comes over loud and clear from Megan. Bernadette's there for me. You're not. I pull up near the school gates. She opens the car door, but I grab her arm. Promise me you won't bunk off again. But she just shrugs. I love you, you know. She stares at me, and I brace myself for the usual whatever. Then something seems to give. Anger and resentment. Her constant companion these days. Look away for a moment. And the corners of her mouth turn upwards. Even if they don't quite make it to a smile. I know. And I promise you I will make this right. She reclaims her arm and slams the car door behind her. But it's enough. For now. Rain streaks on the windscreen, producing a blurred and distorted version of Megan walking away. I flick my wipers on, bringing her back into pin-sharp clarity. She merges with her classmates, and her face bursts into smiles. One of them says something to her, and she throws her head back with laughter. She disappears through the school gates. But I linger scanning the entrance for signs of my ex. My head bobs from side to side, trying to spot him in among the slither of black blazers. I know he must be here somewhere, but I can't see him. I unclip my seatbelt just as my phone rings. It's Jake, asking if I'm nearly at the office in a way that suggests I need to be there now. He's going back to Exeter and there's been some kind of incident at the commissioner's house and they're clamouring for me to attend. I tell him I'm on my way and ring off. I glance back at the school, and then at my phone on the seat beside me. Maybe Sean isn't in today. Maybe Megan will be able to stay out of his way. I fasten my seatbelt and turn on the ignition. I wait for a gap in the traffic, and I'm about to pull into it, when I notice I am gripping the steering wheel so tightly 
the blood has leached from my knuckles. Chapter 12 Jake practically jumps out of his skin when I walk into the office. He's gathering paperwork at a speed that suggests he was hoping to vacate the place before I turned up. I suspect that at some point between yesterday and this morning, someone, probably Holt, filled him in about me, as his demeanour has shifted from wanting to please me to wanting to get the hell out of here. He offers a weak smile as he slides his paperwork into a brown satchel. D.I. Holt has asked if you can send the forensic results to me and I can pass them on to him and the team. His tone has apology all over it, and I'm angry Holt's got him doing his dirty work. He did what? But he can't look me in the eye. Just pass in on the message. He does the clasps up on his bag, hoping the distraction will soothe his burning cheeks. But there's no urgency, obviously. But it's not obvious to me. Most SIOs want everything yesterday. Really? Why's that? Haven't you heard? Clearly not. He seems surprised by my answer. I'm not. I'm on the outside of this investigation. Holt made that very clear. Chris Banstead has been charged with Janie Warren's murder. Janie's boyfriend, are you serious? Jake instantly regrets sharing this news. He wants to leave, but I'm standing between him and the doorway. Maybe I got that wrong. And maybe you didn't. How can they have charged him so quickly? A bit of CCTV isn't enough. Christ, the Mannering case should have taught Holt that much. Has Banstead confessed? If he has, he should sack his brief. And what about the shoe print? I wait for a response but Jake frowns, unsure of which question to answer first. So I make things easy for him. What the hell is going on here? D.I. Holt told me to get rid of the photos. What? This comes out louder than I intended, startling the young man. Why? He said there was no need to make life any easier for the defence team than it already is, so I deleted them. You did what? Jesus! Jake, evidence is evidence. You don't just get rid of it because it doesn't suit the SIO's cosy theory. His colour deepens. I feel sorry for the guy. I know how hard it is to stand up to a detective of Holt's reputation, but that's our job. And Holt should know better. Well, I'm not bloody standing for this. Taking the back stairs two at a time to DCI Lowe's office, I knock and enter without waiting to be asked. Steve, did you know Chris Banstead has been charged with Janie Warren's murder? DCI Stephen Lowe, a small man, unusually lacking in presence and charisma for a senior police officer, stares at me, and then at the person standing to my right. D.I. Holt. His unexpected appearance throws me but only for a second. And what the hell do you think you're doing telling my CSI to delete photos? Ali, calm down, says DCI Lowe, getting to his feet. No, I won't calm down. I've just stood by and watched a shitfest of an investigation because D.I. Holt decided it was a domestic killing before I'd even got there. Holt steps forward. That's because it is a domestic killing. Banstead is as guilty as sin. What about the shoe mark I found on the steps which you told Jake to get rid of? I told you it didn't belong to Banstead or the woman who found Janie and it certainly isn't a copper's boot. It rained until midnight that night so it had to have been made after that time. The time when Janie was killed. Christ, this is basic stuff. Someone else was there on the key, I'm sure of it. I'm not, of course, but I'm exceptionally pissed off that Holt won't even consider the possibility. I told Jake to delete the photos because they're not relevant, and Banstead's defence will use the shoe print against us. Anyway, it could have been made after Banstead killed her. I glare at Holt. What are you talking about? Probably someone else phoned Janie but didn't report it to the police. 
The straws aren't even clutched on this one. They've long been let go. Besides, people don't ignore bodies. Perhaps they didn't want to get involved. It happens, Ali, whether we like it or not. I've had enough. Holt isn't the only one who can rubbish a theory. This is Biddicombe, for Christ's sake, not Soho. People love to be involved. They get off on it. Janie's got more friends now than she ever had when she was alive. Low cuts in. But it is possible. His quiet voice of reason winds me up even more. But I can't ignore his point. Yes, it is possible. But it's not probable. It doesn't matter anyway. Holt's smugness wafts over me. We've got a witness. Someone saw Banstead kill Janie? Not quite, but as good as. A lad living above the pub on the corner of the quay sleeps with his window open. Heard them arguing. Banstead was accusing her of having an affair with someone else, calling her all sorts of names. The witness says he overheard Banstead saying, and I quote, I'm going to kill you, you little bitch. My anger drains away. If Holt had told me this before, I wouldn't have burst into the office like a jealous ex. But he's a cop. He understands the power of information and the power of withholding it. Just like in the court that day when D.I. John Stride and his cronies doctored my notebook and forged my statement. I've been had. Situation diffused, Lowe sits down while I seethe in silence. Ali, are you sure there's not something else going on here? He asks. Oh, sweet Jesus, I know where this is going. Like what? I snap back at him. D.I. Holt says there was an issue yesterday, a bit of an edge between you that your comments weren't helpful and were actually quite obstructive. Holt meets my glare, ready to bat away any counterattack. You don't become a senior investigating officer without your professional investigator practice level three certificate in arse covering. Funny you didn't say anything at the time. If I remember correctly, you told me I was the last person you wanted on the investigation. I'd say that's pretty obstructive, wouldn't you? You kept obsessing about this fucking shoe print. And you kept checking your watch like your parking ticket was about to run out. Low holds a hand up. That's enough. Bob, it's probably best if you leave this to me. The message is clear. Low believes Holt over me. As Detective Chief Inspector, Low outranks Holt and is his immediate superior. But, for all I know, they're training school buddies and I never stood a chance. Low waits until Holt closes the door behind him. He sits down and invites me to do the same. I stay standing. Look, Ali, believe it or not, I'm on your side. I was never a member of the D.I. John Stride fan club, as it happens, and you did the right thing in court. The guy was a bad apple. But? But you're not on major investigations anymore and you have to put it all behind you. Meaning? Meaning leaving shitty voicemails after every job you're sent to just because it's not the crime of the century has to stop. That's got nothing to do with it. I keep being sent to crappy scenes where there's no chance of any forensics. It's a waste of my time and police resources. Still, it's pissing people off, and at the end of the day, I want the same result as you do. And what about Holt? He made it very clear we weren't on the same side. You're reading too much into this, Ali. He's ignoring something that could be highly significant to the investigation. He's a very experienced detective. If he says it's a domestic and Banster did it, that's good enough for me. I ponder my options. But it takes less than five seconds to realise I don't have any. Lowe isn't going to take any notice of me. Is that it? Yes, that's it. I turn to leave, but he's not done. And I've had a call from the commissioner. Someone's trashed his car again. You need to get over there right away and sort it out. He's got a meeting at ten. But... 
he raises his hand to head off my protests. Ali, get over it or get out. The choice is yours. I close Lowe's office door behind me, wanting to scream. Fuck him. And fuck those that moan about me rather than admit they can't tell one end of a crime scene from another. And as for Holt, he only complained about my attitude to deflect attention from his half arsed investigation. I'm glad he made Jake put his name on all the exhibits we took from the scene. I don't want to be anywhere near this mess when it gets ripped to shreds in court. Chapter 13 You'll live, announces Tricia, as she unplugs the stethoscope from her ears and peels the Velcro band from Cheryl Black's mottled pink arm. She's wearing... A two sizes too small, dark pink flannel dressing gown, streaked with brown food stains. She couldn't roll her sleeves up to have her blood pressure taken, so she slipped her arm out instead, exposing her right breast, creased and sagging like a punctured party balloon. She's watching him, a sly smile on her face, to see if he's noticed. But he doesn't give her the satisfaction and his eyes stay trained on Tricia. He's a professional, after all. This is the third time they've been called to Cheryl's house on the Tarker estate in Biddicombe. Tricia can't stand the woman. She spent the drive from Barnston to Biddicombe moaning about her. She's a time waster, Sigh. Dispatch said she was having a heart attack. No, she's not. There's nothing wrong with that woman other than she's lonely. No medicine can fix that. That doesn't stop Cheryl from trying. She's taking pills for everything. Her circulation, her anxiety, her depression, her diabetes. Everything. All washed down daily with a litre bottle of vodka. Trisha's announcement disappoints Cheryl. She was hoping for something more serious. She's enjoying the drama of it all. A lot of them do. Sirens, blue lights, paramedics running into her house. It makes her day. So, why did I collapse? You fainted. There's any number of reasons. Dehydration, low blood pressure, too much alcohol, diabetes... You need to make an appointment with the GP and get yourself checked out, says Tricia. I thought I was a goner, she says, pulling her dressing gown together and finally covering up her right breast. You're not going anywhere, but alcohol, pills and fags don't mix, Cheryl. You've got to take better care of yourself. But then no one would take any notice of her, would they? If it weren't for the paramedics, the police and social services, no one would know she existed. In her head, they're her friends and family. Cheryl is getting tired of being lectured by Tricia, and he can't blame her. Tricia is fat and smokes twenty a day. Hardly a role model. Actually, I've given up the fags. I use them things now. She nods at a vape on the mantelpiece. And I have to take pills for my nerves. Those little bastards next door make my life a misery. Tricia isn't interested. She's already packing their equipment away. He kneels in front of Cheryl. She parts her knees by just a fraction, but it's enough to tug her dressing gown apart at the waist. She isn't wearing any underwear, but he pretends not to notice. What have they done now, Cheryl? Kicking a ball against my front door, all hours of the day and night. That must be terrible. He tries to sound like he cares. It seems to work. It is, Simon. Does my head in. I swear I've had enough. Tricia tuts and looks at her watch, but he ignores her. Have you rung the police? 
Yeah, but they're not interested. I don't know how much more I can take. You must be very frightened. She nods, her bloodshot eyes glistening with tears. Tricia rolls her eyes and bends down to whisper in his ear. Sigh, come on, we need to get going. Cheryl chokes back a sob. I'm scared witless. Is there somewhere else you can go? Or someone that can come and look after you? No. Me and my sister don't talk anymore. There's no one. Okay, I'll speak to the neighbourhood police officer. Ask him to drop in. Maybe have a word with your neighbours. She takes his hand. It's dry and scaly, and he tries not to flinch. Will you? You're a good man, Mr. Pascoe. If only the world had more people like you. He smiles. All part of the service? Tricia laughs. Believe me, one Simon Pascoe in this world is quite enough. It turns out the commissioner's car hasn't been trashed at all. But someone has scrawled twat in the dust on the bonnet. By the time I finish examining it, I have some sympathy with this observation. The commissioner greets me with a rant about my perceived lateness and how I've compounded his humiliation as his neighbours have now all seen the obscenity writ large on the bonnet of his classic E-type jag. This then tips into apoplexy when I tell him the perp wore gloves and forensically there is nothing I can do. He's still spitting about the breakdown of society and how national service would sort the lot of them out when I drive away. I continue to work through my list for the day, mostly break-ins that have come in overnight, but I'm still seething about my run-in with Holt and Lowe and their decision to charge Chris Banstead with Janie's murder. Maybe they're right. Banstead had form for hitting Janie. Maybe this time he just took it too far. It's the most likely explanation. But the existence of that shoe print bothers me. Someone else was there that night. Maybe they're not involved in Janie's murder. But what if they are? It's irrelevant now, of course, because Holt has got rid of it. And hunches don't cut it in modern policing. The only thing I can do is make sure I'm as far away as possible when the shit hits the fan at warp speed. Besides, I've got my own problem to deal with. Sean. My shift over, I'm parked outside Megan's school. The thought that he is working just metres away from Megan makes me nauseous and nervous. That I could still fear him sickens me. But I can't ignore him hoping he'll just go away. Sean is not the type to just go away. It's late afternoon, and most of the children have left apart from a few stragglers. I quickly find Sean standing by some scaffolding clinging to the side of the gym hall. It's hard to miss him. He's built like the proverbial shithouse. But it's more than that. He always had the power to demand my full attention throwing backgrounds into a blur, reducing sounds to low murmurs, like I couldn't allow myself to be distracted, not for a second, from the main event. Him. I know now that this is what fear looks like. He's shorter than I remember, and older, of course, but the years of working outdoors haven't been kind to him, introducing deep, leathery lines to his once smooth, Laddish looks. I imagine that niggles. Looks were always important to Sean, who topped up muscles cultivated on a building site with long hours in the gym. He sees me and speaks first, which annoys me. Already he's vying for the upper hand. Oi, Ali. Good to see you. What's it been, eight years? You haven't changed a bit. Charm oozes from every pore. He's a million miles away from the man who grabbed my throat because I hadn't made him a packed lunch and squeezed it so hard that I passed out. 
so much that I could almost be persuaded it never happened. Almost. You can't be here. This is Megan's school. His wistful smile turns my stomach. I know. I saw her yesterday. Gosh, she's grown, a proper young lady now. But it was really good to see her. I said hello, but she blanked me. He laughs and raises his eyebrows. Typical teenager, eh? She blanked you because she's terrified of you. His frown is genuine. Jesus, he doesn't think he's done anything wrong. That's crap. I loved her as my own. If she's got a problem with me, it's down to you and all the lies you've told her. Or maybe, just maybe, it's because she watched you smash her mother's head against the kitchen table. Sean rolls his eyes like it's a trivial detail. Christ, Ali, have you come all this way just to rake over stuff that happened between us years ago? I'm a different bloke now. I've married again, got three kids of my own. I've moved on, maybe you should too. He's twisting my words like he always did, but he's right about one thing. I'm not here to talk about the past. Megan doesn't want you here. I'm asking you to leave for her sake, not mine. He looks me up and down. I shrink under his gaze, suddenly exposed and self-conscious. The smile returns, but this time it's different. It's mocking, designed to undermine me. You always were at your sexiest when you were serious. Maybe we could discuss this over a drink. I'm about to knock off. Christ. Please, Sean, leave us in peace. I pause because I don't want to say what I'm about to say, but I have to. Please. I'm begging you. He folds his thick arms and casts an eye around as if he's seriously thinking about it. But he isn't because I've been here before pleading with him not to shout at me, not to shove me, and not to hit me. No, I'm not going anywhere. In that case, I'm going to see the head teacher right now and get you removed from the school. He laughs. And tell them what? That you're my abusive ex-husband, and that Megan witnessed you assaulting me, and that your presence here is upsetting her. And what proof do you have? of all this. What do you mean? Well, for a start, there's no police report. Nothing to say I ever hit you. He mockingly places his forefinger to the corner of his mouth and looks upwards as if he's trying to recall some fact. His face lights up. Oh, yes, I remember now. I divorced you on the grounds of your unreasonable behaviour. From where I'm standing, this looks like a bitter ex-wife trying to cause trouble. So I'm staying until the job is finished. And there's not a thing you can do about it. He's won. And he knows it. Fuck you, Sean. It's pathetic, but it's all I have left. He steps towards me, but I don't flinch. Is he going to hit me? Public scenes were never his shtick. Maybe he's changed, but so have I. And I'm not moving. The amusement in his eyes hardens into hatred. No, Ali. Fuck you. A glob of warm spit lands on my cheek and slides down towards my chin. Still, I stand my ground, sealing my revulsion behind a defiant stare but it's a pointless victory because I've lost the war. He turns away. The only thing left in my arsenal is to close my eyes and not give him the satisfaction of me watching him swagger back into the school hall. Opening my eyes, Sean has gone, allowing my surroundings to come back into focus. Someone is watching me. I turn round and Megan is standing a few metres away. She's seen the whole thing. 
just like she did all those years ago. But it's not fear in her eyes. It's disappointment and anger. I tried. A meaningless phrase that's more a gasp than anything. You promised. You always let me down. Chapter 14 It's early evening, and the sun has set low enough at Seven Hills Lodges for the midges to meet and merge in a frenzy of dull brown clouds in the shade of the pine trees. It's a short stroll down the tarmac path from Cavin 27 to Penny's White Bungalow, situated at the entrance to the site. A few of the lodges are occupied, and in among the pine trees I glimpse the odd checked shirt or white floppy hat. Mostly retired couples making the most of the out-of-season deals. It's still early July. High season doesn't kick in until the schoolchildren break for summer at the end of the month. I've given up trying to talk to Megan. She refused a lift home from school, and when she walked in, she went straight to her room. After a couple of one-sided conversations with her locked bedroom door, I conceded defeat and decided to decamp to Penny's. Through the kitchen window, I can see Penny sitting at her kitchen table, already chugging her way through a bottle of cider. Smiling, she beckons me in. But on catching my expression, her own switches to concern. You look like you could do with a drink. I'm okay, thanks. There's no point holding back. I couldn't if I tried, so I just blurt it out. Sean's working at Megan's school. Her bottle bangs the tabletop. She knows all about Sean, but he's not the only one on her mind. If Sean, my ex from years ago, can come back into my life after all this time, maybe Ian could come back into hers. Monsters from our past. Oh, shit. No. Actually, I will have that drink. Penny grabs me a bottle from the fridge, takes the top off with the bottle opener, and hands it to me. I take a quick swig. That's why she bunked off school. She's terrified of him. Oh my God, what are you going to do? I already did it. I went to see him. Told him to leave. Begged him, in fact. But he refused. He's still the same manipulative bully he always was. Can't you speak to someone at work? Get him arrested for harassment? Or get a restraining order on him? They're just words chucked out at random to try to make things right. But they don't mean anything because we both know the truth. There's nothing I can do. He's not been convicted of anything. I never went to the police, remember? I wasn't a CSI then. After I left Sean, I got a cleaning job at the local police station. It was Arthur, the station sergeant, who suggested I go for a job on the front desk. He urged me to put in an application to become a CSI too. If you examine scenes as thoroughly as you cleaned this place, no criminal will be safe, he once told me. Is there blame in my voice? Penny looks at me as if there is. Part of me hopes there is. If I'd reported Sean, none of this would be happening. It was Penny who stopped me. She knocks back the last of her cider. So what are you going to do now? Nothing. Just like I did all those years ago. What about Megan? She won't talk to me. Says I've let her down. And she's right. I couldn't protect her then and I can't protect her now. What kind of parent does that make me? Silence fills the kitchen. Penny, lost in her own nightmare scenario involving Ian. Me, searching for a solution. There's only one thing I can do. What's that? I'll keep her off school. Are you sure? None of this is Megan's fault. Why should she suffer? I'll call the school and tell them she's gone into hospital for a minor op and needs to convalesce. It's only three weeks to the summer break. 
By the time she goes back to school in September, Sean will have gone. Penny nods. I can keep an eye on her while you're at work. There's plenty of little jobs she can do around the site to keep her busy. Thanks, Penny. It's not ideal, but at least it's a solution, and I feel a lot better at the thought Megan will be nowhere near Sean. My mood lifts. So? Any news from Ringo? Penny twists a row of coloured beads threaded through her long grey hair around her finger. A nervous habit of hers, especially when talking about men. Oh, I don't know. He's asked again if we can go on a date. And what did you say? I said I'd think about it. If you keep him hanging on, he's going to get fed up sooner or later. She throws her hair over her shoulder. I don't know if I'm ready for all that. It's a date, not marriage. I'm still not sure. He could be anyone. He could be a mad axeman. And he could be the man of your dreams. Or nightmares. All I'm saying is you've got nothing to lose and plenty to gain. Message him. Tell him you'll meet him. I'll think about it. Promise? Promise. But I know she won't. I finish my drink and get up to leave. I'd better get back. Ali. Yes? I'm sorry. Megan is in the kitchen. That's more of a kitchenette as it's tiny and separated from the living room by a narrow breakfast bar. She's making her favourite meal. Baked beans on toast covered with melted cheese. It's what she makes herself when I'm not around. It smells good and I realise I haven't eaten since breakfast. Any leftovers for me? Megan glances at me. Maybe. This is teen language for I haven't completely forgiven you, but I'm not as mad as I was. It's a start. Thanks. There's not enough room in the cabin for a dining table, so we sit on the sofa in the living room, balancing our plates on our knees. I don't want to say anything for fear of saying the wrong thing. Just having Megan in the same room as me is progress. So we eat in silence, scraping our plates clean. I'm beginning to wonder if this is the best I can hope for when Megan speaks. Why didn't you go to the police and tell them Sean was hitting you? This is the last conversation I want to have, mainly because of the utter shame that fills me every time I try to answer that question myself. But I owe it to Megan. After we left, I wanted him out of our lives. If I'd gone to the police, it would have meant court. They probably would have interviewed you, too. I couldn't face it, and I couldn't put you through that. It's as rehearsed as it sounds, and Megan knows it. Which is why when I stop talking, she says nothing. She's waiting for the truth. And I wasn't brave enough. There. I said it. That's what it comes down to. I didn't have the guts. I ran away. Your mother is a coward. Penny isn't to blame for my inaction. I am. Megan nods. That's okay. Seeing him again brought everything back. I know. And if I could go back in time and change things, I would. I'd give anything not to have met Sean Parker. He's not a nice man, is he? No, and I made a terrible mistake. But that doesn't mean I have to keep on making them. What do you mean? I'm taking you out of school until the end of term. By the time you go back in September, Sean will have gone, and our lives can go back to normal. Megan tears up and throws her arms around me, sending her plate tumbling to the floor. The circumstances are terrible. 
but the feeling of her hugging me is glorious. Thank you, Mum. I've been so scared. I'll call the school first thing Monday morning. Now, I've got two days off, so how about you and I grab our bodyboards and hit Mort Sands in the morning? The surf's fantastic at the moment. She considers my proposition, and I wonder if I've overstepped the mark. But she smiles a smile that lifts me above Sean, above my job, and all the crap that comes with it. Yeah. Okay. Megan clears the plates away, declares she's exhausted in typically dramatic teenage fashion, and turns in for the night, leaving me sitting alone in the front room. I rest my feet on the glass coffee table and lean back. I can't remember the last time I felt this relaxed. Bernadette hates the cabin, which she says is only fit for hillbillies, but it's been our home for eight years, and we're happy here. The living room wall is papered floor to ceiling in a mural of a beach somewhere in the Bahamas because we don't do white sand and palm trees in North Devon. I came in from work one day, about six years ago, to find Megan had taken her new sharpies to it and added two people, playing in the surf. One with long straight hair, the other sporting a dark frizz both with the biggest grins across their faces. That's you and me, mummy. I couldn't be mad at her. In fact, I loved it. Just Megan and me. Having fun. And we did have fun. It's just that I'd forgotten, in among the demands of the job which I could have done something about and her hormones which she couldn't. Over the years, other images were added. Sailing boats, sharks, dolphins, submarines. But Megan's drawing of us is still there. A little faded with time. But it's still there. Chapter 15 The call comes in at 5.45am, Monday morning. I'm not due on shift until 2pm and my body responds accordingly by ensuring I'm in the deepest of sleeps when my phone starts buzzing. Stumbling into my jeans and a sweatshirt, I scribble a note to Megan, thanking her for the best weekend ever, adding I don't know when I'll be back, but there's plenty of baked beans in the cupboard and cheddar cheese in the fridge. Minutes later, I'm heading out of the site onto the road towards Biddicombe Town Centre. My destination isn't far. Jake's already texted me to say he's collecting the CSI van and it's stocked for all eventualities. He'll meet me there. I take the road along the seafront and the stretch of gaudy amusement arcades which are brought to a merciful and abrupt end by Steep Hill, a great big implacable wedge of a cliff that defeated Victorian engineers and still juts stubbornly out into the sea. Dad and I used to climb the grassy hill when I was young. From the top, you could see Wales across the Bristol Channel, and behind us the town, its buildings sitting awkwardly in the folds of the hills, trying to shelter from the winter gales, gusting up the channel from the Atlantic. By the time I reached my teens, I'd grown to hate the town, and I couldn't wait to leave. The whole place just seemed an embarrassingly tacky intrusion into nature a lumpy rash slowly spreading inland over fields and woods. But now it's hard not to be impressed by its sheer resilience. Beyond Steep Hill lies Biddicombe Quay, where Janie Warren was murdered. But I take the right fork and the road rises, rejoining the end of the high street where the shops peter out. Straight on, past the wreck on the left, the road dips sharply. In the hollow, a right turn leads to the Tarka estate, a cluster of grey pebble-dashed houses that have all the charm of a public toilet. No thatched cottages or honeysuckle hedges here. This is the Devon the tourists don't see, the Devon where I spend much of my time. It's home to some seasonal workers, 
but mostly generations of families who have never worked, and dealers feeding off their benefits and boredom. It used to be my home, too. The blue lights of the emergency services vehicle guide me in, and I add my car to the huddle. The fire crews are sitting on their rigs, yellow suits peeled back to their waists, helmets off, tucking into bacon sandwiches. God knows where they got those at this time of day. Firefighters have a knack of finding decent food no matter when or wherever they're called. Perhaps it's in their training. But it means the fire is already out. There's no point calling us when it's still raging. Leaning against the CSI van, Jake is knocking back a coffee. I get out of my car, and a woman in a black trouser suit, standard uniform for a female detective, strides towards me, hand outstretched. Hi, Ali, I'm Acting Detective Sergeant Sherwell. She's based at Barnston CID. I've never worked a scene with her, never been to one serious enough to coax a DS from out behind her desk. I'd like to think she knows me because I'm good at what I do, and not because I got the force's favourite DI two years inside. I suspect it's the latter, but she seems pleasant enough. What do we know so far? Jake hands me a forensic suit, mask, and shoe covers, which I put on while Sherwell brings me up to speed. Fire services were called just after 3am. A neighbour, a bouncer, coming back from his shift at Climax Bar, saw the smoke. They put it out quickly, but not enough to save the female occupant, it seems. She's burnt to a crisp. Cheryl Black. Yes, but how? I've been here before. A few times. Cheryl Black is one of those poor souls whom life has it in for. Her solution to her three failed marriages was alcohol and pills. She kept herself to herself until, recently, she made the mistake of complaining to the police about her neighbour's noisy kids. Since then, her life has been hell. Hammering on her door at all hours, throwing bricks through her front window and when I last saw her three weeks ago, posting dog shit through the letterbox. It isn't anything you'd be sent down for, which her tormentors know, of course, but it's enough to tip anyone over the edge. And Cheryl was on the edge. That's how I know her. There was nothing I could do, forensically. But I cleaned it up for her, made her a cup of tea, and left a message with social services saying she needed help urgently but mostly she needed CCTV installed so we could catch the scum destroying her life. No one called back and Cheryl didn't get her CCTV. A tall, grey-haired figure emerges from the house that shows no outward signs there's been a fire. I've known Jeff, the fire investigator, for years. He's the best there is. He shakes my hand. Good to see you, Ali. A car pulls up and out steps Alex Blandford, suited but dishevelled. I haven't seen him since Janie Warren's post-mortem four days ago. He grins at me. Fancy seeing you here. We spend a few minutes getting suited and masked up, and then Alex, Sherwell and myself follow Jeff into Cheryl's house. The dawn light is too watery for us to see properly, so he swings his torch from side to side guiding us from the hallway to the back living room. If you touch the walls, do it with the backs of your hands. We're still trying to make the electric safe. One body is quite enough, thanks. The air in the hall is acrid, permeating my mask, stinging my eyes and the back of my throat. This discomfort intensifies when we enter the living room. The combination of smoke-blackened walls and poor light means we can barely see. Jeff points his torch into the corner. A circle of light picks out a dark brown form. It looks like a piece of macabre modern art someone has welded together. It's not. It's the charred corpse of Cheryl Black, kneeling in front of a mantelpiece. Not that she is recognisable in any way. Her head is scorched of her burgundy bob and her hands have melted to stumps. Sherwell gasps. 
I'm guessing she hasn't seen many burned bodies. Why is she kneeling? I ask. The pool of light flicks to the corner behind Cheryl. There's nothing there but a pile of ash and melted metal. The wall behind it is tar black. We think she was sitting in an armchair that was quickly reduced to nothing by the fire, and so her body fell forward. She didn't try to escape the fire, then. She was probably overcome by smoke in her sleep. It doesn't take long. I squint into the gloom. The fire is localised. The firefighters got to it quickly, but not quickly enough to save poor Cheryl. It's summer, so she wouldn't have had the two-bar fire on. There's really only one explanation. Cigarette? Jeff nods. You're learning. There's no obvious accelerant like petrol which might point it towards arson. The electrics are good. The fire was switched off. It's the only explanation. Accidental, then? Asks Sherwell, hopefully. Would seem so. Unless Alex has something to add. I admire Alex Blandford. It doesn't matter how awful the sight is. He's right in there. This time he's five centimetres from Cheryl, scanning her body with his own mini-torch for anything suspicious. She either died from smoke inhalation or possibly her burns, depending on how quickly the fire took hold, but I won't be able to say any more than that without a PM. Sherwell chips in. The paramedics said they were here on Friday. She had a bit of a turn, nothing serious. Apparently she was a very heavy drinker and on a lot of medication. She'd already accidentally overdosed last year. Maybe she passed out with a cigarette in her hand. Alex nods. That's very possible. Sherwell turns to me. In that case, it looks like we're just after the usual. Visuals and any samples you and Jeff think are worth taking, Ali. I don't respond. A memory has planted itself in my mind. And Sherwell isn't going to like it. Ali? Cheryl didn't smoke. She gave up some time ago. She used vapes. Her favourite flavours were gummy bear and blue ras cotton candy. They look at me. They want to ask how I know this. When you're going through people's personal possessions in pursuit of the perpetrator, they often end up telling you things that are unrelated to the crime they've fallen prey to. But I have the kind of mind that remembers them. When someone finally speaks, it's Jeff. I'm as certain as I can be this fire was caused by a cigarette. Obviously, I don't know who that cigarette belongs to. That's your job, but if you wanted to set fire to someone deliberately, you'd also want to make sure you'd done it properly. There's no way anyone could have stayed and watched this lady burn without being overcome by the smoke. You've not been here five minutes and you're all struggling to breathe and you're wearing masks. Plus, she was an alcoholic, not the most reliable of people. Maybe she lapsed, went back to the fags. We've all done it, says Sherwell. Jeff steps back in. It's a double act. And we've been through the house. You're welcome to check again, but there is no sign of any vapes. I think you're overthinking this, Ally. I don't. She had a three-month supply. She told me. She bought it in bulk from a guy on the high street because he did her a special deal. Like I said, people tell you the strangest things while you're crouched by their postbox dusting it for prints. So where is it? The fact you didn't find anything, Jeff, makes this more suspicious, not less. I turned to Sherwell. I'm not happy with this scene. You need to get major investigations down here now. D.I. Holt needs to see this. Sherwell laughs. It's a brave and potentially foolish detective that rings an SIO early in the morning. No way, I'm not calling Holt. Not for this. There's not enough evidence to say that this is a suspicious death. And there's not enough evidence to say that it isn't. That's why we need to do this properly. If you don't call Holt, I will. Tricia is making a fool of herself with one of the firemen, fawning over him while he's trying to clear the hoses away. 
He's clearly not interested in a fat lump like her. But she's too stupid to get the hint. They've been here for hours. The police and fire investigator disappeared into the house ages ago and haven't returned. Not that he's concerned. They won't find anything. He's made sure of that. Cheryl wasn't his first choice. Not by a long way. He hoped one of the others would come in first. But sometimes you just have to work with what you've got. He only gets a narrow window of opportunity to do what needs to be done and then be on shift so he's the one that's sent to attend when the call comes in. In a rural area like North Devon, where ambulance services are stretched, it's not difficult, but it's still a fine balancing act that takes some skill. She opened the door to him in a swirling mist of sickly sweet vape smoke that mingled with the stale stench of booze. Leaning on the door to steady herself, she was already drunk and still wearing that vile pink flannel dressing gown. I was just passing. Thought I'd check up on you. But it was 3am, and she knew this wasn't a normal call. She plumped her straggly purple hair and smiled at him. She was aiming for seductive, but her thin lips pulled back over her teeth, the colour of a rotting banana, made his stomach heave, and he almost walked away. But how long would he have to wait for another opportunity? Cheryl was better than nothing. Her living room reeked of cheap booze and rotting food. He wasn't normally sensitive to smells, but this was almost overpowering. Empty litre bottles of vodka and mould-crusted takeaway trays littered the sofa and the coffee table. He worried the squalor would put him off. It didn't. She turned to him, letting her dressing gown fall from her shoulders, exposing her deflated breasts. That she thought this was sexy was pathetic, and he wanted to laugh, but he didn't. Instead, he suggested a drink. She was so out of it, she didn't see him spike hers with her sleeping tablets. He was relieved that they took effect quickly. Normally, he likes to take his time, but he didn't want this to last any longer than it had to. Afterwards, the urge to get away from her was overwhelming, but he had to do this properly. He positioned her in the armchair, lit a cigarette and dropped it into her lap, firing it up with a slosh of vodka. The flames took hold of her gown almost immediately. She was practically pickled in alcohol, and her hair recoiled from the heat into tiny ringlets before melting into nothing. The armchair went up in seconds, giving off a black, toxic smoke that clung to his throat, making him hack. But he needed to make sure nothing was left, so he slipped on the oxygen mask from his kit and stood watching from the doorway into the kitchen, making sure the fire destroyed any evidence he'd ever been there. There's a raised voice coming from the house. The CSI appears at the front door. She's on the phone. He tries not to stare, but he can't help it. That hair. Those eyes. Those lips. So like Danielle. She glances in his direction, and he looks away, horrified she's noticed him looking at her. But when he looks back... He can tell the person on the other end of the phone has her full attention. I'm telling you, Bob, there's something not right. You need to see this. There's a short pause before she responds. Alex says, at the moment, 
It looks like she died of either smoke inhalation or of her burns, but he won't know for sure until he's done the PM. Jeff is as certain as he can be it's a cigarette, but she was a non-smoker. It wasn't her cigarette. Another pause. Yes, I know she was an alcoholic, and yes, I accept I may be wrong. All I'm saying is that you need to come down here and take a closer look, just to be sure. Her face hardens. The longer the other person speaks, the angrier she grows. So, that's a no then. Just to be clear, your crime scene manager is telling you this is a suspicious death, maybe even murder, and you're refusing to come out. Another brief pause. I'm not overreacting. I'm doing my job. And that sounds like a refusal to me. And don't give me that resources are stretched shit. She's about to say more, but the other person has rung off. She glares at the phone. For fuck's sake! She paces the front garden for a few minutes, too angry to do anything. The female detective emerges from the house. D.I. Holt has just told me this one stays at Barnston, Nick. I'm wrapping this up. It's accidental. She doesn't wait for an answer, but gets into her car and drives off, leaving the CSI furious. The boy CSI ambles over to her. You all right? No. She's really angry. So, what now? But she's still staring at the empty road. We treat this for what it is. A suspicious death. But, cordon off the house. I want every nook and cranny of the place videoed and then photographed. I want all doors and windows, unaffected by smoke damage, to be dusted for fingerprints and taped for fibres. And bring plenty of exhibit bags. We're going to be bagging everything. It's going to be a long day. He nods and goes back to the van. The CSI looks across at him. It's the first time she's noticed him. Hello again. It's not your lucky week, is it? He frowns. He doesn't know what she's talking about. First, Janie Warren, and now this poor lady. Oh, yes. You're right. I've been very unlucky, haven't I? Lots of people off sick at the moment. It's pretty much Trisha and I covering the whole county. Hopefully you'll get some time off soon. I'm really sorry about this, but we won't be moving the body for some time yet. It'll be at least a couple of hours. The firefighters said it was accidental? Is there a problem? She checks back at the house. Honestly? I'm not sure. There's something not quite right. I'm guessing the fire has probably destroyed a lot of evidence. She smiles politely at him. We'll see. Anyway, I won't keep you any longer. He goes to speak again, but she's already walking over to the other CSI like he doesn't matter. She was all over him when she was looking for her daughter the other day. And now, she doesn't want to know. Just like the rest of them. They're not interested unless there's something in it for them. Just like Danielle. He searches around for Trisha and finds her performing her giggly girl routine for another fireman. The idiot falls for it and takes a pen from his top pocket and hands it to Trisha, who scribbles something, her number, he guesses, on the back of his hand. Simon calls over to her, and she rolls her eyes like a child called in early from play. He climbs back into the ambulance cab, and a few seconds later, Trisha joins him with a stupid grin on her face. Oh my God! I think I've died and gone to heaven! That fireman just asked me for my number. He's probably married. No, 
I checked. He's definitely single. There's something really sexy about firemen. He's got big feet, too. And, you know what they say, big feet, big dick. Her laugh is deep and throaty and filthy. Right, I'm ready when you are. Hang on a minute, I think I left my phone in the house. He gets out of the ambulance and finds the object of Trisha's lust around the back of the fire engine, out of her sight. Look, don't say I said anything, but the lady you were talking to, the paramedic, has herpes. It's not the end of the world, of course. Don't let it put you off. She's a lovely girl, and she always insists guys wear condoms, and she uses a dental dam, but I thought you should know. Dental dam? Those plastic things dentists put over your mouth to protect themselves? Anyway, I just thought you ought to know. Uh, right. Thanks. He returns to the ambulance. Got your phone? says Tricia, still smiling. He taps his pocket and smiles. Good. She glances across at the fire engine. He said he'd phone me tonight. Then I'm sure he will. He's about to switch the ignition on when his phone buzzes. It can't be Jackie. He's told her never to call or message him at work, or she won't be getting any more gold bears. He takes his phone out and stares down at the screen. He really was not expecting this. Chapter 16 There's a narrow path that leads from behind Seven Hills Lodges up a steep hill. From a distance it appears to end in brambles, a natural perimeter to the site. But if you look closely, it continues on up to the brow of the hill, where the pine trees wither and fade to nothing under the corrosive sea air, and where only gorse and heather are able to thrive. There it joins the coastal path. To my right, the path goes down into Biddicombe, but the left turn takes me out along the cliff top towards Mort Sands. Halfway along is Breakneck Point, a small rectangle of land that pushes out into the sea. It's named after Mary Sewell, a young farm girl who, pregnant and jilted by her lover, leaped to her death. She was found at the bottom of the cliffs, her neck broken. Breakneck point. Steep hill. Our ancestors cut to the chase when it came to place names. The cliff path splits into two. The lower path is little more than a gap in the gorse, carved out by grazing sheep. Unless you're a local, you would assume it's a dead end. But it winds down towards the cliff edge before looping back up to join the main path. Whatever time of the year, there's a constant wind that blows up the channel, flowing over me and around me, like a playful sprite. Its welcome currents ruffle my hair and rustle my clothes, cleansing me of the smell of the dead and the despairing. By the time I reach the bottom of the path, the debris of the day has all but gone, and I am restored. That's why I come here. This place always draws me in after a difficult shift. It removes me from humanity and the ugliness that can accompany it and subsumes me in all that is natural, reminding me there is still beauty in the world. It's quiet at this time of day, well, as quiet as it ever can be. Most of the seagulls have taken to their nests but I still have the crash of the waves against the rocks below for company. Megan used to be my regular companion until her hormones intervened. Apparently exhausted by our bodyboarding antics over the weekend, she spent the day playing games on her phone and sleeping. Her capacity to sleep never ceases to amaze me, and yet she's always tired. At the lowest point on the path, 
is the only sign that the place has been touched by humans. A bench. It's dedicated to a Rex Gordon, who enjoyed the white expanse of the British Channel enough to have a seat installed in his memory, so others could appreciate it too. But it's been long since requisitioned by Megan and I, and renamed Our Bench. We've been coming here since she was tiny. Here, we would sit and make stories up about the people who lived on the other side of the sea. If we had the energy, we would take the path onto Mort Sands and reward ourselves with an ice cream. But I haven't come here in search of nostalgia. The more I think about the fire at Cheryl's, the more I'm convinced there's been foul play. Maybe it was one of her neighbours. I wouldn't put it past them, although pouring petrol through her letterbox is more their style. Besides, there was no evidence of a break-in. Jake and I both checked. Cheryl welcomed her killer into her home. Poor Cheryl. She didn't have much of a life, and what she did have has been cruelly taken from her by someone she trusted. The worst betrayal of all. But who was it? Cheryl always gave me the impression that she had no friends or family. Was that true, or just self-pity? If it was true, who did she open the door to? Surely that deserves investigating at the very least. I'm still angry Holt refused to come out. First Janie and now Cheryl. Two separate murders in four days. Is that possible? This is North Devon, for God's sake. Murders in this part of the world are a once-a-decade event, if that. Maybe I'm reading too much into this. Like Lowe said. And maybe I'm not. I'm about to leave when I spot a figure heading down the path from the direction of Mort Sands. It's Liam, the beachside barista from the coffee shack, lost in his own thoughts. My presence startles him before he realises it's me. Sorry, Ali, I didn't expect to find anyone here. It seems I'm not the only one who comes here seeking peace. What troubles bring Liam here? Me neither, I smile. He nods at the space next to me. Can I? Of course. He sits next to me on the bench. You and Megan looked like you were really enjoying the surf this weekend. Yeah, we had fun. Makes a nice change. Things haven't been great between us. Is that why you're here? You guys had a row? No, not this time. I had a tough job. There was a fire on the Tarka estate. A woman died. That's rough. Fires are the worst. Liam's palm tree shirts and shoulder-skimming blonde hair mean I often forget he was once a police officer who's seen his fair share of misery. It wasn't the fire so much, it was the D.I. in major investigations. I told him I didn't think it was accidental, but he refused to come out. Who is it? Bob Holt? Liam nods. I remember him, although he wasn't a D.I. when I was in the job. I look at Liam. Was he a mate of his? Under my careful scrutiny, he gives nothing away. But I don't care. I know he's busy and short-handed and his desk is stacked with cases, but he cuts corners. God knows how he ever became a D.I. Like a lot of cops, he's got there because he's never screwed up enough, but that doesn't make him good at his job. Not mates, then. That's not good enough. Cheryl, the woman who died, was an alcoholic who could barely dress herself. No one will miss her, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try our best for her. You know? Doesn't mean she gets a second-rate service. If she'd been the commissioner's daughter, we'd be all over it. My words become a mutual thought that sits in silence between us until Liam turns to me with a seriousness I haven't seen before. Stick to your guns, Ali. Otherwise you become like them, not giving a shit about anything other than ticking boxes. You don't want to become that person. You wouldn't be able to live with yourself. We're not talking about Cheryl anymore. This comes from a different place. I've never asked Liam about why he left the police service, 
sensing it wasn't a time in his life he wanted to dwell on. Until now. Is that what happened to you? Leaning forward, he clasps his hands in front of him and stares out across the sea. How much shame has it witnessed because one person couldn't look another in the eye? Yeah, a stalking case. The D.I. thought she was being hysterical. The bloke was just a bit besotted. It had seemed harmless stuff. Flowers left by her front door, poems on her car windscreen, that kind of thing. The D.I. told her plenty of women would be flattered by the attention. But there was something about him I didn't trust. I told the gaffer, but he told me to drop it. So I did. We had too much on as it was. And we couldn't arrest him for being in love. A few weeks later, she phoned me late one night because she thought she saw him in her garden. I told her it was probably her imagination and that she was overreacting. He closes his eyes at the memory. Her mum found her the next day. Strangled. Christ! What happened to the guy? Killed himself. I left the job shortly after that. I'd lost sight of why I joined and I couldn't forgive myself for doing nothing. Still can't. Finally, he looks at me. So do me a favour. Don't let cops like Holt off the hook. Peter Benson is 36. He still lives at home with his mum. And he's an idiot. He spends his days riding around the town and along the trails that loop around it on his yellow mountain bike, staring at women long enough for them to complain to the police about harassment. You can't be arrested for looking, but you can be arrested for murder. And Peter Benson is perfect. Almost too perfect. He's known Peter for years and is a regular visitor to his home ever since his mum had a diabetic seizure. Peter is at one of his usual haunts, sitting on a bench midway up Steep Hill in Biddicombe, which offers fine views of the Bristol Channel, but, more importantly, fine views of the female sunbathers below. He's not called Pervy Peter for nothing. His bike is propped up against the bench next to him. His hair is clipped at the sides, exaggerating a nest of dark brown curls on top. It looks ridiculously childish for a man of his age. Hello, Peter. More used to people avoiding him than talking to him, Peter looks instantly guilty. He doesn't ask why but there's a woman in a low-cut top sitting on a bench directly below them. He sits down next to him. How's your mum? The caution in his large brown eyes with their long, feminine lashes speaks of someone whose company is never sought. Okay. Small talk only confuses Peter, so he gets straight to the point. Peter, do you remember I told you a few weeks back about a very pretty lady that likes you a lot? Peter's forehead moulds into several different positions, like he's trying to physically squeeze the answer from his brain. It's quite funny, but he doesn't laugh. Peter's been teased all his life. You remember? She saw you riding your bike on the trail and thought you looked. Very handsome. Whether he remembers or not is irrelevant. The idea that a woman might be attracted to him unleashes a broad grin across the man-child's face. Yes. Yes. I remember. I like her, too. That's good, because I have some news for you. She wants to meet you. Tomorrow. A rat brown curl falls over Peter's left eye, irritating him more than it does Peter, who doesn't seem to notice. Me? Tomorrow? 
Yes. Would you like to meet her? Yes. Yes. Good. I'll explain where in a moment. But first, there's something you need to understand. It's very, very important. Yes. Yes. Peter's nods are vigorous enough to make him think he either really doesn't care or doesn't understand. Either way, it doesn't matter, but he has to take it slowly. You know I'm a paramedic. Well, the lady is a patient of mine. Like your mum. My mum? Peter thinks he's comparing the woman to his mother. She's not like your mum. She's much younger. But she's a patient that I look after. You look after my mum, he replies. Yes, that's right. I'm not allowed to tell people who I visit about other people I visit because it's private. Like a secret? He's catching on. Yes, like a secret. But the thought bothers him. It's bad to keep secrets. My mum says so. Some secrets, yes, but not all, because it's wrong to talk about people's private business. He shakes his head. Keeping secrets is wrong. This is all he needs right now. But he's not giving up. Not on this one. When she messaged him, his heart almost exploded. He hasn't heard from her in a long while and was sure she'd gone cold on him. And then, bam, she contacts him out of the blue, suggesting they meet tomorrow. He'd like more time, but he can't risk it. She might disappear for good, and he can't allow that. He just needs to persuade this idiot to do as he's told. Listen to me, Peter. When this lady asked me to tell you that she wanted to be your girlfriend, I said no. This confuses him. It doesn't take much. He's meant to be his friend. Why would he say this? Friends don't stand in the way of romance. I told her I could lose my job, but she insisted. And I just know that you two would be so good together. So I agreed. Peter's eager smile returns. Good old Simon made it right in the end. But Peter... You mustn't tell anyone that I told you about this lady. I mean it. You have to pretend you met her all by yourself. Yes, yes, yes. I won't say anything. He presses his thumb and forefinger together and runs them along his lips to show he zipped them up. But it's not enough. He needs to be absolutely sure he won't tell. I'm serious, Peter. You can't tell anyone. Ever. Because, if you do, there will be no one to collect your mum's medicine for her. He stops nodding. And then, what would happen to her? His eyes flash with panic. She'll die. Yes, Peter. She'll die. And. It will be your fault. None of us want that, do we? No, Simon. So, promise me you'll never tell anyone. Not even your mum. There's a silence. He's very close to his mother. There's nothing she doesn't know about him or can't wheedle out of him. He looks down at the young woman below us and licks his lips. I promise. Excellent. 
if anyone ever asks, just say you met her online. Now, I've brought a family pack of minstrels for you to give her as a present, as I know they're her favourites. Peter takes the packet and turns it in his hand like a piece of high-end jewellery. Remember, they're for her, not you. Now, listen very carefully. I've arranged for you to meet her tomorrow at 3pm at Three Brethren Woods. Chapter 17 DCI Lowe is not best pleased to see me in his office at nine the following morning. There are only two reasons for someone like me to request an audience with a senior officer. The first is to discuss career progression, but we both know I blew mine six months ago at Exeter Crown Court. The other is to make a complaint against a colleague. I thought about what Liam had said about not letting Holt off the hook. Changed my mind a dozen times and then decided I had to say something, even if I was wrong. There is no explanation for the cigarette, and while I accept Cheryl wasn't the most reliable of people, there is enough doubt for us to consider the worst. Someone murdered Cheryl Black. If Holt isn't going to listen to me, then maybe his superior officer will. To his credit, Lo hears me out as I relay the events of yesterday morning. As far as I'm concerned, as the crime scene manager, there was enough for this to be considered a suspicious death, and yet Holt still refused to come out. Acting D.S. Sherwell was there. Acting D.S. Sherwell admitted to me that she'd never attended a fire death before. In fact, this is only the second death she's ever been to. She wasn't in a position to call this. I understand you still examined the scene as if it were a suspicious death. This isn't going to plan. He's questioning my professional conduct here, not Holt. Yes, in my view, that was the correct course to take. Even though acting D.S. Sherwell told you she was writing it up as accidental. Strictly speaking, police officers can't order civilian CSIs around like they can each other, but going against their decision is dangerous territory and a fast track to making enemies. Yes, there were inconsistencies that led me to suspect possible foul play. And what were these inconsistencies? The fire that killed Cheryl was started by a cigarette, but it couldn't have been hers. She gave up smoking months ago. It was a big deal to her. She said she was going to use the money she saved for a holiday. She even showed me how much she'd already saved and joked she'd become addicted to vaping. Like I said, people tell you all sorts in this job. She was also being terrorised by her neighbours, putting dog shit through her letterbox, that kind of thing. I believe that was enough for us to do a more thorough examination. But there's no evidence of anyone else being involved in her death apart from this vague nonsense about her smoking habits. It isn't nonsense. The cigarette didn't belong to Cheryl. It belonged to someone else who she appears to have known because she let them in. You're putting too much store in this Cheryl woman. The sad truth is she was a paranoid alcoholic, given to calling the paramedics out on any pretext, including having a heart attack. Yes, but she was on medication for just about everything, including self-medicating with a bottle of vodka every day from what the paramedics told Sherwell. Yes, I know. And in among all of this, she decides to give up the fags for the sake of her health. Have you any idea how ridiculous that sounds? Yes, I do, but that doesn't mean it isn't true. In my professional judgment... This isn't about your professional judgment, though, is it? This is about you having it in for Holt. No, it isn't. You're here to make an official complaint against Holt, though, aren't you? Yes, but it isn't personal. I've nothing against Holt other than I believe he was wrong about Janie Warren and he's wrong about Cheryl Black. Lowe shakes his head. Drop it, Ali. 
You're way off the mark on this. I get it. Really, I do, and I sympathise. What are you talking about? You were on major investigations for six years. Your work was exemplary. And then suddenly you're kicked off and you find yourself in a backwater like Biddicombe doing crappy little shed break-ins. No one would blame you for being bitter. I wouldn't even blame you for wanting to get your own back, but going after Bob Holt is not the way to do it. You think this is about revenge? Jesus, Steve, I don't give a shit about major investigations. I'm trying to get justice for Janie and Cheryl. I'm just doing my job. All I'm asking is for others to do theirs. I'm not putting this on record. And if you go higher, I warn you there's every chance Bob will bring a counterclaim against you and, let's be honest, you have a reputation for being difficult and there's plenty round here would like to see the back of you. But, no buts. For your own sake, drop this. He returns to his computer screen, signalling our meeting is over. There's nothing more I can do for poor Cheryl. Dismissed in life, and now dismissed in death. Sai, sit here. Guess what? Trisha beckons him over. He has no choice but to collect his coffee from the counter and join her. They're in the hospital canteen, grabbing breakfast before the start of their shift. Trisha is already tucking into a fried breakfast. The state of her arteries. As it happens, he can probably guess the answer to her question. The smirk on her face tells him it's likely to do with men. She thinks of nothing else, apart from food and she devours both with equal enthusiasm. I met someone. He says nothing. He doesn't care. He has more important things to think about. Somehow, he needs to get rid of Trisha this afternoon, just for an hour. That should be enough. This guy is a real gentleman. No dick pics. No messing around. Just a nice bloke. We're going to meet up. He's hardly listening to her. But that's the thing with Trisha. It doesn't matter if you're interested in what she has to say or not. She'll say it anyway. He gives in. Just to be polite. So, what's his name? Snakebite1988. Snakebite 1988? Yeah. We met on OK Cupid a couple of months ago. I thought we were getting on really well, but he went quiet on me. Then I got back last night to find a message from him. What about the fireman? I thought you were keen on him. The bastard never called. So, what's this chap's real name? Dunno. I'll find out tonight. She's so desperate, she'll go out with someone she doesn't even know the name of. She deserves everything she gets. But he could be anybody. Trisha is mid-chomp, but that doesn't stop her talking, and she flashes him a mouthful of bacon rind. It takes all his strength not to gag. I know, I'm not stupid. He's taking me to the Crown tonight for a meal. Right, posh. There'll be plenty of people around. The Crown is really nice. You'll want to wear something new, of course. You want to create the right impression. Trisha pauses as she sweeps a slice of bread around her plate. You know, you're right. She frowns at her plate. But my shift doesn't finish till six. We only get a half-hour lunch. I've no time to get to the shops. He knows this, of course, but he uses a few seconds to think of a solution, even though he already has it. 
Why don't you take an extended lunch break? She folds the bread smeared with beans and ketchup in two and takes a chunk off the corner. I can't. He knows this, too. Trisha's already had too much time off. I've got no time owing. Colin would say no if I asked. He leans over the table, trying not to blanch at the wafts of eggy breath coming from Trisha. Then, don't ask. I can drop you off at the end of the high street and pick you up, say, two hours later. That should be enough time. Take your radio. If dispatch calls, I can come and get you. She thinks it through for a few seconds. Would you do that for me? Of course. You're a mate, aren't you? He hates the word mate. It's for copulating dogs, not people. But Trisha uses it all the time. Thanks, Simon. That's really sweet of you. I owe you. No problem. And go for yellow. Yellow really suits you. Yellow doesn't suit anyone. Well, you're the exception, then. Really? I always think I look like a great big zit. One of those white heads. He gives her his best don't-be-ridiculous expression. Not at all. It brings out your complexion. Thanks. I tell you what, you finish your breakfast. Take your time. I'll go and do the vehicle checks. Blimey! What did I do to deserve you? You'd do the same for me, I'm sure. And remember, this is just between us. If Colin finds out, he'll go bananas. Course, I'm not that stupid. The thing is, she is. Chapter 18 My first job of the day is in Lesser Worthington, a village in a valley five miles inland from Biddicombe, where the air stands still, and so does the life of its two dozen or so inhabitants. No one knows what happened to Greater Worthington. I'm still seething after my exchange with Lowe. I don't know why. Lowe's attitude should come as no surprise. Of course, he backed Holt and Sherwell. Cops stick together. I'm just a civvy. I was never sworn into the office of constable, and with that comes a lingering suspicion I can't be trusted. No point going to the superintendent, either. I'd be wasting my breath. He and Lowe were probationers together back in the day, bonded by night shifts and an unbreakable understanding they'll always have each other's back. Screw them all. Penny's text arrives just as I park outside a bungalow on the road leading into the village, bringing with it a welcome chance to think about something else. I'm so nervous. You'll be fine. Enjoy yourself. I must admit I was surprised to return from my walk last night to find an excitable Penny on my doorstep. Our conversation the other night made an impression because she had finally texted Ringo and agreed to go on a date with him. Clearly not a man to let the grass grow under his feet or let Penny change her mind. He suggested they meet today at a pub on the edge of Three Brethren Woods just outside Barnston. I asked her what changed her mind and she said that she couldn't live her life in fear. And besides, they were having a late lunch in a busy pub, so what was the worst that could happen? I hugged her. My phone buzzes with another text. I wish I'd dyed my hair. Grey is so ageing. I picture Penny sighing at her hair in the mirror. Grey is the new blonde. Do you think the feathers will put him off? If they do, he's clearly not the one for you. Be yourself. How about tie-dye? Too casual for a first date. What about massage and pepper t-shirt? Wear what feels comfortable. 
What if he's really ugly? I tapped the laughing emoji. He won't be. What if he's a mad axeman? This time Penny gets an eye-rolling emoji. He isn't. Just enjoy it. I've got to go. Speak to you tonight. You can tell me all about it. Have fun. I envy her the thrill of the first date. At least she and Ringo already have a lot in common, even if that is the entire back catalogue of the Beatles. My Tinder dates are based on little more than a wish and a prayer, and I'm an atheist. I collect my case from the back of my van. By the time I shut the door, I'm fully focused on the job ahead. Distraction burglaries are insidious, and we have more than our fair share. North Devon is Retirementville, full of the elderly who've escaped the city to enjoy a pace more in step with their own, but lulled by the open spaces and the seemingly open faces. They drop their guard, making them easy pickings for those that make a profession out of preying on them. A wary ninety-year-old called Mrs Ellis opens the door to me, but her suspicions over who I am come too late. When I show her my ID, she expresses delight that there is such a thing as a female CSI and invites me in. This is not good. Not good at all. Tricia is having second thoughts. He checks his watch. Peter will be on his way by now and he needs to get going. They're standing in front of a shop window and he's almost blinded by the sparkly, sequined tops and satin skirts stretched over the hairless, dead-eyed dummies. It's the kind of clothing that should only be seen on the ballroom floor, worn by a ten-year-old, not a fifteen-stone, thirty-something paramedic. Obviously, he doesn't say that to Tricia. He needs to be rid of her as quickly as possible, only she's discovered she's got a conscience after all. I'm not sure about this. We've been pretty busy. What if a call comes in when I'm in the changing rooms? It won't. And if it does, I'll come and get you. You're always covering for me, Si. No, I've got plenty of clothes at home. I'll wear what I wore on my date with Bill. OK. It was entirely your call, but you'd look good in that one. He points at a gold lycra top with black sequins in the shape of a heart. She stares longingly at it. He doesn't know why she's pretending to care about her job. It is nice, but I'll leave it. Thanks, anyway. Sure, no problem. Let's go then. I'm hungry. They amble back towards the ambulance. It's obvious she wants to stay. He just needs to say the right thing. They reach the ambulance and he lets out a chuckle. What is it? she asks. Nothing. You can't laugh and then not tell me. I was just thinking... It would be a bit weird if you end up marrying this guy, Snakebite, and you'll always look back on your first date and think, Oh yeah, I wore that top I wore on my date with that idiot Bill from HR. She's appalled by the idea. Yeah. I guess, when you put it like that, it doesn't sound like I'm making much of an effort, does it? And I do really like him, you know. He unlocks the driver's door. He wants her to think they're leaving immediately, put her under pressure to make a decision. I know. I just want you to make a really good impression on this guy, that's all. If you're OK wearing a top you wore on another date, then that's fine. Let's hope you don't call him Bill by accident. As he opens the door... Trisha glances back at the sequined top in the shop window. Actually, are you absolutely sure you don't mind? Yes, I'm sure. I'm just going to park up in our usual spot, eat my sandwiches and then come back for you. To be honest with you, 
I could do with a bit of peace and quiet, he jokes. She grins. I do your head in sometimes, don't I? No, no, not at all. He says this in a way that suggests the opposite. She laughs. Soz, I can't help it. I'm one of seven kids. I'm not good with silence or being on my own. Are you sure you're okay with this? Yes. And you promise you won't tell Colin? He already thinks I'm a slacker. I promise. I'll pick you up in two hours. Thanks, Simon. I've got a good feeling about this one. Me too. Chapter 19 Mrs Ellis has been relieved of her deceased husband's retirement watch and that week's pension. She doesn't care about the money, but she's distraught about the watch. Hours after the crime was committed, the soft folds beneath her roomy eyes are still damp with tears. He loved that watch. He never took it off. Do you think it'll turn up? Distraction burglaries always depress me. The effect the crime has on elderly people like Mrs Ellis is heartbreaking, and I want more than anything to nail the bastards that devastate their gentle worlds. But I only seem to make it worse. The truth is an assailant usually slips in unnoticed via an unlocked back door and goes through the house while their mate keeps the owner talking on the doorstep and they're almost always wearing gloves. Maybe. The reality is it's long gone, but I don't tell her that. My son is on his way down from London. I could ask him to check the junk shops in town. It might be worth a try. It isn't. But I can't bring myself to tell her that either, that most of this stuff is sold online now. Can you remember if the man touched anything while he was here? His accomplice might have worn gloves, but I'm guessing the guy who knocked on your front door didn't. It's summer and he wouldn't have risked you noticing and getting suspicious. A chink of hope brightens her. No, that's correct, he wasn't wearing gloves. I'd have remembered. Her face falls. But now I come to think of it, I don't think he touched anything either. He had a clipboard and asked me lots of questions about my water usage. She looks at me like it's her fault this vile lowlife didn't touch anything. OK, not to worry. Maybe his accomplice left his gloves at home. Where did you keep your husband's watch? Mrs Ellis leads me upstairs to a back bedroom. The door of a huge, dark wooden wardrobe is wide open. Old clothes stored in plastic bags spill out onto the floor. The mattress has also been lifted and shifted to one side. I'm not surprised. I remain incredulous at the number of people who still stash cash under their beds. The officer said to leave everything as it is, she says, as an apology for the mess. Harry's watch was in that. She points at a red velvet box gaping open on the bed. Next to it are various boxes decorated in rose-patterned material, spewing cheap pearls and paste brooches. It's not a great start. Even in the unlikely event he wasn't wearing gloves, I already know there isn't a fingerprint to be had among this. I can't dust material and the jewellery doesn't have a large enough surface area to give me a decent fingerprint. It's hardly worth digging out the aluminium powder, but I have to try. I'm about to open my case when Mrs Ellis leans heavily against the bedpost. The enormity of what's happened has hit her. Fifty years with William's printers, Harry was. Man and boy, he loved it there. He wore the watch every day till he died. It was special to him, and when he died, it became special to me. Sometimes at night I 
slip it onto my wrist and pretend it's him holding my hand. Silly, I know. My heart flips, and I place my arm around her, hoping I'm not being presumptuous. But she sinks gratefully into me. Her tissue-thin skin is too big for her, and puckers loosely around her neck. She reminds me of a newborn chick that has tumbled too soon from its nest, frail and helpless, just waiting to be picked off by a couple of hawks. Even if she had realised what was happening, she couldn't have stopped them. What it must be to be on your own in this world. At least I have Megan, even if she is invariably glued to the latest Netflix series. Which is how I had left her that morning, despite my gentle reminders that she was meant to be doing schoolwork. Still, I'd rather have her sulks and door slamming than be alone, like Mrs Ellis. I hold the old lady tight in my arms until I feel her strength return. It's not silly at all. Look, why don't we go back downstairs? And I'll make you a nice cup of tea. I'll come back up and see what I can find here and then I'll tidy up for you. Mrs Ellis nods and shuffles towards the door where she pauses to look back over her shoulder at the mess in her bedroom. I feel such an idiot falling for his lies. He seemed like such a nice young man and I don't get to talk to many people these days. I was so pleased when he said he'd come in for a few minutes. Don't be too hard on yourself. These people are very convincing. It's easy to be taken in by them. But suddenly she's angry with herself. Yes, but I, of all people, should have known better. What do you mean? She takes my hand in hers. Dear, I was a police officer. One of the first WPCs in this area. Really? That's amazing. My father was dead against me joining, but I was adamant. Of course, in those days we weren't allowed to do much more than make the tea and do the filing. I'm sure you still caught your fair share of criminals. A twinkle returns to her eye. I had my moments. I know it's all science these days, but nothing beats the copper's hunch. And I had a pretty good one. And, she waggles her finger at me, once I had them in my sights, I never let go of them. I always saw it through to the end, even when my colleague said I was barking up the wrong tree. It sounds like you enjoyed your time in the job. I did. Very much. It was a long time ago, but still I should have realised what was happening. I should have seen those scoundrels for who they were. Then I might still have Harry's watch. She turns away, and I watch her take the stairs, one step at a time, holding the rail. And I find myself thinking about how easy it is to be deceived. We're all susceptible to a smiling face, a confident manner, and the offer of company. You don't have to be ninety. I was just twenty-one when Sean strolled into my life, promising all those things, and I didn't see through him. Not until it was too late. People rarely are who they say they are. The smell of fish paste is released into the cabin as he peels back the lid of his lunchbox. The sandwich feels soft and mushy in his mouth, but he doubts he'll have time to eat the orange. She'll be here any minute. The ambulance is parked in its usual lunchtime spot when they're not busy. A lay-by on the edge of a new housing estate, just down from the Crown Pub, which backs onto Three Brethren Woods. A dense, steep wooded area edged by the trail, beyond which lies the flat, salty marshes of the estuary. It's perfect. In every way. While he's waiting, he retrieves his phone and re-reads her messages. 
It's all happened so fast he can barely take it in. And her, of all people. Never in a million years did he think she would ask to meet him. But it just goes to show, you never can tell. Sometimes the ones you think are pushovers tell you to get lost, and those you think you only have an outside chance with are surprisingly easy. That's the thing with women. What they show on the outside is rarely what's happening on the inside. He's learned that from Tricia. Her brashness is just a cover. The truth is, she's terrified of being alone, which is why she bites the hand off the first man that gives her a second glance. He shakes his head at the topsy-turviness of it all. Still. He really didn't expect to land this one. There's definitely something more thrilling about the ones that appear beyond reach. The ones who tell themselves they'd never fall for it. He puts his phone away and finishes his sandwich, flicking the crumbs from his shirt. His watch reads 3.10pm. She's late but he knows she'll be here. He wonders if it'll be as good as Janie, the girl on the quay. That had worked like a dream. He wasn't sure at first. He never is. Each time, there's always a moment when he thinks it won't work, that it's over. But when he hovered his hand just over her forehead, it was as if someone had injected adrenaline straight into his heart. He knew then everything was going to be fine. He could relax. In the back of the ambulance, on the way to the mortuary, he bent down to kiss her forehead and was startled by its iciness that exploded across his lips, converting into a white heat that rushed his insides. Nourishing him, reinvigorating him, reigniting him all at once. The dead have a coldness unlike any other, unyielding to the touch, and yet possessed of magical properties. She released waves of electric currents as he stroked her pebble smooth cheek. It meant one thing only. Yes, Janie was good. He couldn't deny that. But this one would be better. He's sure of it. And there she is, strolling towards him, a smudge of a smile on her face and a lightness underfoot that means only one thing. She's excited to see him. He's excited, too. She passes the ambulance, not bothering to glance in. That's okay. No one ever does. But his own heart does a little jig at the sight of her. Dusting stray crumbs from his uniform, he replaces the lid on his sandwich box and drops it on the seat next to him. He checks himself in the mirror and smooths his hair into place. He wants to look his best for her. From underneath his seat, he pulls out a metal bar. There's a plastic bag tied to one end, the end with Peter Benson's fingerprints on it. It's from the shed in his garden. Unbuttoning his jacket, he slides it inside his uniform. It feels cold and hard against his chest. One last check in the mirror, and he's ready for action. People say he looks a bit like Daniel Craig, the chap who plays James Bond. Same eyes, same colour hair. No wonder Jackie can't believe her luck. Pity Danielle didn't feel the same way.
There's no one around when he gets out of the ambulance. The drizzle has seen to that. But he doesn't linger, just in case, and swerves into a narrow path that runs down the back of the housing estate and towards three brethren woods. Towards her. Chapter 20 Holt is already here, wrapped in despair. Forget the TV cliché of the hard-nosed detective. The ones I know are seriously affected by sights like these. I know what he's thinking because I'm thinking it too. Who could do this to another human being? But we've both been around long enough to know the answer to this question is lots of people. I lived with one of them for years. Through the thick glass partitioning me from the ward, at the far end of the room, I can only make out a profile of a face distorted by bulging purple-black bruises. Her head is bound in a thick turban of bandages, spotted with blood. Wires and tubes crisscross her body, attached to machines monitoring her and their ability to push life into her. My camera case is in my hand, but I doubt I'll be taking photographs any time soon. The call came in just as I was leaving Mrs. Ellis's. It was the usual half message. You're needed at Barnston Hospital to photograph a female. Head injuries. But the words don't do justice to the woman encased in the incubator, like a plastic tomb in the far corner of ICU. I don't mention Janie Warren or Cheryl Black. The horror of this attack has shoved that to one side, for now. So, what have we got? I sound as depressed as Holt looks. He sighs himself back into investigator mode. Not sure yet, just got here myself. Serious assault at the moment. A member of the public found her in Three Brethren Woods, just off the trail. Three Brethren Woods? Penny is meeting Ringo in a pub nearby. Yeah, why? Nothing. Penny said she was meeting Ringo for a late lunch. Did they decide to go for a walk after? After all that's happened to her, she wouldn't go into a wood with someone she barely knew. Do we know who she is? Holt ignores the phone buzzing in his pocket. We're working on it, but there was no ID on her. No driver's license, nothing. Penny keeps her driver's license in her purse. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. It's not Penny. It can't be. But I have to be sure. I take out my phone. Can you excuse me a moment? My friend was meeting someone near Three Brethren Woods. I just want to make certain she's okay. Of course. Penny's number is on speed dial, and already ringing. She doesn't pick up, so I leave a voicemail. Pen, it's Ali. Can you call me back as soon as you get this? There's been an attack in Three Brethren Woods. I need to know you're safe. Is your friend okay? Asks Holt. She's not picking up, but I'm sure she's fine. I can't think why she'd go for a walk in the woods with someone she'd only just met. But that doesn't mean she didn't. The doctor catches sight of us and is already shaking her head by the time she joins us. Holt flashes his card. D.I. Holt, and this is CSI Diamond. You're wasting your time, Detective Inspector. There's no way you'll be able to photograph her injuries or interview her today. She's in a very bad way. Her skull is fractured in several places. She's heavily sedated. We're prepping her for surgery. Holt nods but he isn't finished. Any thoughts on the weapon? The doctor studies her patient through the glass, as if she can see through the bandages. Some kind of blunt-ended instrument? A bat or a metal bar, maybe? It's difficult to say. I've never seen anything like this. The ferocity needed to do that is off the scale. Is she going to make it? The doctor gives my question some thought, her eyes still trained on her patient. Difficult to say. The next 48 hours will be crucial. She turns to me. We'll let you know when she comes round and you can take your photographs then. 
There's a finality in her voice that suggests there's nothing more to say. But Holt has plenty. Any other injuries, any signs of sexual assault? No, nothing. The injuries are all concentrated around the head. It's a miracle she's alive and we're doing everything we can to keep her that way. Now, if you'll excuse me. The doctor steps back inside ICU, leaving Holt and I standing in front of the glass, trying to fathom what all this means. He's thrown by the news she hasn't been sexually assaulted. Maybe he was disturbed. Maybe. But if it isn't sex, then we're looking at a different motive. Perhaps he just hates women. I think that's a given. I'll stay here until we get an ID on her. Okay, I'll get down to the scene. Whatever bad blood there is between us has gone. We've both got a job to do. It's cordoned off. There's a couple of PCs guarding it at the moment and Jake is on his way. Thanks. I'll radio you if we find anything of interest. A signed confession by her attacker nailed to a nearby tree would be useful. A lame joke is Holt's attempt to repair our relationship. The way those that have won are wont to do. But I appreciate it and concede a smile. I'll see what I can do. Ali? Yes? I know you think I jumped the gun on Janie Warren, but Banstead is our man, and I went overacting D.S. Sherwell's notes on Cheryl Black. It was accidental. Maybe he's right. I don't know. And I'm in no mood to argue. Okay. And look on the bright side, adds Holt. At least we know Banstead couldn't have done this one too. I glance back through the glass at the beaten and broken woman, fighting for every breath. There is no bright side. I check my phone. Still nothing from Penny. He can't understand it. This is wrong. All wrong. But it had all started so well. They were called to attend to her. First on the scene like he knew they would be. When they got to her, he felt her neck, and there it was, the faintest of pulses. He didn't tell Tricia, of course. There's nothing. She's gone. He figured if she wasn't dead yet, she didn't have more than a few minutes to live. And anyway, he could let her bleed out in the back of the ambulance. But... Trisha had other ideas. She did something she's never done before. She insisted on checking herself. He should have known something was up. She'd been acting weird since he'd picked her up outside the clothes shop, telling him to hurry up and effing and jeffing at the other drivers blocking their route. She kneeled down on the ground, practically pushing him out of the way. She can't be. Her fingers pressed and prodded her neck, then stopped. Wait, she's still alive. Thank God, but we have to hurry. Still, it didn't bother him. He'd finish her in the back of the ambulance. Okay, let's get her stabilised as quickly as we can and get her to hospital. They worked on her to the point where they were happy to stretcher her down to the trolley parked on the trail. He tried to drag his heels, even pretended to stumble, but Tricia kept telling him to get a march on. The cheek of it. She's normally the one slowing them up. They wheeled her to the ambulance at the entrance to the woods and slid her into the back just as the police car arrived. He showed the officer where they'd found her so he could cordon off the scene, but by the time he returned, Trisha had already jumped into the back. She hardly ever rides up back. At times like this, he despised the woman more than ever, always interfering, always making things difficult for him. I'll ride with her, Sai. But... You're a much faster driver than me. She placed her hand on the girl's arm. No, Sai. I've let her down once. I'm not doing it again. 
he dithered. This wasn't the plan. Trisha's patience ran out. Come on, we're wasting time. So they set off, him driving, Trisha in the back. A couple of times she poked her face through the hatch. Hurry, I'm not sure how much longer she can hold on. Stupid cow. She's ruined everything. She denied them his special time. He could kill her. Maybe one day he will. What if she dies, Sai? Trisha's question snaps him back to the present. They're in the canteen in the hospital. Colin sent them there after they got back from Three Brethren Woods to collect themselves and get over the shock of what they'd just brought in. But he's not in shock. He's raging inside. Sigh. Did you hear me? What if she dies? If she dies, she dies. He regrets his words the moment they leave his mouth, and the shock registers on Trisha's face. But she won't die, he adds hastily. But she's in a bad way, Sigh. Trisha hangs her head. If she doesn't make it, I'll never forgive myself. Okay, you did a terrible thing. Her eyes are glassy with tears. But what's done is done. Anyway, we don't know that if we'd have reached her any sooner, it'd have made any difference. I do. I worked it out. You were parked in our normal spot, right? I reckon that's five minutes max from the entrance to the woods. The call came in at 3.52pm. I checked. You collected me at 4.05pm. We didn't get to her until 4.17pm. That's a difference of 20 minutes, which... She stops, unable to finish the sentence. So he picks up where she left off which could be the difference between life and death. Her lower teeth grab her upper lip. She closes her eyes and nods. Look, there's no point dwelling on it. It's out of our hands now. It's going to take a miracle to save her, Sai. Well, hopefully, God is looking in the opposite direction. Because if she wakes up, he's finished. But he doesn't plan to trust this to God or anyone else. He needs to think, to come up with a way out. And he can't do that with Trisha whining in his ear. On the table is a pink plastic shopping bag. The words Babe Nation in black written on the side. It contains Trisha's outfit for her date, some tarty top that's two sizes too small, no doubt. At least you have your evening with Mr. Snakebite to look forward to. She pulls the bag out of sight, Exhibit A in her guilt. I'm going to cancel. I don't feel in the mood anymore, and I want to make sure she's in the clear before I clock off. I thought I'd go up to ICU later. A thought pushes into his mind. Maybe there is a way to save the situation. That's a shame. You were so looking forward to it. Honestly, I'm not feeling it, Sai. But what if he's the one? You said yourself you had a good feeling about him. The thought she may miss out on the man of her dreams after a lifelong search stirs her. She reeks of desperation. It's pathetic. I did feel we connected. There you go, then. It was meant to be. Her mind wanders elsewhere. Three brethren woods, at a guess. It just... Doesn't seem right. Not after today. 
he reaches across the table and places his hands on her enormous man-hands. Trish, we have to go on living. TV dinners, EastEnders, dates with men called Snakebite. Life goes on, and we have to live it. Otherwise, we can't do the job that we do. She nods. Simon's the sensible one. If he says it, then it must be true. Maybe you're right. Your Uncle Si is always right. She calls him her Uncle Si all the time. He hates it, especially as he's only five years older than her. But he wants her to feel he's on her side. I'll stay on and finish the paperwork. You get off. Tell you what, I'll drop by I see you later and call you with any news. How does that sound? She doesn't mull his offer for long. He knew she wasn't that bothered about her. She was just scared of being found out. Thanks. You're a mate. And promise me you won't let Mr. Snake bite down. I promise, Uncle Si. She grabs the plastic bag, holds it close to her chest like some precious keepsake, and disappears through the canteen's double doors, leaving him to think things through. If he leaves it late enough to go to ICU, there'll be hardly anyone around. He can already picture the gratitude of the overworked nurse, probably a bank nurse doing nights for the extra cash, when he offers to sit with her while she takes a well-earned break. Then they can say their goodbyes properly. He's already looking forward to it. It will be much more dignified than the back of an ambulance. He's surprised it's never occurred to him before. Maybe this is the start of something new. Chapter 21 The drizzle has graduated to a steady downpour. Sliding my camera case into the back of the van, I shut the door and climb into the driver's seat, relieved to be out of the rain. I check my phone again. Still nothing from Penny. Penny, who was meeting an unknown man at a pub near Three Brethren Woods. I glance back up at the hospital. It can't be Penny. She promised me she wouldn't take any chances, and she'd stay in view of other people. She would never go into the woods with a guy she'd only just met. I need to get down to the scene and secure it straight away. Maybe we'll be able to start examining it today, but the dark clouds will pull nightfall forward by a few hours, which means that we'll get the tent erected and examine the area immediately around where she was found. But wider searches will have to wait until tomorrow. But apart from the diminishing light, the weather has sided with us. The rain will have softened the hard ground, making it perfect for foot impressions. I just hope no one trashes the scene before I can get there. I radio my intention to drive to Three Brethren Woods. Almost immediately, Jake responds with an Echo Tango 12 also en route. My relief at hearing his voice doesn't surprise me. After the usual initial flurry of activity, crime scenes can be solitary, even eerie environments, especially somewhere like Three Brethren Woods, named after three brothers who drowned cockle-picking in the estuary. I've always thought it a strange name, like a warning, a place where no good happens. Buckling myself in, I switch the van engine on, push it into reverse, and ease out of the parking space just as my peripheral vision registers a marked police car turning towards me. I ignore it, but it speeds towards me like it's playing chicken, screeching to a halt inches from my bonnet. I hit the brakes and glare at the driver. It's Cobb. What the bloody hell does he think he's doing? I'm in no mood for his games, so I throw my seatbelt off and swing the car door open. It groans under the force. Get out of my way, I shout through the gap. Cobb ignores me 
and speaks into the radio clipped to his lapel. Arrogant shit. I get out and lean over the van door. This is the second time you've stopped me doing my job. I'm putting in a formal complaint. Now fucking move. But he doesn't move. Instead, he gets out of his car. So I slam my door shut, ready for another showdown, startling an elderly couple sheltering under an umbrella. We've just ID'd the woman who was attacked. Normally, I'd ask who, but this is Cobb and I've had enough of him. Good, now get out of my way. I'm meant to be at the scene. I go to get back into the van, but his next line stops me. She's registered at the same address as you. What? Seven Hills Lodges? That's where you live, right? My mind does the maths. Two plus two equals Penny. Oh, God. It's Penny. Yes, Penny Fields runs it. My voice is tight and thin. I need Cobb to tell me this is a mistake, as my mind won't accept anything less. He frowns hard at me. And I realise this is the first time he's heard that name. No, that's not her name. Thank God. He's got this wrong. God knows it's not the first time, and for once I'm pleased he's an idiot. But Cobb doesn't move, his face swaying between puzzlement and concern. Do you have a sister? No. What's going on? Does the name Megan Parker mean anything to you? Parker is Sean's surname. But Megan doesn't use it, hasn't done since the day we left him. Whatever database the police are using, it's way out of date. My daughter is called Megan, but her surname isn't Parker, it's Diamond. But what's Megan got to do with anything? Surely she hasn't bunked off again and been picked up by the truancy patrol. I'll kill her when I get hold of her. Your daughter? He doesn't know I'm a mum. Not many at the Nick do. Cobb removes his hat. Ali, I'm sorry. What for? He glances up at the hospital, and then at me. He can't speak. He doesn't have to. Oh, God. No. No, I say aloud. It doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. No. I need to call Megan. She'll be home, probably texting her mates right now, complaining about what a bitch her mother is. I take my phone out of my pocket. I dial Megan's number. Her phone is turned off. It's never turned off. I look at Cobb. Tell me it isn't true. But his face is ashen, his eyes fixed on the bonnet of my van, refusing to bear witness to the terrible situation he's found himself in. No one signs up for this. I shove past him, past the disapproving old couple, and race back towards the hospital entrance, barging through the doors, almost taking out a man propped up by a Zimmer frame. Mistake, it's a mistake. It can't be Megan. She's at home. I slalom the people in the reception area, standing still like ninepins in my way, paralysed by the sight of a small, dark woman hurtling towards them. It can't be Megan. She wouldn't be on the trail. It's sixteen miles from Biddicombe. Through the blur of fluorescent lights and doors banging shut, I hear calls to slow down, but I need to go faster. No time to wait for the lift. I take the back stairs two at a time to the third floor and burst through the doors into ICU. It can't be Megan. I'd have known if it was her. I'm her mother. Holt stands in the middle of the corridor, his face rinsed of colour. He knows. That's who Cobb spoke to on his radio. And then I know, for certain. It's Megan. Holt steps towards me, arms outstretched, not to embrace me, but to bar my way. I try to dodge him, but he wraps himself around me and holds me, fast. You can't go in there. Let go of me. I have to be with Megan. She needs me. I'm her mum. Not the best mum, I accept that, but still. Her mum, I can't wrench myself free of him. Years of policing have perfected his grip. The bastard won't let me go. No, Ali. 
I kick his shin, hard. He gasps in pain but tightens his hold. She needs me. Not yet. Not yet? What does he mean, not yet? I twist around in Holt's arms and stare through the window. I can't see Megan. There's people. So many people fussing around her bed. Calm, methodical, practised. The crash team. The sight sucks the fight from me, and I can do nothing but watch as strangers try to bring my daughter back to life. Holt feels the fight leave me and lets me go. I press my hands against the cold glass. The team pours. Megan's body arches silently, possessed of five hundred volts, and I tense as if I too have experienced the surge. Her body levels, limp and lifeless. Come on, Megan. Respond. Respond. You can have the six-inch heels from New Look. Just respond. Nothing. Machines scrutinised, heads shaken. Instructions reissued, paddles repositioned, people ordered to stand back. Another shock. Megan's body jumps, higher, stronger, forcing life into her. This is it. This time it will work. Respond, Megan. Come on, Megan. You can have your nose pierced for your sixteenth. Respond. Just come back to me. They wait. Machines checked and rechecked, more heads shake, shoulders sag in defeat. It's over. She's gone. Then something happens. I can't hear anything, but someone says something, and they all stare at one of the machines. No one moves. It comes again. This time it's enough for people to exchange nods of relief. Someone mouths, Well done, Megan. At my daughter. She's back, she's alive. My legs buckle. Holt catches me. A nurse emerges from the room. Please, can I see her? Don't get too close. We're still trying to stabilise her. I stand in the doorway, watching the doctors and nurses administer to Megan. All I want to do is push them out of the way and hold my child, convinced that my life force will work better than their medicine and machines can. I just have to hold her long enough, that's all. And she will return to me as she was. I know it. But I can't. Instead, all I can do is stand watch over her from a distance. One thought stapled to the front of my mind. I wasn't there for her. I don't know how much time passes before I'm vaguely aware of a beeping noise. But it's not coming from the hospital's machines. It's my phone. Instinctively, I get it out. There's a text from Penny responding to my voicemail. Oh my God, that's awful. But I'm fine. But she's talking of a different time. A time when I thought the worst that could happen was that my best friend had been attacked. But it wasn't the worst. The phone trembles in my hand. I can barely keep it still long enough to tap the letters in. But Penny needs to know. It's Megan. Chapter 22 His keycard lets him into ICU. It's late enough for the lights to be dimmed, throwing the corridors into shadow. A single light illuminates the reception desk, where the nurse in charge is tapping her mobile phone like her life depended on it, engrossed in some silly game when she should be caring for her patients. She looks up and smiles at his uniform. Hi. Evening. I brought the young girl in today, the one found in the woods. I just thought I'd drop by and see how she is. Sit with her while you go and have your break. I know the family. The nurse puts her phone down, but the tinny music from her game still blares out. He wants to tell her to switch it off. This is ICU, not an amusement arcade, for goodness sake. Are you a relative? For someone who thinks it's acceptable to play games at work, her sudden decision to take her job seriously surprises him. 
no. As I said, I'm the paramedic that brought her in. I saved her life. I just wanted to pop my head round the door to make sure she's okay. He glances down the darkened corridor, trying to gauge which room she is in. She's still in the operating theatre. Oh? She nods in agreement, interpreting his response as a bad sign. I know. It's been five hours. Not good. Five hours? They're fighting to keep her alive. Hopefully, it's a battle they'll lose. Not that he can share that with this excuse for a nurse. So, what time are you expecting her? No idea, the nurse shrugs. He hesitates, trying to decide what to do. Can't wait. That would look odd. I'll pop back later. I'm not sure they'll let you in. She's in a pretty bad way. The mother's around here somewhere. She just wants to get a coffee. If you wait, she'll be back any minute. Maybe you could speak to her. He'd forgotten her mother would be around. He definitely can't risk being seen by her. Not that she would suspect him. He's a paramedic. It's fine. I don't want to bother her unnecessarily. Yeah, I'd leave it if I were you. She checks both ways and leans across the desk. Between you and me, I don't think she's going to make it. Sorry, I know you guys did the best you could. Thanks. He makes for the exit, pauses and turns back to the nurse. By the way, I heard one of the ward sisters moaning about the night staff spending too much time on their phones. They've been checking the CCTV, and anyone they catch is looking at a disciplinary. She squints at the camera as her phone disappears under the desk. Shit, really? But he's already buzzed himself out. The toilet system digs into his back, but he doesn't care. He's spent. He's been through hell these last hours. First, Trisha changes her mind about going shopping, and then she insists on riding up back with the girl. Then, just when he's managed to bring it back from the brink of disaster, she's not even on the ward. He was so looking forward to it, too. It all seemed so perfect. Just the two of them, surrounded by the dark and the quiet. But it's all been for nothing, and now all he's left with is the memory of their meeting on the trail. What use is that? Maybe, just this once, if he concentrates hard enough, it will be enough. Closing his eyes, he makes himself as comfortable as he can on the toilet seat. People always see the uniform first, and she was no different. She was wondering what a paramedic was doing there, but then, as he drew closer, she recognised him and smiled. It made his heart swell. Not everyone remembers him. He remembered her, even though it had been six months since they had met in the school hall, and even then they had been surrounded by flapping teachers muttering about health and safety, and a grandmother who was seriously put out at being there. When he met her, he assumed she would be too difficult a nut to crack. Teenagers usually are. Their natural contempt and inbuilt defensiveness towards anyone more than five years older than them can make them more trouble than they're worth. But she was different. She was happy to answer his questions in the back of the ambulance. But then, she's probably been taught to trust men in uniform. By the time they reached the hospital, she had told him everything he needed to know. 
even then, he wasn't sure about her. You might win a teenager's confidence, but can you trust them to keep their mouths shut? They're so unpredictable, alongside a predisposition to share their every waking thought with the world and his dog. Still, he gave it a go. But when she batted away attempts to meet, he began to admit defeat. Besides, he had other options. At that point, the girl Janie was a much better bet anyway. It wasn't until he saw her photo in the car park at Mort Sands and realised she was the CSI's daughter that his interest was reignited. The CSI was so like Danielle that he struggled not to stare at her. He seriously considered switching his attentions to her. It would almost be reliving history. Every glorious moment of it. But these things take time, and she'd be wary. All police people are suspicious. She'd take a lot of planning. No, right now he'd make do with her daughter. But the CSI was definitely one for the future. He didn't immediately react. He didn't want to spook her. So he kept it casual and walked by before pausing and turning back. We've met before, haven't we? She nodded, still smiling, pleased to see a friendly face out on the trail. Yes, I fell off the beam at school and knocked myself out. You took me to the hospital to make sure I didn't have a concussion. That's right, I remember. You were with your gran. Yes, my mum was working, so the school called my nana. Let me think. Twilight Sparkle, right? Ah, uh, yes. She squirmed at the mention of her Instagram username. Like her friends, she didn't use her real name. Maybe she was embarrassed by its childishness. Maybe it was because she'd shared it with him as he tended to her. He didn't care. So, how's the head? All better. What are you doing here? Waiting for a friend. Who's the lucky boy? I'm guessing it's a boy, with all the effort you've made. She smoothed her long auburn hair, but it was a self-conscious act, like she was embarrassed he'd noticed. Yes. Guess he must be special, though, if you're meeting him out here. He was being childish, but he wanted to hear her tell him how amazing he was. She didn't disappoint. Yeah, he is. Really funny and sweet. And good-looking, I'll bet. Her cheeks flushed red. This is the first time we've met. Like a blind date. Suppose. But she wasn't interested in him. She was turning her phone in her lap, desperate to read its screen and find out where her Prince Charming had got to. He wanted to grab her, there and then, and tell her, Rugger Boy 666 is me. Look, he sounds perfect. You have fun and be careful, right? There's a lot of weirdos out there. She laughed, and he strolled away, distracted by the curlews out in the estuary, spearing the mudflats with their knitting needle thin beaks until he rounded a bend and ducked back into the woods. Keeping low, he climbed the steep bank and tracked over to where she was sitting. Leaning against a tree, looking down, he had a direct view of her back. She glanced at her phone and scanned the trail. Rugger Boy 666, or rather, Peter, was late. She wasn't going to wait much longer. 
He couldn't blame her. It was rude to keep her waiting. But he couldn't make his move. Not yet. He spotted a yellow bike frame through the trees. He'd come. Peter. Wearing the red puffer jacket like he'd told him to. He skidded to a halt in front of her, his back tyre swinging out. It was meant to impress her, but she was surprised and annoyed by the act, shifting in her seat, turning her head sideways, hoping her body language would be enough to repel him. But Peter isn't the type to pick up on signals. He said something to her, and she shook her head. He spoke again. He couldn't hear what Peter was saying, but he didn't have to. The words that came out of Peter's mouth were his. Then he heard him. You're very beautiful. I want to stroke your hair and kiss your lips. Go away! She said this loudly enough for him to hear, her eyes sweeping the trail for her knight to rescue her. Don't worry. You won't have to endure him for much longer. Peter dug around in his pocket and produced the bag of minstrels he'd given him. It had already been opened. He offered the bag to her, but she ignored him. Never take sweets from a stranger. Everyone knows that. Peter helped himself to a handful of minstrels and shoved the packet back into his pocket. He crunched happily on them for a few minutes, still sitting on his bike, while she pretended he wasn't there. I want to make love to you. He almost burst out laughing at the suddenness of this, although he knew it was coming. But she didn't find it funny. She leapt to her feet, her phone clattering to the ground, and shouted at him. Look, just fuck off, or I'll call the police. Such language for one so young. So coarse. But he had to take some of the blame. Her anger sent Peter into retreat. A face full of confused hurt, he swung his bike round and cycled back towards the town. But he'd been there long enough to condemn himself. He made his way down the bank and emerged from the woods, feigning breathlessness. Was that boy bothering you? Still flushed from her outburst, she didn't question what he was doing in the woods. A bit. He felt her relief. It had been bravado. Peter had scared her. Do you want me to call the police? No, it's okay. Thank you. She smiled at him. She was in safe hands now. He was no threat to her. She could relax now. Silly girl. I'd better be going. He took her arm. She tensed, but was too polite to brush him off. There's no hurry. My mum's waiting for me. Ah, that old chestnut. The thing is, he knew she was lying. She didn't tell her mum she was there because she hated her mum. And anyway, she didn't care about her. No one cared about her. That's what she told him. It's okay. You're safe with me. And then she understood. That delicious moment when they realised they'd got it wrong. But before she could resist, he had slapped his palm over her mouth. But... He must move on. He calls up the memory of her body lying on the ground. Like studying a great painting in a gallery, he examines every inch of her form until he reaches her face. Still, serene, at peace. His.
His breath shortens and his heart begins to beat so hard it hurts, forcing the blood through his veins like it's willing him on. It's working. You can do it, Simon. He squeezes his eyes tight to make sure her face, her stillness, remains anchored in his mind. He wants this so badly. Surely that counts for something. Yes. Yes. It's happening. This is it. He knows it. He looks down, and the sight drives the air from him. Nothing. He nudges it, but it just lies there, flaccid, limp, lifeless, impotent. Useless. Tilting his head back, he stares up at the grubby grey ceiling, and he just wants to scream. He touches his cheeks. They're damp, and he realises he is crying big, fat, silent tears. Danielle would have found this hilarious, of course. Chapter 23 Megan is out of surgery and back on the ICU ward. A tangle of leads and tubes connected to banks of machines either side of her bed do the job of keeping her alive. One breathes for her, another feeds her, another empties her, and another tells me her heart is still beating. She's in the deepest of sleeps and unresponsive to my touch. But she's in there somewhere. She's still here. The consultant smiles down at my daughter. She did really well. The surgery went according to plan. Obviously, the next few days and weeks will be crucial, but she's a fighter. Yes, she's a fighter. I echo his words. Is there anything you'd like to ask me? Warm relief has eased my numbness enough to release a dozen questions that then jam my mind so I'm unable to articulate any of them. All I can do is stare at Megan, bruised, bandaged and still, her body slack, even the muscles around her mouth unable to muster a grip on the ventilator tube, and wonder how the girl I left smiling and full of life yesterday morning ended up in a hospital bed, kept alive by machines. That's something the consultant can't answer but he's used to voices silenced by the fear and horror of seeing a loved one hooked up to monitors and answers as if I asked my questions. Megan has what we call a traumatic brain injury caused by several severe blows to the head. She's heavily anaesthetised at the moment, what we call an induced coma. It's nothing to be concerned about. We do this to protect the brain and allow it to heal. It's entirely normal in cases like this. Only it's not normal to me. None of it is. This is all wrong. Megan shouldn't be here. Neither should I. I'm the CSI. I'm the one that comforts victims, catches their attackers, tells them we will get justice for them. I'm not the one who sits by bedsides, bewildered and distraught. This isn't meant to happen, and it isn't normal. In the meantime, be with her, talk to her as much as you can. It may not seem like it, and she probably won't remember, but she can hear you. When will she wake up? For once, I'm grateful for Bernadette's directness. Patrick dropped her off a few hours ago, just before Megan came out of surgery. As she marched towards me down the corridor... I'm ashamed to admit I stood up and braced myself for a slew of recriminations. Instead, she took me in her arms and hugged me tightly. Tighter than she has ever hugged me before. It'll be all right, she said, with a gentleness I didn't know she was capable of. 
How many times have I wished Bernadette had said that to me over the years? But she was saying it now, and for that I was grateful. She let go of me and sat down. I took my seat next to her. I want to say a prayer for Megan. Religion and I parted company many years ago. Bernadette knows that. So what was this? Some twisted attempt to lead me back into God's fold? I wouldn't put it past her. But scrutiny for confirmation of an ulterior motive only revealed a woman of faith seeking comfort from her God. Okay. Thank you. Bernadette took my hand and she began to utter numerous self-crafted sentences that all amounted to one plea. Don't let Megan die. At the end, we both said, Amen. We're hoping to start to bring her out of the induced coma later today, said the consultant. The drugs will wear off slowly and then it's a waiting game, I'm afraid, but she's young and she's resilient. Will she have brain damage? Bernadette's bluntness takes him aback. It's too soon to say. Much too soon. But the brain is a remarkable organ. I've seen worse cases make a full recovery. But we must be careful not to raise expectations until we know more. What sort of things should we talk to her about? Penny is also here. She flew into the hospital. Her eyes sore and her cheeks already puffed from crying. She held me like she never wanted to let go, while Bernadette looked on, her expression a mix of confusion and distaste. Anything and everything. Memories, stories of childhood, favourite places. If you get stuck, the highway code will do. She just needs to hear her loved ones. I find my voice. I have a question. Will she remember who did this to her? Bernadette delivers a disproving tut. I ignore her. The consultant appears not to notice Bernadette's disapproval, but he pauses. And pauses are never good. Pauses mean I'm not going to like what's coming next. I would say that even if she makes a full recovery, which, of course, we're hopeful that she will, I very much doubt she'll remember any of the events leading up to her attack. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's going to be a long road to recovery. For now, the most important thing you can do is be here for her. I'll leave you to it for now, but I'll come back later and we can talk further. The consultant leaves. Is that all you can think of? Bernadette hisses in a low voice, in case the consultant is still within earshot. Whether or not she'll be able to give a police statement about who attacked her. What passed between us last night is beginning to feel like a temporary truce. Not now, Bernadette, please. My voice is also barely above a whisper. I don't want Megan to hear this. Well, you ask the question so it's obviously on your mind. Because the person who did this needs to be caught, and Megan is our best hope. I don't understand why you think that's unreasonable. Because you're treating it like it's just another one of your cases to be solved. This is your own daughter. Can't you put her first? Just for once? Megan has always come first. If that were true, she wouldn't be here in the first place. What was she doing out on the trail? Miles and miles from home, for goodness sake. I told you she was going off the rails. That you needed to be around more. There it is, that old anger festering under the surface of our relationship, just waiting for the opportunity to burst forth and remind me how I always mess everything up. But I give her the benefit of the doubt. It's the shop talking. This has nothing to do with my job or how I parent Megan. I don't sound as convinced as I'd like, but I put that down to the weariness of battling Bernadette when all I want to do is sit with Megan. So, why wasn't she at school? She doesn't know about Sean, and I don't have the energy to tell her. She wasn't feeling well, so I kept her off for the day. She's fifteen. She's capable of looking after herself, and if she needs anything, Penny is nearby. 
Bernadette looks at Megan. Well, clearly she's not capable of looking after herself, is she? I can't believe what I'm hearing. Christ! You think it's my fault Megan was attacked? Penny sighs. For God's sake, will the two of you just shut up? This isn't helping Megan, is it? Bernadette presses her lips together. The conversation is over. But it doesn't matter. She's had her say. I'm to blame for the fact that Megan is lying in a hospital bed, clinging to life. Her skull caved in. There's a text from Helena. It says, Get well soon, Smelly. I need you by my side. Who else is going to defend me against that cow, Leah? I'm not sure that last bit is appropriate, but it was nice of her to think of you, wasn't it? You've known Helena for years now, of course. Since nursery school. My voice is both tight and breezy. A distortion of itself. It's barely recognisable to me, so I'm not sure how it helps Megan. If she could speak, she'd laugh at me. You sound so fake, Mum. And she'd be right. I'm fighting to keep the fear and anguish out. But the result is fooling no one. Bernadette has left, having delivered her verdict on how Megan ended up in hospital, and Penny has gone to get us some coffee. It's just me and Megan and the machines, blinking and bleeping. The nurses have said to keep talking, but there are only so many times I can tell her she's doing really well, that everything is going to be okay, and that she's to keep fighting. So now I'm reading out text messages like a second-rate disc jockey on the radio. I tap the next text. This one is from Liam. He says, Get well soon, Megan. There'll be a chococino waiting for you when you next come bodyboarding. Maybe you could give me a lesson or two. It's about time I learned. You know Liam, he runs the coffee bar at Mort Sands. You always... My voice fractures as my mind catapults back to just a few days ago on the beach and our laughter at the waves that got the better of us. I pause to let it heal then press my lips into a smile, hoping it's enough to inject something approaching sunniness into my words. You always say Liam makes the best chococino in the whole of the county. Returning to my phone, there's a text from a number I don't recognise, so I check to see who the message is from. Him? How the hell did he get my number? And why in God's name does he think it's okay to send me a text? Especially as I already passed his name to Holt as a person of interest. He's a suspect, for Christ's sake. I'm about to delete it when I stop myself. Much as I loathe the thought, what if this is the one that reaches Megan? I sigh. Okay. This one's from Jay. He's a a friend of yours? I fail miserably to mask my disapproval. It says, WTF, tell Meg she's got to get better from me. Ta, J. My eye lingers on the words. J. Cox, Biddicombe's friendly neighbourhood drug dealer. Does he have a hand in this? If he has, would he send Megan a text afterwards? It's what the guilty would consider a clever move to cover their tracks. But Jay's not that clever. And while there's a raft of crimes he could be locked up for, he's never been done for assault. He isn't the violent type. A lifetime of neglect has left him with the shape and strength of a stick insect. And he never leaves Biddicombe. Jay has filled my mind, and to my horror, I realise I've stopped talking. I take Megan's hand in mine, taking care not to dislodge the thin tube running from the back of her hand. Her fingers lay limp in mine, and I frantically search for something to say, convinced her life force, hastened by my silence, is fading fast, bleeding out, and I need to stem it. 
but there's only one thing that comes to mind. Who did this to you, Megan? Chapter 24 He had had a terrible night, barely getting any sleep, his mind churning the possibilities. What if she survived the operation? What if she remembered? Just recalling his green paramedic's uniform would be enough for the police to track him down. Perhaps she had told the police and they were on their way to arrest him right then. No, no, that couldn't be possible. But how could he find out? He couldn't go near the ward and he couldn't keep asking people. In the end, he couldn't stand it. At least if he was at the hospital, he might hear something. So he left early for work the next morning, before Jackie had even stirred in her recliner. His head pounding with the lack of sleep, he had tucked himself away in a far corner of the canteen in the basement to wait for his shift to start. But Tricia had still managed to find him. She slaps him on the back and plonks herself down in the chair in front of him. How are you doing, my old mucker? She's ridiculously upbeat, which can mean only one thing. The date went well then? Trisha winks at him. He hates it when she winks at him, like he's meant to know or care what's going on in her head. You could say that? And he notices, for the first time, the purple, ragged-edged bruises on the side of her neck. Love bites, they're called. But they're nothing but a filthy brag that she'd had sex the previous night. Danielle never gave him love bites. And you'll never guess who it turned out to be. There's a pause. He's bored of her games. It was Gary. You know, the guy from the mortuary. Gary? Yeah, I know. He's better looking out of his uniform. But who'd have thought it, eh? Who'd have thought it? He's in a band. And, between you and me, he put on a pretty good performance in the sack, too. She cackles at her own joke. He wonders if his disgust is visible through his forced smile, but he's past caring. Guess we'd better get on? She's disappointed not to have the opportunity to expand on their bedroom antics. No doubt that'll come later. Yeah, you're right. You okay to start the vehicle checks when I pop down to the mortuary? He had to start early this morning. Surprised he had the energy to get out of bed. Poor lamb. Take your time. Oh, thanks, Sai. She saunters towards the canteen exit. She really is a vile-mouthed, loathsome individual. Perhaps he'll put in a request to move. When she reaches the corner, she stops and turns back. He looks away, not wanting her to know he was watching her. By the way, did you hear? Sorry? No. Hear what? That girl. The one who was attacked in Three Brethren's Woods yesterday. Yes. She survived the night. She's in ICU. Critical, but stable. They're hoping she's going to wake up soon. Sigh. We got to her in time. Isn't that the best news? He stares at Trisha. The best. A voice startles me. For a moment I think it's Megan, but her lips are stone still, the ventilator tube awkwardly hooked to the corner of her mouth. I turn my head towards the nurse standing in the doorway. There's a detective here to see you. Over her shoulder, Holt's face appears, pale and drawn. He hasn't had much sleep. His appearance triggers thoughts of Janie and Cheryl, 
and traces of my anger at his refusal to listen to me. In his mind their cases are both closed. In mine they most definitely are not. And I almost ask him about them before realising I don't have the energy to fight their corners. Not right now. How is she? I rise to meet him. He doesn't want to come into the room, and I don't want him to either. Megan can't hear this. So we move into the corridor. Okay. The surgery went well. He nods and says no more. He's waiting for my permission to move the conversation beyond Megan's condition. It would be crass of him to do so. But there's only one reason he's here. How's the investigation going? Early days, but we're hopeful of a quick result. What have you got from the scene? It slips out without me thinking and takes us both by surprise. But now it's out there. I want to know. We, uh, think we may have the weapon. Jake recovered a steel pole nearby with what looks like blood on it. The weapon? Really? Megan's attacker didn't make any attempt to get rid of it. My questions are a reflex. Suddenly we're not talking about Megan. We're talking about a crime, like it's any other crime on the crime sheet. Doesn't look like it. I'm not expecting this. Even criminals have watched enough cop shows to know to dispose of the weapon, and Three Brethren Woods, with its dense woodland, is the proverbial haystack, not to mention the estuary on the other side of the trail. It's black silt the keeper of many secrets. It's a basic error that raises my hopes that the scene is right out of a training manual. What else did Jake find? Holt shifts uncomfortably. Nothing else. But it was wet. There must have been shoe prints. Yeah, plenty of those, but all accounted for. Really? What about Megan's phone? No sign of it. It's probably in the estuary. So the assailant remembers to get rid of Meg's phone. But not the weapon. I know, but maybe he got spooked and dropped it. Maybe. We'll keep looking and we've got Megan's laptop. I wanted to ask you what social media is she on? Facebook and Snapchat, but she mostly uses Instagram. Her username is submarinegirl227. It's the same username for all of them. Do you think she met someone she was talking to online? It's one avenue we're exploring. Most teens communicate through their social media. So you think it's someone she knows? That's the most likely explanation, but it could be someone she's only met online. He pauses, because he knows no parent wants to hear what he's about to say. Someone who groomed her. We're not ruling anything out. I want to tell him not to bother. Meg wouldn't be so stupid as to arrange to meet someone she'd only encountered online. But now I'm not so sure anymore. I would have sworn on Bernadette's Bible there's no way she would have taken herself off to the woods sixteen miles away without telling someone. But she did. Unless she was taken there by force. I know we've already spoken about this. But does she have a boyfriend? Have we? Then I remember Megan being taken down to theatre and Holt standing next to me. Ali, I know this is hard for you, but I don't need to tell you time is of the essence. He didn't. It's called the golden hour of investigation, those first sixty minutes where the race is on to secure as much evidence as possible when scenes are at their freshest and memories have yet to fade and become corrupted. But it normally applies to murders. Not that I know of. I told you about Jay Cox. But I think they were just friends, although I'd banned her from having anything to do with him. He deals drugs. We checked him out. He had the best alibi there is. He was being stopped and searched in Biddicombe High Street by the local uniform yesterday afternoon. That's about right. So how did Megan seem yesterday? In good spirits? The best for a while, I kept her off school. She'd seen her ex-stepdad working on the school roof. He's a building contractor. There's a lot of history there, so I kept her off. 
Sean Parker, right? Yeah, we spoke to him too. He was working on site all day. His boss confirmed it. Actually, he was very upset to hear what had happened to Megan and then got all angry because he thought we were accusing him. Unpredictable type. Sounds like Sean, but he's been off the scene for years. Okay, well, if you can think of anything else, anything at all, call me. Anytime. There is one thing. It's been bothering me ever since Megan came out of surgery. Chapter 25 It's late, and there's no moon. The night is on his side, but he isn't taking any chances. He parks his car in a lane behind the hospital grounds, which is nothing unusual. Lots of hospital workers do it to avoid paying the astronomical parking permit fee. He gets out of his car and pulls up the hoodie that he bought after work. He hates them. It's the type of thing sex-mad yobs like Gary wear to try to look younger. But it's perfect for hiding his face. There's a gap in the hedge that the staff use as a cut-through to the back of the hospital. It's an unofficial entrance, and they regularly receive letters requesting them not to use it. More importantly, it's not covered by CCTV. Keeping to the deep shadows thrown by the tall, broad chestnut trees lining the perimeter fence, he slips into the main hospital building through an open fire exit door. The doors are always left open. It's against hospital policy, but people are always forgetting their passes and wedge them open so they can get back in after their fag break. He takes the back stairs two at a time, to ICU on the third floor. There's no CCTV there, either. The lights in the corridor have been dimmed. It's quiet. Hospitals run 24-7, but the truth is, there's barely anyone around after midnight. The corridors are empty. The wards are mostly staffed by one person. Two, if you're lucky. Through the glass window in the door, he can see into the ward, a wide corridor with rooms leading off it. Halfway along, a nurse, a different one to the one last night, sits at her desk doing paperwork. He doesn't know which room she's in, but it won't take long to find her. He's already decided he's not going to make it complicated. She'll be on a ventilator. All he needs to do is flick a switch. But first, he has to get past the CSI. She's bound to be still around. But his luck is in. A door opens, and the CSI emerges, rubbing her eyes. Her dark hair is frizzy like she's not brushed it for days. She rolls her shoulders back, easing the stiffness, and approaches the reception desk, where she trades a weak smile for some pity. She's asking something. The nurse suddenly points in his direction and he darts out of sight. She's giving the CSI directions, which means the CSI is heading his way, and any second now she'll come through that door and see him. He dips down a small corridor to the left of the main corridor, his back flat to the wall. Behind him, the ICU door opens and closes, and footsteps lead away in the opposite direction. He risks a glance, and is rewarded with the sight of the CSI stepping into the lift. She's gone, probably to the canteen. That's two floors away, and on the other side of the hospital. He's got a good fifteen minutes, even if she buys something and comes straight back. He returns to the door leading to ICU and observes the nurse for a few moments before making the call. Hi, it's the path lab here. I've got the test results you requested. I'd send them electronically, but our systems are down. I'll print them out for you, but any chance someone can pop up and collect them? 
I've not requested any results. Her voice is curt. No nonsense. Well, someone did. And we've got it flagged as urgent. I've just come on shift, so I'm picking up someone else's job. Can't you bring them down? I'm on my own. Sorry, no can do. I've got another rush job on here. There's a pause. She rolls her eyes and shakes her head. OK, I'll be there in a moment. Reluctantly, she gets up and walks towards the exit. Once again, he ducks around the corner and waits for the door to open. He's banking on the nurse not wanting to be away from her station and hurrying to the path lab, which means he's got around five seconds to get to the door. He's right. She's already out of sight by the time he checks the corridor. He lunges towards the closing door, sliding his fingers into the gap just in time. He's in and alone. He could have used his hospital pass, but that would show up on the system. This way, the most they'll have on the ward CCTV is a figure in a black hoodie. He can live with that. Through the window to her room, he spots her. Her bed is raised at a thirty-degree angle. The metal side bars are up, the machines fussing and flickering. She looks so peaceful, so still. It's hard to believe she's even alive. Something stirs within him which takes him by surprise. Only he had more time. But he doesn't. He pushes the door handle down. It opens a fraction, and the sound of the machines grows louder as if calling out to his own heart thudding against his ribcage. He steps into the room. He must be quick. But oh, how he would give anything to stay longer. Anything. He sighs with regret. He's about to take another step when a hand grips his shoulder hard. A man's hand. Excuse me, sir. He twists round to find himself eye to eye with a police officer. Chapter 26 The last thing I remember is returning from the canteen with a coffee. It must have been about three in the morning. The nurse was nowhere to be seen. Neither was the police officer that I insisted Holt provide. He said no, of course. Police resources are already too stretched. Megan's attacker wouldn't dare try anything so risky, and no one can get into the ward without a pass. But I'd seen people coming and going all day, politely holding doors open for each other. No questions asked, and not a hospital pass in sight. Besides, public spaces don't seem to bother this guy. He's not the shy type. I told Holt this, and that he'd never forgive himself if something happened to Megan and reluctantly he agreed to put a special on guard. So when I found the corridor empty, my heart pumped hard with the possibilities. None of them good. I rushed into Megan's room. But she was as I'd left her, sleeping peacefully to the rhythm of the machines. Revived more by the exceptional bitterness of the coffee than its caffeine content, I sat down next to Megan and began reading some trashy crime novel that Penny had bought in the hospital bookshop. It was that or Fifty Shades of Grey, apparently. The next thing I know, natural light is flooding the room. My head is resting on Megan's bed. The book is on the floor, and Penny is here. Her grey hair, still threaded with beads, is tied back in a loose ponytail, which she has decided is more appropriate for the hospital environment and the redness around her eyes has gone, only to be replaced by dark smudges of sleep deprivation. Morning. The nurses said Megan's had a good night. I was reading to her, but I must have dropped off. Has there been any response? No. Not yet. She brushes off the bad news. Well, the doctor said it would take time. She'll come round. 
Penny sits in the armchair in the corner of the room. I lean over the metal sidebar, and I take Megan's hand. Megan? Guess what? Penny's here. Hi, Megan. Penny calls and waves. How's it going, love? Penny runs Seven Hills Lodges where we live. You know Penny. The lady who wears the brightly coloured skirts and feathers in her hair. I exchange smiles with Pen. She put feathers in your hair once for your tenth birthday party. Bright pink ones. But they made you sneeze. She's looked after you a lot, especially when I've had to go to work. She taught you all the Beatles songs. Although I've just about forgiven her for doing that. Unfortunately, your mother has no musical appreciation. Look you and I do, eh, Megan? Penny chips in, her Scouse accent broadening in defence of anything remotely connected to her home city. I laugh and look to Megan to join in. Nothing. I lift her hand to my lips and kiss her cool skin warm. Megan, please come back to me. Nothing. I don't know what to say any more. I've run out of words. My brain has stalled. Even the inane is beyond me. Staring down at my hand clasped around Megan's, I search for inspiration. But there is only one thought suspended midway in my mind like a neon light on the darkest of streets. Who did this to you, Megan? I throw Penny a pleading look. She stares at me and then opens her mouth, but not to speak. Instead, she starts to sing, quietly at first, just under her breath, almost as an act of self-comfort. But my smile wills her to sing louder, and she responds. Each note is clear and confident. She's singing Yellow Submarine. The song is so familiar to me. Penny taught it to Megan when she was about six. She loved it, singing it in supermarkets, the back of the car, the beach, our bench. Everywhere until it drove me mad. Penny gets up from the chair and joins me by Megan's bedside, placing her hand on my shoulder, connecting herself to Megan through me. Then, as suddenly as she started, she stopped singing. What is it? Her eyelids flickered. Are you sure? Yes. I stare down at Megan, but I'm sure she hasn't moved. Keep singing. Penny starts from the beginning again. She gets as far as the third line when Megan's eyelids twitch. Just for a second. Oh my God. Megan. You're back. Chapter 27 the consultant tells us it's too soon to hang out the bunting, but everything is moving in the right direction. And for that, we must be grateful. She's doing really well. Well done, Megan. He turns to me. And well done to you too. It was Penny singing that did it. It all helps. Look, now might be a good time to give yourself a bit of a break. Can I suggest that you go home, get changed, get some fresh air even? Your friend Penny is here and we'll take good care of Megan while you're gone. Penny is beaming, and almost giddy after the effect her singing has had on Megan. He's right, Ali. Go and get some proper rest. I'll read to Megan, or if she's really unlucky, I'll sing to her again. I'm not sure. Honestly, Megan and I will be just fine, won't we, Megan? She smiles at my daughter, and I feel the mildest of pangs that I'm ashamed to admit is envy. Why did Megan respond to Penny? I dismiss it before it morphs into something uglier. The important thing is Megan reacted, and anyway, didn't the consultant say it was our combined efforts that have made the difference? I don't want to leave for fear of missing the next step of Megan's recovery. But, put simply, I feel gross. I haven't left the hospital since Megan was brought in two days ago. I risked a glance in the toilet mirror and instantly regretted it. Lack of sleep has darkened and sagged the skin around my eyes. 
My hair has taken on a greasy gloss and my teeth are tacky to my tongue's touch. I suspect my breath stinks and there's every likelihood that I smell. I am the epitome of someone letting themselves go. But I need me back for when Megan returns. I don't want her to see the toll her attack has had on me. I smile back at Penny. Thanks, Pen. The high green hedges and outlying villages that line the route of the Barnston to Biddicombe Road flash by until I reach Heel Cross, a desolate peak where the road splits, left to Mort Sands, right towards the moor or straight on to Biddicombe. The road curves down towards the town, passing the cast-iron railings that surround the old wreck. I'm half expecting to see Megan monopolising one of the benches with her friends. Tiredness and my need for normality still scorching all reason. It's empty, of course. At this time the kids are still in school and Megan is lying in a hospital bed. The new normality. Just as I'm about to take a left turning towards Seven Hills Lodges, movement catches my eye, and I spy a figure in jeans and a hoodie shuffling across the wide expanse of grass on his way to cause misery. Before I've thought it through, I've pulled over, jumped out of the car, and I'm running towards him. Jay, stop. He turns at the sound of his name, and when he sees it's me, considers doing a runner, but even he knows his skunk-nourished limbs and lungs are unlikely to get him far, so he just stands and waits for me to reach him. I had nothing to do with it. Denial is his default setting, although in this case he's telling the truth. And thanks for grassing me up to the pigs. I'm not apologising for that. He might not be guilty of hurting Megan, but he's guilty of plenty of other things. I know you had nothing to do with it. I just want to talk to you. That's all. I told you I already spoke to you a lot, not that I had any choice. The detective with the stupid hair was a total dick. Holt obviously leaned on him a little too hard. For once, I'm with Holt. I'm not asking you as a CSI. I'm asking you as Megan's mother. He shrugs, but he doesn't tell me to fuck off. That's progress for Jay. You hung out together a few days before she was attacked. How was she? He takes a deep drag on a roll-up so thin he's in no danger of a nicotine rush, using the time to decide if he'll answer me or not. To my amazement, he does. She was upset. She'd seen her stepdad at school. She told me he'd been a right bastard to you and her when she was little. She was scared of him. My heart pinches on hearing this. Are you and her in a relationship? A laugh turns into a hacking cough. No, he says through watery eyes. I asked her out. Of course I did, she's a stunner. I got the impression she was interested in someone else, know what I mean. I don't. This is the first I've heard of this. Have you told the police this? Of course not. But it might help them find her attacker. Jay gives me a so what look. I picture his interview with the police. Monosyllabic, evasive, aggressive. He's never going to be a leading light in his local neighbourhood watch. I hope Holt gave him both barrels. It's nothing to do with me, is it? So who was this someone else she was interested in? Dunno. Didn't ask. Was it someone she met online? He shrugs, and I ignore the urge to slap him. Jay, Megan was brutally assaulted. If you cared for her, you'd want to help catch the person who did it. I don't know, right? We didn't talk about stuff like that. Know what I mean? So what did you talk about? Stuff. Like? Just stuff. It's pointless. This is all I'm going to get. This kid is genetically programmed to hate the police. Okay. Thanks. I'm about to leave when Jay starts talking again. How is she? I sent you a text. 
I know. I read it out to her. Really? Thought you hated me. That's what Megan said. Hate? No. Disapprove? Yes. Can you blame me? Ferris. Has she woken up? Not yet, but she will. He nods and takes another drag before flicking the butt to one side. She was nice to me, you know. But I never gave her nothing. She wasn't into it. She was just really nice to talk to. She was really proud of you, of the job you did. Talked about you all the time. Said she wanted to join the police when she was older. Be like you. I didn't know this. Why don't I know this? How come he knows more about my daughter's hopes and dreams than I do? Christ, where the hell have I been? Bernadette's condemnation. Megan responding to Penny's voice, and now a fucking drug dealer knowing more about my daughter than I do, suddenly meet and merge into a dark swell of emotion that forces its way into my throat and threatens to burst out of me. I press my lips together in a way that would make Bernadette proud. I have to hold on. I can't let it out, not here. Jay places a hand gently on my arm. The suspicion, the defiance, the easy hatred of authority has gone, and his eyes simply reflect my pain back to me. His father got locked up when he was eight, and his mum died of a heroin overdose when he was twelve. This boy has known heartache. A tear breaks in the corner of my eye, and I quickly wipe it away with my knuckle before it goes fully public. She's a great girl, he says. I know. Christ, of all the people in all the world, I find comfort with Jay Cox. Another tear threatens to replace the first, and I plug my nostrils with the back of my hand, hoping it will do the job of stemming my emotions. It doesn't, and I just give in to it. I just want her back, I say through the blur. Sorry, he says, and he means it. Me too. I walk slowly back towards my car. Ali? I turn back to Jay. What? Have you remembered something? Just make sure you lot catch the fucker. Chapter 28 he knocks on the door of cabin 27. This is a much better idea after last night's setback. The cop insisted on escorting him back down to the main reception on the ground floor. Jim was on the front desk. Luckily, he remembered they'd brought in a man who'd had a heart attack during the week, so he told Jim he wanted to check in on a patient, but had been given the wrong ward name. When the police officer realised he was a paramedic, a member of the Blue Light family, he couldn't do enough for him. Falling over himself to apologise, he was. He accepted the idiot's apology, of course, told him he understood he was only doing his job. The CSI opens the door, towel-drying her hair. She's so like Danielle... It takes all his resolve not to start at the sight of her. Simon! Hello! Ah, uh, is everything all right? Through his uniform, his heart is pounding. Yes, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I said to the other paramedics I'd drop by and ask how Megan is. We're all very worried about your daughter, but I didn't like to disturb you on the ward. One of the nurses said you'd gone home. She relaxes. Oh, I see. Yes, I just came back to shower and change. I'm heading back to the hospital now. We heard she was still in a coma. We're all praying for her to recover. That's very kind of you. Thank you. And please pass my thanks on to your colleagues. 
We bought this for you. It's not much, but we wanted you to know that we're thinking of you. He holds out a card. She stares down at it. It's affected us all really badly, if I'm honest. I can't get the image of Megan out of my head. She smiles and steps to one side. Why don't you come in for a moment? They enter the living room with a small kitchenette to one side. There's a pile of unopened cards on the kitchen bar, so he tucks his in among them. He's rather proud of it. It wasn't cheap, either. She directs him to a large, lumpy sofa facing a huge mural of a Caribbean beach that has been spoiled with childish drawings of boats and people swimming. Those full lips of hers are still smiling. I never thanked you and Tricia properly for what you did. Megan wouldn't be alive if it weren't for your actions. I'm just glad we got there in time. How is she? Actually, she's beginning to respond. No, that can't be. That's fantastic news. Did she say anything? No, it's much too soon for that. When I say respond, her eyelids flickered to the sound of my friend singing. So she's not awake? No, not yet. But you're still expecting her to wake up? She frowns at him. Yes. Of course. He pulls back. We know so little about the brain, don't we? You hear of people waking up after months of being in a coma as if nothing has happened to them. Yes, that's true. Although, I guess she won't remember anything of the attack. No, the doctor says she's very unlikely to have any memory of that day. But maybe that's a good thing. I'm not sure I want her to remember any of this. I can understand that. Of course she won't remember. He knows that. He's a paramedic. The CSI stands up, signalling their conversation is over. Anyway, it was very thoughtful of you to drop by, and thank you for the card, but I ought to get back to the hospital. She moves towards the door, but he hangs back. He doesn't want their conversation to end. Are you OK? she asks. I'm fine. Just a bit upset about everything, that's all. I know. I understand. I can't imagine how you felt when you found out. Yes, it was terrible. You're a CSI. You've seen lots of terrible things, but it's different when it's your own flesh and blood. The paramedics with kids always say their worst nightmare would be to attend an incident and discover it's their own child. Yes, I can understand that. How do you even begin to come to terms with that? We're just taking things day by day. Look, I'm sorry to rush you, but I really need to go. She walks towards the front door and holds it open for him, signalling for him to leave. But he isn't finished. Your daughter spoke before she lost consciousness. It isn't true, of course. But she closes the door. The hospital and her daughter can wait, after all. Satisfaction fires his insides. Megan spoke. As I held her in my arms. Her body stiffens as if she's trying to absorb an electric shock that's passed through her. What did she say? Her dark brown eyes trawl his for the answer. He couldn't look away, even if he wanted.
she's bewitched him. She moves so close to him he could almost reach out and touch her. Simon, what did she say? I think she thought I was you. She just said, Mum, I'm sorry. Her lips part to take a tiny breath, and her face pinches like the oxygen in her lungs has been replaced with poisonous gas. I see. She exhales the words. I thought it might help to know she was thinking of you before she lost consciousness. She smiles. It has. Thank you, Simon. Chapter 29 Apologise? For what? Oh, Megan, you've nothing to apologise for. None of this is your fault. The idea that her last thought before she slipped into unconsciousness was to say sorry to me is almost unbearable. A man beat her senseless and all she could think of was how she was to blame. How I would be angry with her for what this monster did to her. Part of me wishes Simon had kept this to himself. He thought he was doing the right thing. But it's just dredged fresh agony to the surface. My daughter called out to me in the moment of her greatest need. Convinced herself I was there. Cradling her. I wasn't. As I turn into the hospital grounds, I try to ignore this hard mass of guilt wedged inside my chest, hoping it will fade if I focus on the good. Megan's eyelids twitched at the sound of Penny singing her favourite song. I don't dwell on it being Penny's voice that she reacted to. Why wouldn't it be? Penny is like a second mum to Megan. The important thing is, she responded. She's on the road to recovery, and when she's better, things will be different. I will be around more. I'll be there for her. Strolling across the hospital car park, someone calls my name. It's Gary, the mortician's assistant. Ali, hi, how are you? Alex and I heard about your daughter. I haven't seen him since he and Alex Blandford, the pathologist, did the post-mortem on Janie Warren. But I'm touched that he has gone out of his way to talk to me when it would have been easier to avoid me. OK, thanks. We both know it's a lie. I may have had a shower and brushed my hair, but I look exactly like someone who hasn't had more than a couple of hours sleep in the last 48 hours. Shit, in other words. How's she doing? Better, thank you. Still a long way to go. It's a terrible thing to happen to a young girl. Trisha is just so pleased that she's going to be okay. Trisha? My girlfriend. She's one of the paramedics that saved Megan. Trisha Wilkins. Yes, of course. i just seen Simon. He dropped a get-well-soon card off at my cabin. Please pass on my thanks. I will. It'll mean a lot to her. It's been rough. She's still feeling a bit guilty. She has nothing to feel guilty about. That's what I said, but she reckons the delay in getting to Megan cost them a good few minutes. What delay? Gary opens, then closes his mouth. He glances around the car park. It's, uh, it's nothing, just that Simon had to go and pick her up before they could respond to the call. She'd stayed with a patient while he went for lunch. I see. Look, tell Trisha from me those few extra minutes honestly wouldn't have made any difference. She and Simon couldn't have done more for Megan and I'm indebted to them both. Thanks, Ali. She'll appreciate that. I'll see you around. He turns to leave when another thought occurs to me. Actually, there's one other thing. What's that? 
Did Megan say anything to Tricia before she lost consciousness? He frowns. I thought they found her unconscious. Why? Oh, it's just that Simon mentioned that Megan spoke, and I wondered if she said something to Tricia too. He shrugs. Tricia didn't say anything to me about it, but she really doesn't like to talk about it. I think she just wants to put it behind her. Sorry. He looks at me, guilty that his girlfriend has moved on. I place my hand on his arm. It's okay, and it's not important. Trisha saved Megan's life. I'll always be grateful to her for that. Poor Trisha. She has nothing to reproach herself for. I walk into the hospital. Suddenly I have an overwhelming urge to be with Megan. Too impatient to wait for the lift, I take the back stairs two at a time up to her room on the third floor of the hospital. A nurse buzzes me into ICU. Good news about Megan. We're all cheering her on. Thank you. I quicken my pace, excited to be back with her, and for the next sign that she's coming back to me. Christ. I'll sing the Beatles' entire back catalogue myself if that's what it takes. But as I open the door to her room, there's a man standing by Megan's bedside, leaning over her. He turns the key in the front door and laughter rushes into the gap. It's coming from the living room. It's Jackie and her carer, Arjun. His chest sags. He doesn't need this. He has work to do. Things have moved quickly, much more quickly than he could have anticipated, and he needs to come up with a plan. He puts his head around the living room door. Arjun is kneeling before Jackie, massaging her feet. The earthy smell of juniper oil permeates the air. Jackie is just loving all the attention, giggling like a love-struck teenager. She's even made some attempt to brush her few remaining strands of hair. Hello, my love. Arjun has given me a foot massage. Is he now? I've bought you some sweets. He produces the packet from his hoodie pocket, but, eyes on Arjun, she waves it away. Just put it on the side. I'll have them later. We've had a wonderful morning, haven't we, Arjun? Arjun, in his grey carer's uniform, looks up at him. His face breaks into a broad grin, and he flashes a perfect set of white teeth that he'd dearly like to put his foot through. Yes, we've had a great time. Jackie is red in the face, almost giddy with excitement. It's pathetic. We've been to Mort Sands. This throws him. You go to Mort Sands every day. Arjun frowns at her. Jackie laughs, that slightly too loud fake laugh. He means I watch it on the live cam. No, we went there for real. Didn't we, Arjun? Arjun bought me a chococino from the nice man that runs the coffee shack. What is it with this? Didn't we, Arjun, nonsense? She's talking as if they're lifelong friends. What do you mean, you went there for real? Arjun replaces the top on his massage oil. The company I work for has bought a minibus, and I hired a driver, Stan, so he took a few of us out for the morning. I thought the fresh air would do Jackie some good. Put some colour in her cheeks. How dare he? Who does he think he is, taking his wife out without his permission? Oh, I see. Well, it's all right for some, I suppose. Simon, it was so lovely to be outside, feeling the sun on my face, watching all the children running up and down the beach. We even had ice cream. You did really well. I'm really proud of you. I didn't think you'd get out of the van, but you did. 
I think the live cams have made Mort Sands feel familiar and safe for you, says Arjun. Is that so? He sounds calm, but his insides are churning with anger. Anger that will keep. Well, thank you, Arjun. It was a very kind thing to do for Jackie. No problem. Maybe, in time, we might hire one of the dune buggies. They're specially adapted for the disabled. That sounds fun, doesn't it, Simon? If you like that sort of thing. Arjun fixes Jackie's slippers back onto her feet and stands up. Right, that's me done. See you tomorrow, Jackie. Simon, can I have a quick word? The two men step out in the hallway. Jackie complains a lot about stomach pains, and she's definitely lost weight these last few months. I think she should see a doctor. It's probably nothing serious, but she should get it looked at. He doesn't need to take Jackie to the doctor. He already knows what she's got. It's called Rapunzel Syndrome, and it's where people compulsively pull their hair out and eat it. Jackie has been doing it for years before he met her, but hair isn't biodegradable, which means it's just sitting in her stomach, a huge, black, tangled mass of a million hair strands slowly damming up her intestine. It's why she lives on sweets. It's the only thing she can consume that doesn't give her severe stomach ache. It's also why her breath stinks. But an ulcer can't be far away now, and, untreated, that'll be enough to shut down her vital organs. You're absolutely right, Arjun. I've noticed it myself. I'll get her an appointment. Arjun leaves and he returns to Jackie. But the smiles have all gone. They were just for Arjun. But he's the one that cares for her around the clock. He's the one that buys her gold bears and puts up with her ridiculous obsession with the miniature furry variety. You're annoyed with me for going out, aren't you? He takes her hand. No. I'm not annoyed, my love. It's just that I can't stand the thought of all those people staring and laughing at you. I can't bear it. Jackie looks down at her hands. No one was staring. Everyone was just having a good time. Arjun wouldn't let anyone say anything mean to me or about me. He crouches beside her chair and is rewarded with waves of her pungent breath escaping from the huge, hairy knot in her stomach. I just worry about you, that's all. Remember the comments you used to get when I took you out? There goes Gollum. Yes, she nods. I couldn't stand it if that happened again. No one called Jackie Gollum, or anything else for that matter. But he needed a reason to stop taking her out. It was tedious and embarrassing to be seen out with her. So he began to tell her all the terrible things people said behind her back. She was devastated. But he told her that she couldn't let these people get to her. He, for one, was proud to be seen in her company. It wasn't long before she told him she didn't want to go out any more. Until now. Arjun was apparently her new safe person. And he couldn't have that. But I'm sure Arjun would protect me. He's my friend. Oh, Jackie. Arjun is paid to be nice to you. She looks horrified. The thought has never occurred to her. 
What? What do you mean? He doesn't really care about you. I bet you anything. He's in the pub, laughing with his mates about you right now. I thought he liked me. Unable to tolerate her breath any longer, he stands up. I'm sorry. I didn't want to upset you, but it's better you know the truth. Look, I don't mind if you want to go out. Go out every day, all day, if you want to. I'm only trying to protect you. That's all. Jackie nods. Why don't you see what's happening at Mort Sands? He presses the button on the remote and the screens light up with images from the live cams on Mort Sands. Look, the tide's coming in. There's lots of sand castles on the beach today. And look. Someone's drawn a massive heart in the sand. She's not interested. Her mind is elsewhere, and she picks up Florence Nightingale and strokes her furry head. But he has no intention of letting her sulks ruin his day. He isn't going to make her a doctor's appointment either. He picks up the packet of Haribo and goes upstairs. Chapter 30 Sean is standing by Megan's bedside, holding a bunch of wilting petrol station flowers in one hand, the other on her forehead. It's a tableau from one of my more disturbing dreams, where Sean is back in our lives as if nothing happened, and I am mute and immobile. But this isn't a dream. Get away from her! This explodes from me with enough force to startle Sean into taking a step back from the bed, giving me time to plant myself between him and Megan, arms outstretched, guarding her against him. I'm still her dad. His entitled I'll-do-what-I-want tone sickens me. You're my wife. If I want to hit you, I will. No, you're not. You never were. Now get out. He shakes his head at what he sees as my unreasonableness. For God's sake, Ali, calm down. I've only come to see how she is. We don't want you here. Megan is terrified of you. Just go. His eyes invite me to make him leave, and he stands his ground. No one pushes Sean around, especially not a woman. Then he moves closer to me. He has a foot on me and uses this to the full, leaning over me, reminding me of his strength and what he's capable of. She was pleased to see me at school the other day. I let out a dismissive laugh that I didn't know I was capable of, which again disorientates Sean, because he's never heard it before, nor seen the sneer on my face. But it feels good. I'm not frightened of him. Not any more. She was pretending, you prick. It's called fear. Fear that unless she behaves the way you want her to, you'll hurt her. What? I would never hurt her. It's you. You've turned her against me. He might be up for a row, but I'm not. Just leave us alone, Sean. No, I've every right to see my stepdaughter. He's enjoying the drama of it all. Christ, he's probably been telling his mates down the pub that the girl that was attacked is his and that he'll be the one to bring her out of her coma because her mother is useless. I said get out. This time my voice is loud enough to bring two nurses running into the room. One look at the size of Sean brings them to an abrupt halt and they huddle in the doorway. This man isn't a relative, he shouldn't be here and I want him to leave. She's lying. I'm Sean Parker. This is my stepdaughter, Megan Parker. I want him out. Now. One of the braver nurses steps into the room and takes Sean's arm. Sir, you'll have to leave. Otherwise, we'll call security. He snatches his arm back. His eyes never leave mine. This is your fault. If I'd have been around, this would never have happened. 
This isn't the end of it. The nurses accompany him out. He glares at me through the window, his face hard with fury. He's not used to losing, and certainly not to me. I turn to Megan and pray none of this permeated her consciousness. I sit on her bed and lean over her, navigating the tubes and wires to enclose her in my arms in an awkward, one-sided embrace. I'm so sorry, Meggie. I didn't know he was going to be here. But it's too late. I've let her down again. That's what she said to me when she overheard my conversation with Sean at her school. You always let me down. And she's right. I know what a monster Sean is. I should have known he would do something like this. I should have stopped him, but I didn't. I stood by and let it happen, just like I did all those years ago. I didn't protect Megan from Sean, and I didn't protect her from whoever did this to her. I stroke Megan's hair, releasing an almond aroma. Her favourite shampoo. No more excuses, Megan. I promise. Holt appears in the doorway. I intercept him before he gets any further, and we step into the corridor outside Megan's room. You okay? I heard there was a problem with your ex. He told the PC he was her dad, so he let him in, the idiot. He could have been anyone. Anyway, I've bollocked him for it. Your ex won't be allowed anywhere near her again. Thanks. How's Megan? My smile relaxes him slightly. Actually, she's starting to respond, so the signs are positive. We've just got to wait. Ali, that's great news. He's genuinely pleased. He's already lived this a hundred times in a hundred different cases, but when it's one of the police family, it crosses some invisible threshold, and it's felt more keenly. What about you? How's the investigation going? Who did this to you, Megan? Good. So the blood on the steel pole found near the scene is Megan's. Jake also appears to have got a partial fingerprint from it. That's good. Anything on the system? No, nothing. It's a good print, so whoever did this hasn't got a criminal record. I don't know why, but the news doesn't surprise me. Okay. My mind is still trying to wrap itself around the idea Megan's attacker dropped the weapon, complete with blood and fingerprints on it, but remembered to get rid of Megan's phone and not leave any other forensics at the scene. Did Jake miss something? He's very inexperienced. It's entirely possible. Holt told me he'd done the scene alone because they couldn't get hold of any CSIs from the south of the county to help, and the weather was closing in. I don't blame Jake. I should have been there. Anything else? What about her laptop? Digital Forensics has turned her laptop inside out. Did you get into her social media accounts? We did. And? His expression tells me it's not good news. Nada. Nothing at all. Nope. She didn't use social media that much. She's got a few pictures of Mort Sands on her Facebook and Instagram. A couple with her friends at the park. That's it. What about her private messages? The usual. Lots of conversations about the teachers she hates, the boys she fancies at school, how unreasonable you are, etc, etc. Like I said, the usual. Nothing else. No conversations about going to Barnston to see someone? I ask. No. If she arranged to meet someone, she didn't do it through her social media. We both look at Megan like she's let us down. I don't understand it. I was sure you'd find something. Jay said he thought she was interested in someone. You spoke to Jay Cox? By accident, I happened to see him on my way back to Biddicombe this morning. Holt isn't happy about this, but keeps it to himself. Well, if she was, she wasn't talking to him on Instagram. 
Everyone on her messaging system has been accounted for. Unless she has another account. Is that possible? No, I don't think so. I don't know why she'd bother. What about other devices? Although you can have more than one account on the same phone. No, she only has one phone. If you let me have her social media passwords, I could take a look at those messages for you. You know I can't do that. Please, Bob. I'll have a far better chance than you guys of spotting something suspicious. Something that doesn't sit right. I'm not sure. Look, we can just keep it between ourselves. If I see something, I'll tell you. If I don't, no harm done. He stares at me, weighing the options. Then he takes a pen and an old receipt from his pocket and jots down a jumble of letters and numbers and hands it to me. You didn't get this from me. Thank you. I'll have a look later. So, what are your thoughts at the moment? That she was in the wrong place at the wrong time? My insides cave. It's the theory detectives trot out when they don't have much of a clue. The victim was unlucky. It could have been anyone. The problem is it's rarely true. Most attackers know their victims. But I'm not going to argue. Holt doesn't have to tell me any of this. He's doing it because I'm in the job. But if I contradict him, he'll more than likely withdraw this privilege. So I go with it. For now. Okay. Are there any witnesses? None that have come forward. Really? A young girl is attacked in broad daylight and no one saw anything. Holt shrugs. It happens. So, what now? We're running a reconstruction on tonight's news, while it's still fresh in people's minds. Kudos to Holt. He hasn't wasted any time. Great. And we want you to go into the studio, make a direct appeal for people to come forward. He doesn't say any more. He doesn't have to. The mother of a brutally attacked girl appearing live on TV? It's a ratings winner. We both know it. Of course. Good. I'll pick you up at 5pm and take you to the studio and bring you back to the hospital afterwards. Have you got someone who can sit with Megan? My friend Penny will be here. Good. We'll get him, Ali. I promise you. This is intended to lift my spirits and I oblige Holt with a smile. So he leaves, content he's doing everything right and it's only a matter of time before Megan's attacker is caught. But I'm not sure. Something feels wrong, but I can't quite make it out. If only I'd attended the scene, I would know what it is, I'm sure of it. I would know why Megan's attacker dropped the weapon, but managed to leave no other evidence behind. Chapter 31 When he wakes up... It's already early evening. Downstairs, there's a sound coming from the front room. For a moment, he thinks it's that dreadful Arjun, as he's Jackie's only visitor. But that can't be right. Arjun was there this morning. He's not due again until tomorrow. He realises the voices are coming from one of the televisions. Two of the screens are tuned to Mort Sands, all but empty at this time of day, but the third is tuned to the news. Why are you watching that rubbish? Jackie practically leaps out of her recliner. Oh, they're doing a reconstruction of that terrible attack on that girl. Didn't you attend that one? You don't want to watch that nonsense. You'll only scare yourself. He goes to take the remote out of her hand. The mother's doing a special appeal. Her mother? He switches his attention to the screen. Still no concrete leads, three days after it happened, a lady with an immaculate blonde bob solemnly informs him. Maybe I'll watch a little longer, just to keep you company. 
That would be nice. Thank you. Lowering himself onto the flowery sofa, he knocks Laurel and Hardy to the floor. We have in the studio D.I. Holt, who is leading the investigation, and Ali Diamond, who is Megan's mum. The camera pans out. He catches his breath. It's Danielle. But it isn't. It's not just her hair and eyes. It's her air. She thinks she's better than everyone else. Just like Danielle. But first, we have a reconstruction of the events leading up to the attack. The film sequence begins to roll. They found a good look-alike for her daughter. He'll give them that. Tall, red hair. It's hard to believe that mother and daughter are related. The look-alike goes into a newsagent and buys a chocolate bar. Yes, he remembers her chocolatey breath. I've been in that newsagent. Not for a while, but it makes you think, doesn't it? Jackie tells the television. The stand-in walks with purpose along the trail. That's all wrong. She was much more of a dawdler, reading her phone the whole time. Silly him. They won't know that, of course, will they? Then a voice tells viewers to cast their minds back to the day of the attack. It had been a warm but wet Tuesday. Wimbledon was on the television, and that evening someone scooped £157 million on the Euro Millions. Lucky beggar, mutters Jackie, popping a Haribo gold bear into her mouth. The girl stands in the middle of the trail, while the voiceover explains the route she took and how police believe she had arranged to meet someone there. But who? They even do that thing where the camera looks like someone is spying on her from a distance. But it's in the wrong place. He was at least another ten metres further along. Then it ends. But they haven't shown her sitting on a bench. There's no mention of a man on a bike either. Why not? Then he realises why not. The police have nothing. They're so incompetent, they've even missed the false trail he laid. The weapon with her blood on it and Benson's fingerprints. What more could they ask for? Peter has been pestering women for years. Surely his prints are on file. The lady with the blonde bob is talking again. D.I. Holt, this was a very brutal attack on a young girl. Local residents are frightened it may happen again. How close are you to finding the person that did this? The camera is on wide angle, but he's not interested in the detective next to her and fixes on the CSI. But she may as well not be there for all the use she is. She's just staring down at her hands as if none of it is anything to do with her. You wouldn't know it was her child that had been attacked. Well, Susie, I'd like to assure local residents that this is a very rare crime for this area, and there's no reason to suspect it will happen again. Having said that, I can also assure you we're doing everything we can to apprehend Megan's attacker. We're working on a few theories which I can't talk about at the moment. That's why we've done the reconstruction. We have lots of information, but we need more. We need people to think about what they were doing that day. Were you in the area? Did you see Megan? Did you see anyone else in that area at that time? It was just after lunch, and it was drizzling quite hard, but there would have been people about. Still. She keeps her head bowed. She's a waste of everybody's time. She just wants to be on TV. Probably wants everyone to feel sorry for her. And you think someone close to Megan's attacker might suspect something? 
They might even be protecting them, says the presenter. Poor love, says Jackie, dropping another harabo into her mouth. Yes, we think someone, a friend, a family member, must suspect something. He would have had blood on his clothing when he got home. A reaction. Barely perceptible, but he sees it. She tenses at the mention of blood. Her jaw clenches. He smiles. She's trying to hold it all in. Please. An innocent girl was viciously attacked that day. We're appealing to anyone who may know something, have seen something, no matter how small, to contact us. Thank you, D.I. Holt. Ali, would you like to say a few words? Perhaps you could tell us what kind of girl Megan is. We understand she is still critical. How are you coping? He leans towards the television, ignoring a teddy in a soldier's uniform that tumbles off the sofa. She'll have to look up at the camera now. The presenter is addressing her directly. It'll be rude not to. But she doesn't move. The presenter tries again. Ali, I know how hard this must be for you, but is there anything you'd like to say? What's she playing at? Even the detective looks embarrassed. The camera lingers on her, and just as he's sure it's going to cut away, she looks up, and there it is, right there, in her eyes. He knows that look. It's a look of defeat, welded to acceptance of one's fate. He sits back and lets her expression flow over him, as soothing as if he'd just injected himself with morphine. Megan is kind, loyal, funny, beautiful, infuriating. A normal teenager, she says. Not bad, but it has a rehearsed feel to it and is a little rushed. She needs to speak more slowly, with more emotion. Tears would be good, even if she doesn't mean them. And she is very loved. Lies. The only person she loves is herself. She couldn't care less about her daughter, leaving her alone all the time. He wants to shout at the screen, Twilight Sparkle hates you. She told me. She told me how you left her alone for hours on end, how you never had any time for her because you were always at work. Poor lady. She's broken-hearted, says Jackie. Yes, poor lady. The camera pans out. The detective throws a look at her, and then the presenter, as if to say, that's all you're going to get but the newsreader ignores him. Take your time, Ali. Is there anything else you'd like to say to people watching this? The tips of her fingers dance around each other on her lap. The camera homes in on her once again, but it's obvious she isn't going to say any more. He's been duped into watching a laughably inaccurate reconstruction and an emotionally stunted and media-obsessed mother. He stands up to leave, but then stops and lowers himself back down onto the sofa. Something's changed. Her fingers are still. Slowly, deliberately, almost robotically, she raises her head. Her eyes. Her eyes are unblinking, defiant, no pain, no sorrow. Her pupils are black with fury, and she's staring right at him. Everything around him blurs. I know you're out there. 
Good grief. She's talking directly to him. A heat rises from his neck to his face. But you will be caught. She says this with absolute certainty, like it's inevitable. She pauses a while, searching for the right words. No, he's wrong. She's already selected those. She's making sure she has his attention. The bitch has it all planned. She knows he's watching. The camera closes in on her face just as she expects it to. She stares down the lens at him. Now, it's just the two of them. Jackie has gone. The studio has gone. No one else exists. Her eyes anchor his. Because I'm coming for you. Penny is by Megan's bedside when I return from the TV studio. She immediately gets up and offers me her seat. I take it along with Megan's hand. How is she? Good. I don't think she's moved again, but it's so difficult to tell. She will. I kiss Megan's forehead. Well done, love. Keep doing what you're doing. Penny sits in the armchair in the corner of the room. I watch the appeal on TV. I nod. There's an unfamiliar terseness in her voice. So what was all that? I'm coming for you stuff at the end. Honestly, I don't know. That's the truth. I hadn't gone to the studio planning to do anything other than describe Megan, make her real to the viewers and convey my anguish in a way that would spur them to pause their lives and reach deep into their memories. But as I watched the reconstruction, and I listened to Holt, it was obvious to me that the police have little to go on, and I became convinced Megan's attacker was watching and would know that too. I couldn't bear the thought of him sitting on a sofa, wearing the smuggest of smiles, thinking he'd won. But Holt was furious with me. As soon as the cameras stopped rolling, he had a right go at me. I couldn't blame him. Heartbreak gets results. Confrontation doesn't. He told me I'd jeopardise the investigation and if Megan's attacker was watching, I might even have turned myself into a target which they could do without seeing as they're already guarding Megan. Maybe he's got a point. Her response takes me by surprise. So much so I think I've misheard. What do you mean? Well, they've got enough on their plate without having to watch out for you too. Why don't you just let them get on with it? It irks me that Penny is siding with Holt. It's not as if the police did her any favours over her ex, Ian. Well, I would if... If what? She snaps. I sense there is something else going on here that I'm not up to speed with, but I've no idea what. I don't think the investigation is going very well. There. I've said it. It's not in the league of major cock-ups, but something isn't chiming. I wait for Penny's reaction to my revelation. There isn't one. It's like she hasn't heard me or hasn't understood the significance of what I'm saying. So I fill her in. They haven't found Megan's phone. There's nothing on her laptop. They've no idea why she was there in the first place. Nobody seems to have seen anything. They don't have anyone in the frame. It's slipping away from them. I thought the weapon had a fingerprint on it. She offers half-heartedly. It does, but... But what? There it is again. A shortness that wants to head off the conversation. But why? She must want to know who did this as much as me. I plough on. Something doesn't sit right. First rule of crime, get rid of the weapon. Second rule, wear gloves. This guy failed on both counts but managed not to leave a single shred of any other evidence at the scene. Perhaps he panicked. Anything could have made him drop it. Maybe, but I can't help thinking they've missed something. 
Penny is staring at me oddly. Leave it alone, Ali. Let them do their jobs. Even if they're not doing them properly? Even that. She sighs. Megan needs you here, not swanning around the countryside playing Sherlock Holmes. Why is she saying this? This isn't like her. And I don't swan anywhere. It happens to be my job. And there's nothing wrong with taking an interest in the investigation. This guy needs to be caught, Penny. And that's exactly what the police will do and they don't need any help from you. That's the point. They do need help. Penny shakes her head. I get it. You're a CSI. You want to do your bit to catch this guy. She pauses. But you're a mother, too. Maybe you need to remember that. Chapter 32 So, the CSI thinks she's coming for him, does she? That's a joke. He'd like to see her try. What a stupid threat to make. And on television, too. She's made a complete fool of herself. She can come after him as much as she likes, but she'll never catch him. She's not as smart as she thinks she is. None of them are. Didn't he just stand in her house, right in front of her, asking her about her daughter? She doesn't have a clue. There's a tap on his window. It's Trisha. He rolls it down. Come on, Si, we've got work to do. He gets out of the car, and the two of them stroll towards the hospital car park, towards the ambulance station. Did you see that TV appeal last night on the young girl in the woods? No, he says. Poor kid. I hope they catch him. Evil piece of shit. Who'd do that to an innocent young girl? But he isn't listening. Two people are standing outside the entrance to the ambulance station. A man in an ill-fitting grey suit, a long, thin layer of hair swept over a bald scalp and a young woman in a blue jacket and skirt combo her hair scraped back into a tight bun that's the cop who was at the murder of that girl on Biddicombe Quay isn't it? says Trisha the detectives walk towards them his insides flip but he keeps his composure Simon Pascoe? Trisha Wilkins? Yes. I'm Detective Inspector Bob Holt. This is acting D.S. Sherwell. The young woman nods at them. Can I have a word with you? Sure, says Tricia. I don't know if you saw the TV appeal last night about the attempted murder of the schoolgirl Megan Diamond. Yes, says Tricia. I'm afraid I didn't, he says. I try to avoid them. My colleague and I were first on the scene. Don't hold information back. Give him more than he asks for. Make him think you can't do enough to help with his inquiries. The detective gives him a sympathetic nod. That can't have been easy. No, it wasn't. Anyway, as a result of the appeal, we had a caller who said they saw an ambulance parked up in a lay-by near the back of Three Brethren Woods on the day of the attack. He senses Trisha stiffen. Your boss, Colin, said it would mostly likely be you two. Apparently, it's a favourite place to stop for a bit of R&R. &R. That's correct. Yes. Can you tell me what time you got there? He turns to Trisha, but she's no help, staring at the detective, her face a pale round disc of fear. Let me think, officer. We'd just come from a suspected heart attack at the old people's home just up the road, in Fleetham, so 
it must have been around 3 p.m. And how long were you parked there for? asks Sherwell. Gosh, I'm not sure. An hour, maybe? What do you think, Tricia? Without taking her eyes off Holt, Tricia agrees. No more than an hour? And did you see anything? No, nothing. Sorry, says Tricia. But her hurry earns her a frown from the officer. He turns back to him. What about you, Mr. Pascoe? He gives the question much thought, trying to appear as obliging as possible, so the detective thinks he really wants to help. Actually, wait, yes, we did see something, or someone, now you come to mention it. <laughs>